and say, all right, what do we need here? And, uh, all right, well, we need mining facilities. And then that helps to inform Ian and the, um, the other design teams and our teams of, all right, is that an independent theme? Is it a corporate theme? Is it an outlaw theme? So these are all kind of layers, but the first and foremost is, oh, this is farming, or this is mining, or this is, you know, cargo. Because looking at something like Pyro 2, which, you know, again, starting from that sort of original crazy sentence of the planet was the idea was like that was a heavily mined mined out planet that that had been kind of stripped of a lot of resources so there would be remaining infrastructure that would have been corporate mm -hmm. back in the day but is now independent or now even an outlaw setting so and then there would be the ones that would just be a straight independent one and stuff like that but yeah exactly like you said you know we start start with that sort of the base and then apply the theming to it to kind of mm. when we're thinking about the theming um we, we, we kind of wanted um, like a space catalog, like a furniture catalog. So uh, I know this is quite big for Chris is we kind of went down that um, process of, okay, let's design this one independent outpost in a few different ways. Like how could people have decorated it in many different ways? And it was quite a fun process because you basically create space furniture catalogs, which um, which again are going to be ways for uh, it's ways for the the developers to be able to dress and world build, but you know eventually maybe it's a way for people to decorate their own spaces. You know, uh, when we think all right, about, guys. Uh, the outlaw, Good fucking morning. Uh, versions of these. I'm like a little again, bit the, dead inside the right now. Very similar. You think Hold on, let me shut this dude up for a second. All right. Is everybody hyped for Citizen Con yet? Yeah, I apologize for being an hour late. Um, I just couldn't fall asleep last night. I've been on uh, Heather's like nighttime schedule for the last uh, couple, excuse me, couple days, and I just kind of couldn't fall asleep until like seven in the morning. So, ha! <laughs> I'm late. Did anybody expect me to be on time, though? But anyways, um, I'm awake. I'm excited to listen to Word Salad and uh, more bullshit hype. So we may begin on that. Let's pop open one more tab real quick so we can swap back and forth as needed. To you know, present these outposts in a few. Take it away, fellow bald the man. Reputation as well. Like we talked before about that idea that that you know, if you do missions for a corporate outpost, that it you know reflects on your general uh, relationship with that corporation. Mm. I mean, that ties into the the clan tags. Like maybe you've just come from um, one of the space stations that you know was occupied by a certain gang type, and then they sent you to um, a settlement on one of the surfaces of Pyro. And clearly, it's been, um, you know, tagged by, by a different gang. So you basically want that read and that consistency uh, throughout. Now, one of the one of the uh, outpost themes that I was quite excited about uh, getting into was the idea of a, a trading outpost. You know, we've been talking about you know buying and selling uh, for a while, but thinking about it in a in a frontier context, you'd you know, it's almost like the money's kind of worthless, you know, but it's more about the ability to barter or, or you know, trade. So um, fundamentally, I thought it'd be cool that if we kind of design a module which focuses around one of these trading posts. So within a, a planet, you know, it's worth, you know, people would kind of, you know, uh, trek to and, you know, barter or trade components and then go back. You know, we was talking about the idea of, if I had a farm in the middle of nowhere, like, would I want loads of credits or would I want that one component that, you know, kept my farm going, you know? So, um, so we did, you know, we, we took that idea and, and we rammed with it and we, we, we did some visual exploration into what would a, a trading post be like on one of these frontier outposts. So, uh, as you can see on the images, we wanted that feeling of um, the majority of the stuff around this outpost is pretty much junk. 
Yeah, sorry about the delay, Rough Riders. Um, always sunny. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things where it's it'll be way too many people talking if uh, if I drop into the Discord. I uh I immediately got that joke as soon as you said it. Thank you. You're welcome. Have their <laughs> and center table too. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the esteem. Yeah, yeah that's that's the high esteem point. Experience is going to be much more different. It's not going to be that polished. It's going to be much dick. more of a personal interaction with somebody. Uh, so it's been really fun talking with you know the AI and behavior guys to try and work out exactly like how is that dynamic oh, supposed to work. Sure. And, and, I told um. Feel like for the player. I told Archer uh, and cool, so maybe I that uh. The of these you know, outposts. like you asked, like so maybe if, sort of if we're Eric bored, now. like if I wanted to and play Star Citizen, to a lot see more if anything better at all, right? Design process we did and uh, and, and Archer just laughed and he's Hello. like, yeah, that's I funny. I was like, wait, why is that funny? He's like, because you said you'd never play again. I was like, when did I say that? Today I went present the interior of the Star Citizen outpost concept and explained a bit how. Lucky that wasn't Bond. He'd have been like, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah hold on. <laughs> He'd have a recording of me saying it in his voice chat, post. probably. It was the first time we had to create a timeless design. I would, uh, to be fair, I'd never make that. I'd never challenge Bond like that again. Warm and with a cozy feeling interior. At the beginning, we started from this. I hope I hope they do use some uh, Dune shit. Their wipe will be hilarious. It'll be another spicy meme for her fucking five years from now. Interior, we have It'll be great. Zones. Plus, Social you know, there, there's no way Place he's not going to gonna together, try milk on game, the the new Dune leisure, hype. The bedroom. Place there's no relax, way. Have a proper personal space. I think I'd be pretty and surprised if he did yeah, the I, I don't know. Right right the place for yeah. the building machine yeah. will maintain yeah, the possibility it seems to like he does it. survive them. Um, the technical so like a lot of any major sci fi that's happening. Minerals, yeah. I mean, he even like, of the planet he even like, um, use for storage. I don't know if I'd say he's milked other time. games, the but like, he certainly like of the is willing to bring them up, right? Like, didn't he like shit on, um, all of those areas? Another game that like failed or like had issues or whatever. I mean, he's remember. done it to No Man's Sky. He's thrown shade at Skyrim. He did it to Microsoft Flight Sim. He's... Was it Flight Sim? Uh, there was a um, more recent Anthem. one, though, at least. Anthem, that's what it was. Yeah. Right? And it wasn't even like spaceship related, right? That's why I was like, what the fuck is he doing? You know, like. Yeah. That's one is the best. Long vertical windows. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he didn't. Or, yeah, if he the most relevant mentioned sketch, Dune. We do a 3D blackout. As you see, this 3D blackout follows very closely to the last sketches. I wasn't watching, because I'm not going to watch the stream. Blackout, That'd be stupid, right? But <laughs> it, the chat was telling me that it was just a bunch of artwork <laughs> being shown. Organize the color kind of, uh, to make sure all the elements fit and yeah. will live together. After this, so much for those uh, those dreams you had in chat. That's uh, good way to make sure all I mean, I knew better deep down, you know. And the ratio proportions <laughs> yeah. between each of them. The final key shot of the social area brings it alive. I mean, they uh, they found a really great concept artist, you know. If you want to have like somebody do like some really fucking slick drawings of dreams you have, then CIG's on top of it. Yeah, I thought they already, people already knew about that, that's why people buy JPEGs from them, right? Yeah, they really exactly. like their drawings. I mean, it's funny that, like, it seems like the most talented people at their company are the artists, right? Mm -hmm. When, like, that's all they sell right now is pictures. <laughs> Whether it's, like, a ship in a game that has no real gameplay tied to it other than being pretty, right? Or whether it's, like, literally just a picture of a ship that might be in game one day. Yeah. Hey, British. How's it going, man? I appreciate it. It's nice to see you. Catch you outside of comments. The sketch phase is essential. As you see, or the, do they have art for charcuterie boards? Probably, possible? dude. Probably. I'm pretty sure I just saw different <laughs> versions of charcuterie. Well, you know, I mean, they spent how much time working on the physics of how the goddamn eggs were gonna fucking fry. So yeah, now now we have to know about like how fucking pepperoni slices. You know. Yep. <laughs> the detail 
of the machinery, cabling, metal, grates really help convey the ambience of the room and also informs what players will have to do when they go to this place. For the technical room, we wanted to make sure the technology came... You know, I'm probably not streaming on Twitch because I don't think I've updated OBS's key um, since Twitch got painting, uber hacked. The tone, um, so that's probably why. I'm too color. lazy and anti-Twitch to and fix it. Final to make the homestead a living space, the bathroom props are important... Oh, you're not streaming on Twitch? Yeah, that's what Griffiths was saying. It's nice. retard! Alright, sorry, I had to get that out. <laughs> Simp! <laughs> Cock! No, no, I think that one's a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh no, you are streaming on Twitch! He nah. lied! Wow. Good one. A liar. Thanks, Griffiths. A huge thanks to all for helping to you just got him banned on Twitch, you motherfucker. <laughs> ...match the amazing work that is produced during pre-production. I sincerely hope you will enjoy living in those homestead in Star Citizen. Thanks, everybody. Oh, is it? Thanks, Eric, for huh. some stuff. Now that we've uh, shown a lot of art and talked a lot of theory, uh, we want to get into game and, and show off what we've been working on. We're going to be showing you uh, kind of uh, multiple playthroughs and how it changes. Uh, oh, yeah, that's really... What you do and, and that's how super you weird. have faction it, with... The like, it game. says you're live, but you're not live. I, if that makes sense. I don't know. So here we are waking up in 400i. Uh, that will be released oh, yeah. at 3.15. This is the competitor to the constellation. Doesn't compromise cargo. Oh shit! Is this pyro? It's faster, more agile. It's pyro in the, the mysterious 400i. So this is the captain's quarters, and then we'll go out and see a little bit more of the habitation deck, and then make our way to the cockpit. So this would be the social area that you can meet and eat and and basically. Now hater doesn't have to kill himself. Unfortunate. Just kidding. Sorry. And then from here we'll go to the cockpit. When you're only a so year late on your spicy uh, predictions. Um, we've come here for a mission to acquire an artifact, um, and uh, you'll be making your way down to a trading post. So well, that's a nice cockpit. Wanted to it doesn't uh, show you down just give you a quick all, overview, so, and then like it's like start talking about the plan. <laughs> Wait, actually, this is like the yeah, fucking um, all over. Yeah, yeah, just a, a trust. Well, it reminds me a little thin, more of uh, a breathable atmosphere, um, uh, but it's still pretty. Fuck, what are the, the trucking cold, like uh, the semi truck ships? Some of those lightning strikes. Oh, like Starfare and, and Freelancer. But, uh, no, yeah, Freelancer. Yeah, it reminds me of the Freelancer cockpit, where it's just like the like the visor type clouds above, like a terrestrial like a window. You know, we went through quite a few iterations of forms, like wrapped around, but there's no up or down view. Yeah, it's it's the same view as the 890. Quite dramatic. Oh, is it? Still believable in terms of how they're both rear seated cockpits bridges. Oh, doesn't but doesn't the 890 have two bridges? Showcasing a lot of the the recent what. Tech, Isn't uh, there a ship online. that has two like places uh, also what we're seeing here is like some mm -hmm. yeah, kind of distant yeah. thunder strikes. Is, yeah, that's why it, that throws me off because I always like remember the to, <laughs> right, you know, to future uh, weather features that become on board. I see what you're saying. You're right. Though. Trying I to you know the, the uh, storms and uh, ship handling, you know, due to the turbulence, and it's great seeing the um, you know the rain hit the canopy glass here. You know, when you go through these cloud banks. Also, as part of the, the process of shaping, one of the things we really wanted to do is create these, uh, these kind of like these pockets in between the clouds. So you're in these cavities. So as you're flying through, you get a glimpse of the the terrain beneath you. Uh, but you know, it it feels really quite exhilarating, you know, to fly through. Also, as well, like um, it's showcasing a lot of the more recent uh, tech coming on board as well. So, you know, um, you know, it's. Uh, a lot of optimizations been going on. God, I fucking hate uh, so it's way more performant than previously uh, than previously it was. Also, like the the level of artifacting that we're seeing here is is substantially reduced, uh, certainly on high spec machines. It also gives you a great sense of parallax when you fly through these these cloud sandwiches. A cloud sandwich? Yes, that's that, that's what it feels like. It feels like you're the meat uh, or the the cheese of a cloud sandwich. 
the cheese with cloud sandwich so as we get out of the cheese uh another really big feature that was important uh, for me was uh god it would have been so know, much terrain, better if this was live uh, and, uh, and uh, they flew from into the, the cloud, face of a so, mountain uh, you're actually the, seeing through the clouds you know, or whatever these, well, but i'm sure uh, the ceiling the cloud sandwich, you mean? <laughs> yeah i'm uh, sure the cloud ceilings the are above the so terrain it just adds that depth it just adds that believability to uh what we're seeing in the frame and you know when you but see like these over like dark overcast uh, over, overcast clouds in the hovering above the mountains it it, it finally completes oh, the uh the frame. The front, man. especially when you see these distant rumbles of uh yeah it literally looks like a little distance. baby 890 with the so James nose. Cameron who's doing the the, the run yeah, through. I, yes that is I name. think I'd like it more um, if it didn't he have will the be taking part, us down right? to the outpost like uh, the goal pointing. for us is to basically make 50 of these whether they're inhabited or derelicts or or even um basically inhabited by a a, a farmer or inhabited by a gang so the goal is to have these act as different factions and so that you can develop different rep associated with them um and you can start seeing how big these outposts uh stretch to with the, the comms tower that's behind us and then even some of the aa turrets that you'll actually see up close and personal not really jellyfish uh atmospheric slide is still basically like a hand wavy arcade like they've tried adding in wind effects but like actual like a, a real flight model for being in atmosphere no that was a really good approach uh from james there should still uh, feel landing. like that weightless ballerinas three in the ten. air three out of ten jeez I, 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 ian's a tough grader yeah i go six at least no one's ever got a six you gotta watch me land man have we seen the interior of this? Before? So here we'll go down to the no. technical deck. Yeah. Show off the cargo area as well as the climate controlled um, component areas and then onto the gravity generator room. Oh no, turn and the other way. Out. Show the other way. Turn around. Oh shit, that's gonna get so many people to buy this. The uh, Freelancer front end stairs. Oof. Um, so, so you'll be able to get nostalgia the buy it. In one of the later panels that we have, it's actually really Paul and John. Nice, I, mean, um, I think. I, I mean, it was one of the things that like you either absolutely uh, loved or hated about the original I think this Freelancer. This is one of my favorite skins. Yeah. Yeah, they did a, a new oh, skin. Oh, is that the fucking just, um, control? Just felt oh, that's more, interesting. You know, suitable for pyro, but. Now you can see how it, it you know it feels suitably worn and, and weathered um uh, you know to fit into these these is that an airlock and, or you know what we see here is boots, first boots on the ground you know on pyro um i think uh, it I looks think great uh, especially in in, in uh, contrast to what we're seeing here is like actual ai on the terrain you know walking about going about their business um and is that an ai turret there or are these it the is. NPCs? And on this radio planet. comms towers yeah. and all these other okay. elements that we want to make sure that are interactive for the player and allows them to go and explore or use us uh use to their advantage um we want them to be able to interact with these, yeah, does these like different so items shit. here you can see like uh various outpost modules you know to the right there we've got the garage unit you can see the infrastructure on the roof but this large beautiful you know archway here kind of signifies you know the main entrance the primary entrance to the the main social module i think the air looks look great you know fits in with the art style beautifully the team did a great job it's on like, this um, i mean like when someone said that it reminded me of uh and then uh we've seen the concept the, like, art previously from today the and then you know yeah. you can see it translated what is that? Uh, uh in game i think it absolutely yeah, it's it's awesome. fantastic, royal, it, you know it's like a royal ship uh, right the radio yeah. form I, I don't remember the exact names quite, of those but like they have a uh, whole quite special like, to this art style them, and a lot of them uh, and you can see the, how that, that kind of complements these shapes so i'm sure that there's one that's other areas of the outpost yeah 
So it, with the AI, we want to make sure that it's living, it's Is breathing. Is this the first, um, like, NPC inhabited, like, there was a like chef normal NPC, cooking. not like... Is that on? Yeah. Our security like, guards here to make sure that they're on a planet? actually yeah, protecting their investments, 20, 26, protecting 27? their home. Wait, is that actually what they uh, said? Strangers no. and they, <laughs> oh God! Uh, but you, have you said it so casually that I wasn't sure. Uh, like, it so didn't sound like you were trolling. I was like, oh, are they actually advertising that? The, no, they the have to like lie, right? right? If that's if that's when they you think it'll be out, they have to lie, the, uh, right? The loadout and say earlier, and then just keep pushing it back. But it's also there's no way you can just admit. Which is new. Oh man! Also, they want something you have as well, which is rendering much nicer. So here, the player will make their way out to the training post, um, go see the dealer, acquire the artifacts. And for the for the training post, you know, we wanted to get all of the the junk on the outside as well, uh, you know, so the player can see it. Yeah, the, the little in. penis top buildings. Uh, we wanted, uh, Archer, the, you know, for sure. Are one hundred percent ripped out of like tattooing shader, art so style. These are reacting to the oh yeah, the, wind, the place uh, certainly. You know, the same has that feeling. The same force that the 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 tall grass and the moss in the ground is reacting like, to. Like honestly, well. this could be a map out of like one of the the oh, original the battle training posts, right? Like. Like Ian spoke about before, um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure in, I, I went back when I played a little bit of this. Here, the original, the original battle, the Star Wars Battlefront games, um, where the, the there was a map like system, are that was basically to, this, like uh, a jump point where they might be coming down and using this as a chop shop, or uh, are they in a very rural area that's you know they care more about um, the frontier lifestyle and being able to survive versus money. We uh, we passed the kitchen as well on the way back there. That's the that's the local diner uh, for this outpost. Tough crap. <laughs> uh, also, oh, so on the inside as Archer's well, right. you know, we wanted like this the original building you know, that we went in where we saw the people first. Uh, the bar shapes, was basically the cantina. Um, you know, like it's just literally the the dealers displaying all the wares, everything they'll have uh, outside in the open here. Welcome. Take a look. I'm sure I have what you want, and if not, I'll have something just as good. Is this a quest giver? Yeah. Oh, yeah, very good choice. Very good. So after yeah. 5 million credits of disposable income, we get our first look at the uh, 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 Hadesian artifact, which is obviously going to be what is sort of a super rare uh Thing that you'll you know, you hopefully be able to start finding in the in the galaxy, uh, which is sort of if you're familiar with the lore of Hades, was an old civilization that destroyed itself. Uh, so somehow this trader has gotten their hands on uh, this artifact. So here we're showing one way of actually playing through this area. Uh, it really depends on your standings within the gang and how they want to deal with you. And then it, what's the dealer going to do? What's the dealer going to charge you? And from there, we have different ways of actually showing um, that. Just uh, like really quick, I don't understand. He's saying like, yeah, we're showing the different ways of, of them dealing with you. Like you, it was like ordering a fucking drink at the bar. You literally walk and like, oh, yeah. nice choice. It goes and, there was nothing about that that showed how your reputation mattered or how the dealer wanted to handle with you. I, if I don't anything, think he if, understands what that means. We yeah, I think if anything, if, if they were trying to show uh, off like different ways, you'd have to show it multiple times, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is just some additional uh, warehouse space that, that what the this trading is? post would have. Uh, and you can see it would lead directly onto the this courtyard. Um, and know, for the keen eye uh, people, you'd see that the barbecue's still not uh, being eaten yet. The grill master would be fired. Yeah. Still full of okay. wings. Yeah, I guess he's going to go back in and do it again. Oh, is so, he? Oh, my that's God. What it looks like, yeah. But that's what happens when you, you pre-record this so shit, this area, and he again, gives commentary before they go and fucking do it. Make sure that it's yeah. filled out with items, filled out with different things that you can interact with and possibly buy. Um, it, it's 
like Dave said in the beginning, um, we want the stores to feel different here. Uh, yeah, that's what I was wondering, Griffiths. I thought they were talking about Pyro, believable. but I don't remember. Quick reference to some uh, any of the additional from Pyro Solaris looking like this. I thought the they were right all dead. We Moons are lava, molten planets. Yeah, to be fair, at the beginning of this like thing, remember I was like, is this Pyro? Because on the screen it was like, it said something about Pyro, yeah. and you're like, it's all, you're like, yeah, in the 400i. The guys right? had a lot of fun. Uh, like, it exactly. literally on the screen labeled this video, video as being Pyro. So here, yeah, uh, same group. That's, that's what I was under the impression of as well. Oh, we can kill NPCs now? That's um, fun. And we want to... We don't mind um, losing reputation with with the faction, and uh, oh my god, dude, this is that we're gonna take the artifacts um, through betrayal. That gun's kind of cool. Just though. take it straight into battle. Yeah, the interaction menu is just fucking terrible. So here we've got uh, it makes stuff like this so fucking for the players to enjoy and and to use to to flank um, and also navigate around. So each area will have different uh, secondary and tertiary routes of navigation. Um, James was really just trying to scare him there versus yeah. that was, actually That was intentional. Good, good job, James. <laughs> you you yeah. can also, if you notice real quick, there was a, uh, the <laughs> civilians are actually cowering as opposed to fighting, which is kind of, you'll see another coming up. But it's super cool. Man, I, I hate to say this, but so again, still, the player, uh, still a better outpost LARP than the Elite. You know, did they actually oh, fucking no, I knew things. you were going to do it. I knew it. <laughs> you know, I heard it in your voice the moment you started speaking. <laughs> and you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Kill the guy with his hands up. Do it. Do it. Don't be a pussy. He was All right, nice. he's a pussy. All right, it's yeah. worse. It's worse now than the Elite <laughs> really Dangerous thing. Uh, one of the things that we had their chance. Yeah, you don't want witnesses. They're going to tell everybody who's here. Uh, the enemy AI kind of fighting out across the tree. I think like that, that that's the thing that I hate to about, see. It feels uh, really great. One second, me just mute to see the face start waking. Just flapping or flapping to their their role play here. Um, I hate that about space games like this, where like you kill a civilian or you know you commit some piracy or whatever, and you just you're magically known as a criminal. Like, who saw it, motherfucker? Like that that kind of yeah, shit doesn't make I, sense, you know. I wonder if they're like, and and I don't know if this is something that's like easily doable, right? But like, sort of a system to where like, one, you have to be caught on camera, or a person has to like live to tell the story, right? Right. Yeah. About you, um, and two, like some kind of like information delay, right? Like, there's yeah. no way Just that like I believe that like yeah, like the fucking like some galaxy fucking 40 million light years away right from this fucking podunk garbage town on a fucking desolate moon or something right like somehow they instantly know the second you murder somebody right just immediately like, pyro's uh, most wanted yeah like, oh, I, shit. I, think, I don't know um i i don't know what movie or tv show it was i think it was one of the, one, something like that where like essentially uh they had like um like information like hubs that would like connect to them. each other and you're yeah. and, and, and like it uh, took it time for like your information impressive. to jump from one to another so sort of because it had to like is, it had to like upload onto a ship that was nearby one and then download onto information hubs near that that ship went to basically so here we are I, I don't remember if that was like a movie or something since you're all by yourself I want to say it was like some the player some form of media and i thought that, that was really interesting if you were right? with friends you could go in guns blazing um but but even with a system like that it's like hoover coming in to the, the thing for it to be sent off from, from a different side than another... what we've shown uh it also allows them to clock all the ai and see how they want to approach the problem and see what other secondary or tertiary routes would be open to them either via the ladder or maybe a possible door Good night. That was a great shot. Uh, also, one thing we did as well, as Todd said, you know, we, we changed the time of day. A beautiful shot from uh, 200 meters. The wind meters. is slightly stronger, so you'll see the uh, gorgeous that you've ever seen. yellow so grass beautiful. blown just a little bit more intense uh, than uh, before. Uh, also, what we see here is like um, something to 
to imply it, the frontier living, you know, maybe the growing crops or vegetables out here, but it also gives a, a kind of like a soft cover approach uh, to the perimeter of the base. Nice. Yeah, exactly, British. Also, with it being a different time of day, this allows us to show off the AI um, having their 24-hour schedules so that they can they can be in different areas um, when you approach it. So if you approach it at night or you approach it during the morning, you know they'll be doing different things. Whatever is uh, is valid for their schedule. Man, I I want to believe, but I 100% feel like. It's probably that just locked. another version of this no that area way. that's re, like, redone for how the AI will but what, like, uh, go and what do James this or that, actually see here as and not actually the them on a 24-hour um, schedule. You know, just checking the roof line. But uh, as, as I said previously, we wanted as many kind of like. Um, Wait, is this he's another in, version uh, of that same place where he's trying to go in and get that possible? thing? Yeah, he's you trying know, to, like, put oh, people on the way in uh, instead of continue like, betraying the context them. Of, of what's inside. Okay. But also when you're inside, I mean, it allows the player to, to, yeah. to have context of where they're at within the actual outpost. And that was a great shot. The, uh, the, the shot AI too. fell beautifully on the, uh, I mean, it was the a already called out beautiful yellow grass and moss. I hope he says it again. Also, so as uh, as James is looking back, every shot is a uh, great what he's shot. doing is actually uh, making a, a mental map of you know possible routes, great shot, uh, man. possible advanced traversal routes. How many times did you record on this? On top of the outpost. Great shot. Really oh no! <laughs> yeah, that's true. They probably recorded this like eight times. Oh, I'm sure it took them like you know a handful of times to get every like the game to work, and then also him not to fuck shit up. Yeah. And we saw the dealer there in the bedroom. Just end of the day. Just standing, end of the day. So with each outpost, yeah. there'll be different routes that will be open to the player or closed to the player. So some of them might have ladders on the outside, some of them might not. Some of them might have uh, basically ways to get in through the floorboards, other ones won't. But this is, this oh. is just one one. Boy, is he going to go for a ladder? You know, many possibilities. Yeah, no, 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 never mind. They recorded this 30 so times. He used the ladder. There's no fucking way that didn't fuck up half the time. At least. Up to the roof, <laughs> right? Killed him like and then no the way. Here, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it, at least 10 of the runs be able to that they had to redo the were because of that also ladder. Be able to look at any of the interactable. If he uses um, a second future, ladder, that you know, uh, the, we have to multiply the, uh, the runs by like 12. Maybe you need to go right? Like the the chances that you get through two ladders and the game doesn't fuck you over so slim. Therefore. Nefarious means, then maybe you want to take out the power, and which will then turn, you know, kill the AA turrets, or um, will turn off the the lights in the in the outpost. So it allows the player to interact with different items, and then uh, they even chat basically notes. create a <laughs> nice nice little sandbox for them to play in. So here you can see one Man, of those. Good thing all these guards are well literally the down. AI. Yeah, wait, actually, I didn't and even just behind these interactable is, there, is he using a sound? These, yeah, he's using a suppressor, like, but like, right now, this <laughs> totally uh, still here. just it. kind of empty. Oh, yeah, they are really just close. Illustrate right. like, a, like a guard point. In the future, you know, these could be maybe customizable or, you know, they could contain like an AA turret, like we saw on, on Demo <laughs> 1, or it could contain. To be fair, uh, my only idea storage, of suppressors uh, is movies. Tried to design right? something that was as and movies make possible. it seem like suppressors are magic. Right? Yeah, so no, here, okay. Still, the, there's still plenty shooting the two guys by the generator uh, thing, uh, that second guy absolutely would have heard that. Inventory right? System. Yeah. So this no matter, be, even if it was magic, team, right? This allows Holy to, shit. Um, Ooh, what is this menu? With and take off it's the looting. items associated with it. Also, it's the new, uh, is it? Change. Yeah, it's the new, no like, physicalized looting shit. So you can't be pulling off weapons oh. that you didn't take with you um, to oh. location. You have to, uh, you have to actually have loot now. Or, like, have uh, things with you. I know, but that was, like, what you, um, 
that you looked like fucking games. like code or um, one so it, original it really code or one menu makes type players shit right there. think about how they <laughs> maybe that's for the maybe they went back and played uh, the code games for it's it also zero, encourages okay? them to look around and see if, uh, the oh, designers and have played Maybe different so um, things that they can interact with or or use um to help uh, i was gonna get on here get right a, a and certain, just like um, fucking fanboy about this shit to see if i could annoy they, anybody in your chat i told you about this bring with them. and i just i can't it's there's and we'll also be including the uh i believe in the 315 yeah. the knickknacks app for your mobile glass so now that you aren't carrying everything on your body and it's not sort of universal inventory, you'll be able to consult this app to see oh my God. stuff is being he stored. He bolted onto stuff that, that doesn't have yellow paint on it. No, they, they won so 100%. Here, this allows the player just to, didn't put the paint there. Uh, have a, a quick little puzzle. <laughs> I don't yeah, believe that they've added universal vaulting. Fuck that. Yeah, was, was to go on to <laughs> Prove me wrong, Chris. Oh, oh, wait, no. Um versus climbing up the ladder Wait, and, and did you just see what I saw where he climbed on the box AI and then did it? Yeah. Them being, being spotted you think them. that still they didn't I 100%. Oh, 100%. God damn it. I don't I don't believe it at all. <laughs> oh. oh. I I mean I want hey, I want to I want to believe it, but I think you're right. <laughs> also, I think the team did a great job on the planet as well as the outpost. Yeah. Really yeah, kind of exactly and, and so like in. And um, you know, allows, I, I guess it's uh, the it's the promise that kills me, right? Like they come out with these cool you know, ideas for new game systems or whatever, and then or well, they well, hype the them up is, first, like, and uh, then what we get is garbage, and then they're like, oh, it's tier uh, zero, and then like fucking like, years uh, later, they haven't really done anything with it. It's like okay, like they they re or they rework it seven yeah. times and mm -hmm. actually, like you know, make the previous. Yeah. Probably the most important yeah. decision. It doesn't actually get better. It's in a high, how to approach the next problem. You know, we're seeing this god routine here. Wait, oh, that's your super chat. And ultimately, wait, oh shit, oh never mind, that's not hundred dollars. To distract the god. I, I was like, did someone just fucking? That's that's okay, Swift. I appreciate it anyway. No, no, it's still really <laughs> nice. I just thought a hundred <laughs> U.S. dollars would have been like outrageous. Areas, areas, right? Um, it's a behavior that we're still working out, but sorry. at least here we're seeing like the first iterations and be able Yo, to fuck um, you, Swift. Continue to Eric. optimize it as well as I'm, I'm, I'm um, cool make this, sure that the I'm cool with the monopoly money, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. So it's we totally just saw that for the first time. It's like the first rooftop airlock hatch. So previously, uh, routine. I mean, out, to be uh, fair, the, it could be worth more. If, if the outside wasn't pressurized. Like, yeah, yeah, nowadays, yeah, I never even know which ones are worth more. Through, I just <laughs> assume that our dollar is always worth the most can, because we're the you US can US cycle best, and, you know? and then, you know, infiltrate uh, through the roof. Oh, and also, what we're seeing here is. Please, anyone else uh, take me. <laughs> you know, potentially scouting out. See, like, uh, I, man, I'll be so happy if they actually have real mountain in because it it would mean so much for a star citizen, but I just. Uh, I'm struggling to believe it, dude, because they fake all these demos. Like that's the issue, right? Know, like they've I ruined know. my trust. That so like I can't, I can't take this shit at faith. You a, a very, you're right. Gives you an idea of, you know, we want to have different interactables, different loot that's boxes. The worst part um, is you're you're 100 right. The, the location. So, God, if the players um, is so bad. explore, they'll be rewarded. You know, we we want to encourage them. Looking in Wait, every and you like drag and, stuff on your player's body. You know what the what the oh, outpost has bad. for them. And one one of the things that's interesting is these garages won't be vehicle spawn points, so so it's not like a big kind of like pad in the middle. But yeah. if well, I mean, like, you know, if you oh. want to. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to go on. Your vehicle else. there, you got to yeah. drive it in and park um, it. So here you can see a variety of vehicles. Just... Well, that's that's kind of what I mean. Right, like the sandworm is obviously like a fucking huge standout one, but like every single demo they fake it. Like when they sh first showed off um, Lorville, and like they positioned the uh, the orbital station in a like scenic environment where it's literally like hanging over the planet, like right over the city, so that you could stand on the landing pad and look down at Lorville and like awe everybody. Um, the microtech demo, like that mission is still nowhere to be seen. No, none of the complexity of the AI is there. There's no like, nope, gotta go take my AI NPC piloted shuttle over to my really cool fucking infiltrate and steal data mission. Like all that shit is fucking faked every fucking time. So like, I see them doing this vaulting stuff and I'm like, man, that would be fucking great. But I don't believe them because every single time they hype 
and fake citizen con stuff because it gets the money to start flowing. So like, man, I wish I could take them at their word when they show stuff like yeah. this because it looks like there are like if this stuff is actually going to be in the verse soon, then that's huge improvement stuff. But like, I just don't trust it anymore. Here, again, we're using the inventory system. We allow the players to go in and. Uh, if you take out a certain AI, um, they might have different tools or different uh, notes or different items that y you'll need um, in order to solve. As I say, uh, I, I dislike um, your these mission. like stealth kind of things, where you're like walking in the rafters. Interesting. Raptors. When we designed these like, spaces, um, you know what happened? Was they built this turtle, building. And they're like, uh, all right, we want uh, you to be able to stealth through this. So let's make. Uh, uh, but we knew yeah, the alerts are like Yeah. Uh, like yeah, but they're like, let's build yeah, a whole maintenance the area just so you can sell through you can and yeah. through yeah. wires. Before you cycle, so like, you know, you can just double check to see if there's any bad guys on the other side. So we we got some ragdoll bugs. I guess it wouldn't be a system It'll totally without natural if we put any sort of wooden uh, pathways across issues or bugs. The top of the garage. Absolutely. <laughs> so here, like the previously, the players being, uh, you know, on the roof, they've come down through the main uh, section of the outpost. But here, what the players doing is they're going to the the underfloor section. So yeah, it's very these are vents, but they're more like uh, subfloors. So they're meant to feel very dark, like that that game. very minimal, but you're actually seeing the foundations of these outposts. So well, at least inside I'm here, it's uh, the player will need to kind of uh, work out how to navigate through them. It's very much a, a like a torch-based experience, you know. Um, and then within here, uh, what the player can actually do is work out uh, roughly where they are in relation to the uh, to what's uh, upstairs. And what you see in here, like this light bleeding down through, you know, you can kind of make informed decisions or, okay, that's where that AI was. Or uh, right now, the player is just underneath that main social space. So if you think back, like, that was the guard. I would be so happy to see, like, next to the kitchen NPC, counter. like, critters. <laughs> but, you know, the, it, we, yeah. we've intentionally made these spaces not necessarily, like, very easy to navigate because, you know, there wouldn't be a lot of light down here, you know. Um, the player would have to, you know, follow. That, that's essentially for example, their like MO. Their the MO. Wire, almost said yeah, MMO. You know, <laughs> um, you know, that's making really their MO, DJ, like, hey, right? Is that blue wire, I'm just tons of shit that will mislead people to be hyped to actually, spend money. You know, exit the suit support like they, space. They do this all the time where they show off really cool ideas, essentially. What but I they're like all built out as a demo. And not like. And then accurate representations the of what we should expect or what we're going to get. Um, or more and like that's navigation. the part that's so frustrating. Either going into prone or uh, just going yeah, to Yeah, nothing, crouch. none of these like gameplays that they show like feel like they're ever going to be like, so like here we what come we out, get, right? Uh, they always feel like this is what they're trying the to sell. The garage, it's like they're trying the to sell side of the um, from where we just something were. to shareholders, like a tech demo, right? It's a good rectal. Or whatever to like get shareholders to back their game. Now the the shareholders, right? In the shower. Yeah, one hundred percent. So here, um, this is just a different. But the problem with that is the they box. they uh, simultaneously case, do things like that, and then also and so the player will be sell a video to, game to uh, us, right? Like really I, I like I don't know. And, like I don't think those are the way that they look, and so that like, they can walk around the outpost and and not be. Be like noticed. Uh, there will be kind of a, a certain a certain time limit associated with it. We still need to work out the the details on how all that will work. But the the goal is to to give them a little bit of um, leeway. And so if you look the part, maybe you're not scrutinized as as much, and the AI won't uh, um, won't notice you as as quickly. Oh man. He took off his armor, so now he's one of them, and he can walk around. So here we can see sight, back right? into the social space, but this time on the one other side. Us. One of us. And then this door will lead directly into the the habitation oh, room please. that we saw previously on I the other side. I see he's still going through his 24-hour uh, life cycle of standing next to his bed after Speaking that took us 20 fun minutes. Right? Physics. That was a great one. So here, um, the player uh, decided to take the the dealer out instead of actually 
figuring out how they could open up the safe. Um, so they're going to have to look around the room. They're going to have to interact with the body. Big dummy. And possibly see, you know, is there a way for them to... Oh, but if I reach into his... Open it. His fucking... Um, in other prison cases, pocket, uh, I can find a card with the, the number on it, right? Um, in the future, and in some cases it won't be. Oh, and then right. you'll, you'll just, need to he wrote it down somewhere, though, right? Of actually opening it. Totally. Don't you write your safe code down? <laughs> totally. Dude. In the room with your safe? So yeah, right. Will be like, <laughs> like, hmm. So here we spot a little clue. So stupid. Um, a little note, and uh, you'll notice the. Uh, What's fun is like the name on here. If you look back, oh it's weird, really, just a loose uh, piece of paper. Really, AI would be taken out. Uh, you may notice some names. Um, so here's the clue for the player. Ah, but one of the coolest things for me here is the player is holding an item with the clue, and while holding the item, they can seamlessly interact with another item to solve a puzzle. That's awesome. And then here we got a little bug. The player was able to acquire the artifact, and then wait, what? Uh, we'll be able to do whatever they want with it, either sell it or be able to. Am I like retarded, or did he put in, in one two three four mission. and it says one two three six? Right. One of the things that was really exciting about watching this kind of back to back to back is is finally getting to see that freedom of choice. And it's like, it's really, really, I mean, again, the our locations are always stream. spectacular oh, yeah. and beautiful, but now like having that sort of striking oh that my balance God, my between fucking mouse is uh, off or something. What the fuck? You know, this sort of well thought out social okay. space and construction of these locations, but also an equally effective stealth and combat thing. It's a yeah, 65 super is a cool to say. So after calm. seeing the demo played through, you know, three different ways, um, it was a huge team effort. So. Uh, everyone. Oh, put, it's a. Uh, it's just a project, weird on this part of four, what we I wanted think. to show. We want to say a big thank you. Okay. You know, a big shout out because you know we're just yeah, presenting it's it. Just like uh, it's written. the people that did a lot of the hard work um, that should be represented. And uh, speaking of people doing hard work, uh, now's a good chance to throw it over to Eddie and Joel, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about the uh, how we built that oh, outpost that we just saw. Again. I'm Eddie Hilditch, uh, I'm a senior lead, and myself and my team have been working on the new Colonialism Outposts. My name's Joel Azapati, and I'm a senior environment artist too for the EU Sandbox team. So after the initial concept is done and rounds of feedback have been iterated on, we move into pre-production. This phase allows us to spend some time testing the concepts for in-game viability. Translation from concept to game isn't always one-to-one, -one, and during pre-production, we'll get rough versions of the concept meshes into game and spend time making sure that they'll work practically. The art direction can also change at this stage, so we use this phase to kind of explore creatively as well, and concept art is a fantastic jumping off point for sparking ideas. One of the first steps when starting a new location is to start look development a hyper-focused small section of the location where we can hone in the tools and methods needed to execute the concept in-game. Some things translate well, some things don't. It's important to figure all this out before going full steam ahead with the entire team. One of the great assets on the Sandbox team is we have a lot of people who are passionate about concept and design, which means when translating from concept to production environment, it's very easy to expand on the concept art. With the art styles of the Colonial Art Post, we decided to change up the way we typically author content. Okay, I'm Our pretty hard sure surface that this locations place is modeled are meant to feel prefabricated. Right. Like there's a right. manufacturing plant We're completely out there on our idea. Corp that churns right. out oh, yeah. these flat I mean, it looks like space station kits, very so stations can be mass produced. Colonial outposts are more personal or handcrafted by the people that, like, who live there, based on their needs, not wants. It looks like it was like built into the ground or whatever. They can't always choose luxury. I feel like that was something I've seen. Materials were one of the first things we tackled, and we started off by developing the idea of how the inhabitants would have built these structures and what materials they would use. We wanted to show not only the age of the outpost, but also wanted to hint at all those different layers of the structure and give you an idea how, functionally, they constructed them. One of the biggest challenges with the new outpost is how we introduce variation between each location the player will visit. Building each as a bespoke set of buildings is impossible, as we want hundreds, if not thousands, of outposts in the game eventually. The modular approach we've developed really evolved out of our previous work on space station interiors but with a few key improvements uh, this starts at the macro level 
where on the planet's outpost of place, how the local conditions affect your time there, then what kind of buildings an outpost has and how they're laid out, all the way down to the ability to independently swap out an underfloor layout in a single building of that outpost. We'll have various types of modules from large standalone modules like warehouses or ore extractors, which have a singular function, all the way down to smaller room modules that can be connected together in different ways to form a complete headquarters building. After pre-production was finished, we had a list of the room module types that we wanted to tackle first. Did you For the headquarters building, everything Disney hinges around a hub something? module with different room modules that can be attached to extend the structure. The room modules will serve different functions in the base with various okay, game systems it. linking one to another for an interconnected like web of sandbox gameplay so opportunities. Funny. As content creators for the outpost, we needed a new system to build, edit, and manage the library of modules we're creating. Rastar is the tool we'll use to do this. It allows us to intuitively create a location <coughs> template directly on the surface of the planet. Not only this, but headquarter buildings can be snapped together directly within the tool or with an intuitive user interface. One of the other major innovations with the Planet Tech has been the ability to modify the terrain mesh and flatten areas of terrain. Previously, we were at the mercy of the terrain when it came to designing our buildings, which is why our outposts had to be built with stilts and placed in naturally flat areas of the planet. Now, we can build much more natural buildings with walls and entrances connected directly to the planet's surface. And also, we can place these buildings in a much wider range of locations. We believe our new outposts inject a refreshing new location experience. So now starting. with the new system, They're you'll know when you're going to fall through the surface of the planet that really convey when you step the outside. history of humanity's expansion into the verse. The new art style, the focus from design on gameplay and the flexible modular approach to their construction will allow us as developers and you as players to be part of creating a wider variety of rich and satisfying experiences for every outpost the player comes across. Okay, cool. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Joel. That was awesome. And moving on, we're actually going to talk to Corey now, uh, who is going to give us kind of a deep dive into the creation of uh, the artifact, which is actually kind of our first little glimpse of the uh, Hadesian culture from Hades system. Thanks, guys. I'm Corey Bamford, the props artist at No, Games. no, you I'm guys, stop being negative. Everything that they invent that is proprietary the tech that they're going to sell to the AAA so we industry on, we some sort of to fund the game for the next 18 um, we originally fucking had a few generations, ideas for that. okay? Be, Originally, it was either going to be a tablet yeah, fragment, God, a sculpture, or a Hadesian artifact. So like, initially, what, what the concept team explores Starsis a variety of ideas. We use a lot of reference know? for existing alien artifacts in the game, as well as reference from the real world. Yeah, you know, lots of tomes and ancient kind of Egyptian no stuff as well. Just all sorts of really reference just to get a general idea. To be the same area we knew we wanted server. to integrate some form of ancient power or technology into the asset. We also knew we wanted it to have some sort of symbolism and text. Guys, so once 20. the concept team iterated further on these ideas, they then presented those back to Chris, and we narrowed down the selection of assets until we had a candidate that everyone was How happy much with. Was the, so uh, once we had this asset in mind, it then came down to okay. turning that from a concept into a production asset, and that's where the props team comes in. When a prop artist gets a concept like this, immediately the wheels in their head start turning, and they're trying to figure out the best way to implement it in our game engine. They need to find solutions within the engine to achieve the visual target of the concept. Black and gold Obviously, it's not as simple as just taking the concept and replicating it. We have to think about the shaders. We have to think about performance. Our, our job really is to find a solution within the game engine to achieve the visual target of the concept. Once we've figured out a strategy for achieving the look, we begin to actually make the content. So for the artifact, for example, we knew that it needed to be split into three segments, and they needed Mother to fit fucker, together. Man. I, I the first thing we do is get a placeholder into the game for the design it. team to um, actually uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought you were we trying We also to then figure out talk. how the scale actually yeah. works in the player's hand, uh, and when they inspect it. For the artifact, there was a bit of back and forth between the size, because we wanted to get a balance between it having prominence and also being easily carryable. After we figured out the size of the asset, we then need to actually break down how we're going to make it. So the first thing we really get into is the materials. <laughs> we know that this asset is made of a few different I mean, materials. Much have Firstly, we have the stone. I, the I, would, I would have pattern. to look into the 400 we also more. Have like, these large I, I need to see a brochure. Like, what does it do that makes it worth getting over well. something like well, um, set, we the Drake yeah, one? Um, textures, just because of the amount of detail we wanted to achieve. What's that fucking thing called? One of the biggest challenges we had was making sure that the stone looked really good. Corsair, yeah. Why would I get this over a Corsair or an Andromeda? Or, like, literally any other option. Like curvature. 
We also use a lot of procedural noises from substances on it just to add some variety. I mean, I'm on using fucking the height map Corsair, and jumping off the point for the rest of the touch right maps. Now, right? It's quite a nice logical and physicalized way of doing points. things. <laughs> it took quite a lot of iteration to get the final look. It was definitely a group effort. The glow was probably the trickiest part of this asset. We ended up actually using a shader some of you might remember from the Vandal Driller trailer. We created the iconography using a bespoke texture mask, and then the circles were derived from some cells within Substance Designer. We took these cells, quantized them, and then got the edges of that quantization to create the rings. And then we used a procedural mask as well as some hand-painted textures to mask out that glow. Once we were happy with this texture, we multiplied that onto the height map, which is used to drive the glow threshold. The glow effect has three texture inputs that we need to create. There's an animated glow map, which is sort of used to drive the background effect of the glow. There's also a gradient, which colors that map. Finally, we have the actual pulse itself, which is the texture map that pulses across the asset. Next up is the bronze. This was actually pretty straightforward to achieve. We didn't need any fancy shader effects for this one, just a standard set of unique textures. We wanted to get lots of nice scratches and aging on the, on the bronze. And in the concept, there's also this nice effect on the edges where the metal got darker. So we wanted to add that in as well, just to give it a more distinctive feel. Once but we yeah, were happy with the visual like look of the asset and engine, but it's on average like case as good as a it up, or we needed to create guess, LOD meshes for the object, as I well as collision proxies. I might pick that over the as you can tell, quite a lot of work goes into these hero assets. So that was a little bit of exploration into how we created the Hedician artifact. I mean, I guess one, one I hope like, you guys plus enjoyed the 400 talk about it. is it doesn't have like, giant wing eights to get shot off. Right? So, yeah, we wanted yeah. to thank you for your time. We wanted to uh, introduce Pyro and show all the hard work that all the teams have I mean, been working I, on. Like, and, uh, working as much as I do like the, the, teams like, the militarized a, a like, work in building the Pyro system, aesthetic building Drake, the AI, Drake. Mm-hmm. Building, I, I think uh, fucking the planets, really the world, and that you'll as, as explore. much as I don't like that. So Pyro will be ready shit. when server meshing is, it looks nice and it will be Corsair, coming out right? with Star Citizen. Al- yeah, my my issue with it, like, so the 400i, I'm not in love with it visually, but like, it still kind of has that origin theme and everything. And yeah, like, I do like origin, but my issue the, is that the like, interior oh, too, go ahead, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the interior 100% looks origin. Yeah. Um, oh fuck, let's see what this is first. Yeah, I think that for me, like, maybe the interior is as important as the exterior. And they can't really fuck up the origin interior, right? Like, not really. Um, or they haven't, at least. Is this the Star Wars Citizen Con? Like, what the fuck? Like this uh, white no on red? No fucking way that water lo- ever looks that good in game. No fucking way. That's the most misleading thing they've shown so far is the water, the waves splashing. This is like them being like, hey, dream more about our game, even though you'll never see this it, shit It again. 100% is, yeah. This yeah. is real I don't hard. Like, at least the other stuff was legitimately somebody playing the game. Whether or not it's on like some crazy like vertical slice of a build that we might never play, mm-hmm. right? At least that was gameplay, right? Yeah. This feels like, hey, by the way, remember what this game's going to be in 25 years that it will never actually be. Didn't think right? so. That's what... Something tells me, though, you got a pile of junk in that hangar of yours. Uh... Turn that crap into scrap at Dumper's Depot. Old Zeke always pays top cred for all your used gear to any of my verse famous franchise locations. From Art Corp to Crusader. Stop on by and tell them Zeke sent you. From thrusters to mining lasers, power plants to shield generators, we got your back. Dumpers Depot, because everything is valuable to someone. Dumpers Depot LLC is not responsible for inaccurate appraisals. Commercial service and delivery fees will apply.
space is cold and unforgiving. Only the toughest survive here. But even the toughest outlaw has a sensitive side. He doesn't have to so show it this? to everyone. Because with your very own uh, you have videos. peace, freedom, relaxation, a, and your yeah, yeah, very private that, um, emotional retreat always with you. Fuck. From Welcome to yeah. your oh, very it own so weird Moby Orison. Like, like the use of Moby Orison can be addictive. If in doubt, consult a licensed oh, physician. Maybe it was the Stress beacon is triggered, and a quick reactionary force from the lead expeditionary is mobilized. Roger, boss. Albatross swipe, perfect drop. One minute out. Look at the stockings dropping around. Utilizing state of the art technology, highly trained professionals arrive with it moments. Albatross flight, 30 seconds. Every team, power up. Rolling on three. Well, this uh, org is about to blow up with role players. <laughs> execute, execute, execute. Uh, Every team is rolling. Last man, every team down and safe. Roger, last man. Albatross breaking off. Elite Expeditionaries got your back. Oh my god, if you just face the the turret on the tank towards the ground and fire it, you'll be able to land it, right? That's <laughs> from a movie. Here at Kelto, we have one simple goal to bring you the oh, items smart. you need quickly god. and easily. We've got everything you need. Food, Hobbit says bye, 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 bye. Best deals in the Shire. Bye, 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 bye. Just walk Wait, inside to begin your astronomical savings what? using the latest in Moby technology. Sorry, were you doing a board game with you? Exactly what this you is board game. Oh, you. Once oh the yeah, I didn't go, notice it until the name at the end. And then you said Hobbit says, uh, right as I was about to say, like did I just say board game on there, right? An and then I was like, oh, shit, I think you just moved on. It's per minute. It's the best light machine gun you can get in a convenience store. Looking for something a bit smaller for the kids, we also carry the Gemini LH-86 pistol. Perfect for those small hands. So Come down to Kelto today for quality products at low prices. Perfect for the small hands and big heads and feet. Come to Kelto. Come to Kelto. Hey, welcome to CitizenCon 2951, our yearly celebration of everything Star Citizen is and showcase of what Star Citizen is on its way to become. As usual, I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. So what is CitizenCon? It when it started in 2013, 2951. it may have had its humble roots in Sandy just wanting some place to bring folks together and a it's solid excuse for Ben and Pete to watch the Wing Commander oh, movie in a theater in Austin, Texas. Last year as was with 2950, all things Star Citizen, it grew each year to Next become a full day of activities. Most recently, held in Wait, Manchester, the year England in 2019. Forward before the game now, releases. with a hiatus in yeah. 2020 due to the yeah. pandemic, and work? our desire to remain diligent and know. responsible in 2021, their way of being larpy is about back what is year something slightly the demo different this are, year. I guess. Now, while it won't be the same without seeing all of you in person, are they saying that like we're already creating bag in, in safe in or not? Uh, we hope this year's event brings the, with it a similar sense of community of and interaction <laughs> as our developers uh, God, present just, to you it, their continuing just, efforts to, in a bringing Star Barely Citizen's future it. to the present. Probably. And let's but talk about some it. of that okay. future we just saw with a look at Careful. we just took at the Pyro system. Now, I've always said it, and I'll continue to always say it, we get better with every one of these things we do whether that's planets, uh, spaceships, or anything else in between. And with the Pyro <laughs> presentation, 
we got our first true look at some of the new uh, planets and moons, the process of converting our existing space stations into new outlaw variants, uh, taking those colonial outposts that we've been seeing before from concept to amazingly detailed reality, and uh, perhaps most excitedly, planetary AI nav mesh in action with a 24-hour day-night cycle that will truly bring these worlds to life. I wonder how many yeah. of these people that, that after, universe um, of gameplay possibilities after these videos, seen they, in like, multiple they like different fucking ways walk into their office like, where objectives. no one's looking and they're like, so they're like uh, fuck, so finally, that was fucking day, horrible. Yes, like, God, I hate Pyro 3, dealing with the community, real right? <laughs> and our real mission, no sandworms here. That's yeah, what's Jared. Coming to Star yeah. Citizen, no sandworms here, just... More. Fake fucking now, 24 hour life cycle. Because I'm a, the patron saint of bad ideas, let's take a look at some of the comments that came in on Twitch while we were all watching. This should be good. Uh, Engion says, using talent from across the globe, that's a good thing. I agree. Uh, Adderoth says, this guy is talking like it's been made. <laughs> uh, DFX2KX says they probably have the gameplay, but they want to force folks to stick around and watch the whole thing before they show it. Annoying, but typical for them. We are who we are. We showcase every part of the Star Citizen. Uh, Rolana says someone needs to hand out some meds in chat. Underfern says... I wouldn't buy a melty dog from that man. I don't know if they're talking about Todd Pappy or Ian Leyland, but agreed. Uh, lots of people said 420 space weed vape nation damp, 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 dank. Uh, Gaming I mean, Fortis says, just remember, he's more scared of you than you are of him. That's the truth. And then everyone went on a claim Jared's like that, for a that while. hobo dog uh, that like James you Cameron, just kind of yes, adopted. The real James Cameron. So I mean, and of course, he's exist. only going to go with the easy finally, to read comments. Uh, Shorty like, Max said, "Come on, number fifteen, Burger King foot lettuce. The last thing you'd want in your Burger King burger is someone's foot fungus, but as it turns out, that might be what you get." Wise words, always. You can always rely on the Twitch community. No, come on. And Don't say that. DJ Jared is a national a treasure. Of community created videos throughout the day, ranging from commercials to skits to a variety of things in between. Him basically Those are all being Chris's little effort by our comic relief jester has been like the only thing he's had for to include how long as now? many of you in Don't today's take that festivities as possible. And while we can't show every single one that was sent in, the team did expand their original idea of just 15 videos to a whopping 42 for today's show. So you're going to see a few more. I know you're not progresses. talking shit on Bagman, British. Now, of course, CitizenCon wouldn't be CitizenCon. Bagman Eternal. Check that out, huh? Yeah. And this year, we've got it coming in two shapes and sizes. First up is the digital goodies Honestly, pack scene that here, fucking, which comes with uh, the newly minted Arden SL Balefire suit you may have seen recently on Inside Star Citizen. Done. Yeah, that was that, that was peak Citizen Con of helmet, like the uh, entire project. Uh, life. I feel like combat even, knife even when those, those things are always crappy, important. Like, and the classic that wasn't Citizen a great Con 2951 right? trophy, kind of shit, right? which I'm still but trying like to convince actor feature shit team in a, to turn into like an endearing way, right? Yeah, yeah. Just you know what I mean? Like, I think those kinds of things are fun. Right? Who cares if it's now? Good. These will all be distributed yeah. Monday to all I mean, backers. Yeah. So if you've been on the fence, so where else far, are you gonna watch a guy to back go get his today, fucking you'll get it along with his, his surplus his surplus jumpsuit and, and then yeah and then throw a plastic a bag over his head <laughs> that is clearly <laughs> losing <laughs> oxygen <laughs> because the entire thing is <laughs> fogged <laughs> out. <Yeah>. Swag <laughs> box that you can purchase on the RSI store. Uh, dude, by the way, there's a post that was like forget the sources and stuff. It's like forget the four hundred i that demo for a the artifact is amazing. I'm like, oh no. Yeah, oh, no. It, it's doing its no, purpose. Dude, no. Now, both collector's items come in a neat box. And so I was like, bundled with dude, being able to stand cool. and then mantle boxes. I was like, oh no. No, See? it's like, See? no. That, it, it's serving its purpose, purpose 100%, man. I, I bet you fucking money we don't get that anytime soon. Maybe someday, like years down the road, but I fucking bet, man. Oh no, are they fucking partnering? The CitizenCon watch parties have an opportunity to submit images on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag Wait, SC with Astro? Watch Those parties. are Astros, that's, right? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Xenothreat headset seen here. Oh no, it's just Whether your party is at home made. 
or at work. I was going to say, you, you could get your girlfriend into Star Citizen, doesn't she? Uh, like, extra headsets? And for she those did, of you yeah. She, she switched over media, to Steel Series. We're also though. giving away oh, okay. some Toby I mean, to be fair, for a long time, Toby they had Eye the Trackers on Spectrum game, today right? in a short story contest. So tell us about some incredible moments you've had in person with your fellow citizens and win a Toby Eye Tracker. Check that out on Spectrum for your chance to win. And no, uh, I don't have one of those to show you because, as somebody said, I don't give things back. Now, let's talk about the day's activities. We just completed our Life in the Verse or Life in Pyro presentation. Up next, we've got Ship Talk, where you'll learn about the latest and greatest in spacecraft coming to Star Citizen. Then we got Gen 12 and the Multicore Vulcan, where we'll take you through some of the new technologies that will unlock Star Citizen's ultimate performance potential. Uh, Crafting Worlds, which offers a brief look at some of the new tools that make up those the wonderful Nubian pyro cruiser. planets we just That's saw. The ship uh, server Wars. meshing and the state yeah. of persistence, yeah. Yeah. which will give you an inside look at the process yeah. of expanding Star Citizen out to the breadth and scope we all want it to reach. Uh, the Sounds of Space, which for my money is the sleeper presentation of the day. Uh, don't miss out. It looks at the new tools that will unleash our sound designers. Because he's a stressed out, I don't take care of myself, fucking old man. Processes. That's why. And then finally, Systemic Gameplay and the Stream of Thought. Ah! Oh no, I broke the things. As brainwaves directly into your skull no through TV. Provided, of course, you have your SGS brainwave amplitude receiver. Wait, did you pause there? You all sure. have your SGS okay. brain. I was like, <laughs> wait, why did mine, my shirt sure <laughs> It fucked me up, dude. Watching a YouTube video <laughs> inside a YouTube video is Basically, very weird, right? It's a big, long day of Star Citizen presentations <laughs> and infos. That pyro presentation alone was like an entire season of ISC just crammed into a single day. And just as fake. Think, can I take the rest of this quarter off? I can. I cannot. I cannot. All right. Well, God, if you end up missing why? Any part of the show or like just want to watch it again, each presentation will be going up on YouTube rap. later today in Fuck. glorious 4K. But fair warning, do not look directly into Todd Pep Todd Pappy's eyes in, in 4K. Dude, I didn't I didn't prepare benefits. either, Vaughn. I didn't go get alcohol before this because I slept in so late. And Oh, no, you don't have any alcohol? It's time to throw no, it to our next presentation today. Is there anything you should steal from your... Paul the Jones, first ever. John Crew, uh, ben Curtis, your, does Heather have anything there? No, like, even if you're not going to get any... Uh, yeah, no. Oh, no, you just uh, ship you don't know. She's got, like, seltzers and shit. You weren't supposed to know that you ended up did know. Oh, like, fucking... Yeah, wine cooler type shit. Here's ship dog. Fucking white claws? Does she have white claws? No, it's like that, but it doesn't taste like shit. Across the impossible uh, expense. All very no, realistic no, representations calls. of the game. Right. A distant <laughs> oasis. You can play this right now. <laughs> we chase what most consider myth. Pursue an obsession. That's what pushes us to greatness. The Oasis. It's real. The 400i by Origin Jumpworks. Yeah, like, the, the thing that bothers me about those commercials more than anything is that, like, with any other game, you don't really care when they just do, like, a CGI trailer that's showing off the game. But it's the fact that they yeah, yeah, it's constantly awesome. pitch it as, like, everything is real, everything is real, and then it ends up being super misleading and shit. And... Those trailers are always super cool to see the, the artwork from both the Yeah, it's a really good job of kind of showing off what, what I think everyone's kind of done. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we should probably get on with the show. Uh, this is Ship Talk, uh, where we are going to talk about a variety of things today. Uh, my name's John Crew, I'm the Vehicle Director here at CIG. Uh, I'm Ben Curtis, and I'm the Vehicle Art Director at CIG. And I'm Paul Jones, Art Director.
So the, the 400i, it's a Constellation competitor. And we've got a few of these ships in this category across the board. We have the Constellation, we have the Corsair, and now we have the 400i. And the 400i has a few interesting features that makes it a compelling choice over the others. So being an Origin ship, it's obviously very visually sleek and fast. Right. But Sell also, me, Daddy. It can carry cargo and a, a vehicle at the same time. Size-wise, there's obviously a big gap in the range. Uh, we have the the hundred series at the start. So it jumps up to the three hundred series. Then there's the big jump to the six hundred series, and then another jump to the eight ninety. So finding a space for this was was fairly easy, size-wise. I think it fills the gap quite nicely. So in terms of the yeah, process, that, um, I guess this, uh, normally what happens is we, we, you know yeah. we we assign it to one concept artist. And we start the ball rolling, so it's really just a, a game of sort of exploration at this point. You know, it's fast and loose. You know, we always have a timeline uh, for each concept, and so it's, uh, you know, the pressure is always on, basically. Did they show, like, a uh, cargo It doesn't matter bay? how many ships we've done, there's always that pressure to get it done. Oh, man, it's, some of these look so sort of fucking cool, honestly. So at this point um, in exploration, yeah, it's really sort the of cargo bay when you first uh, goes loosey down goosey the in terms of wow. figuring out how it oh, is, right, looking at right. shapes, looking at silhouettes, and sort of. Personally, I think like ninety percent of this looks better than what we got. Thinking, it's yeah, a lot of these concepts, you know, I'm like, oh man, ships, really? That would have fit be with the origin ship so much better. Some will be more by the 600i, some more by the 100i, and then we'll sort of do a mix and match. It's not even about like fitting. I just think that like I said, sometimes you don't hit it. Look at those! Fuck. I think, like, right at the beginning. I just don't like the point. Like, 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 I just think that the point ruins it. It's really beneficial because you you kind of, you know, you have that to pull from. But the reason it works on, like, the 600i, how they come to a point, is because it's still, like, usable, like, like, ship, right? Mm -hmm. The 400i is, like, a point of nothing. Just, like, the variance. Like, yeah. So I think the 400 is, um, it certainly stands out within the lineup, but it's clearly an origin ship. And I think it's, I mean, because we we sort of follow the, man, you know, sort of car manufacturers. Yeah, in terms uh, of love manga. Brand. I, I agree with that. I think that some of them look some really of the cool. Brand but also develops over time. So certainly, like a some double, a lot of yeah. them don't you know, look very origin. Since the start of the project, right. Origin has sort of slightly changed its style a little bit. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, like, say, yeah, you don't want to. Dude, she's so right. The Mini Six Hundred. Yeah. Even though it was a part of I think she's right. Like, let's do a mini I really like this Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is girl. And even that, even at this point, I can't she right, like, back she to right Yeah, there. like, <laughs> the moment I saw it, saw it, I was like, <laughs> fuck, you right. You right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chris hadn't had the chance there. to put his touch on him yet. <laughs> put his dirty <laughs> fucking fingers all over it. I was like, I kind of want a version like this. This looks kind of cool. And and so basically, in the end, I just went in and and kick bashed um, some ideas together. So this was, this was before my time on the ship team. So it's quite interesting oh, really? to, to learn a bit more about the, the process. I, I went, yeah, a lot of the... it's a great ship. My favourite one, Paul. <laughs> a lot of the, uh, the little Don't concept thumbnails. Get, if you see one, because we often show them in <laughs> Jump Point magazines afterwards after a ship's been released. You see all the early sketches, and people probably. I don't know, man. Don't know. I'm still trying to find my uh, uh, my stash of acid from last year. Free basing. It's just you like never know what might happen with the dumbest shit. Honestly, one, yes, yes, yes they might more. appear in future ships. So ultimately, this was this is what uh, you know. This is like a visual that I did. So it's you know. Throwing together a bunch I mean, of shapes, I guess I could go upstairs you know, and take a bong rip really quick, bashing, but uh, then the screen will just be, be giggling like quick. a fucking kid it's for the rest of the fucking <laughs> so it's like, God. It feels like you've got zero time. Dude, it, 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 you're like the so opposite of me. I, re- I do remember that one time you were high, but like, I, I get high and stand. then I get paranoid and shut the fuck <laughs> yeah, down, right? I'm like, all right, my understanding of the shit Fuck this shit. Luxury explorer. And so you can see here, that's why there's a swimming pool in there and a, and a deck you know the part of the process is that we show it to chris roberts uh, to get sort of direction and feedback and chris was quite adamant that this this was going to be you know, an, an explorer it wasn't it yeah. wasn't just you know, a, a small scale party ship it was you know it needed to have a function yeah. it needed to be a competitor to that scale and, and kind of role of ship yeah you know we did quite a lot of interior investigations and um you know just sort of looking at looking at ways of arranging space within that ship because like we said earlier 
even though this ship looks big, it's actually really tight. Like it's like yeah. it's a lot harder than you think to achieve everything that now star citizens expect to have in their ship. Yeah, of course and, it's really hard yeah, when you make a fucking lawn dart. Yeah, of course you're going to be struggling for space. Like, really oh, shit, that was a... Uh, most of the lower shot. section and the, the upper bit, which had the pool Interior. in it. Yeah. Um, maybe one day you'll get... Maybe you'll get the pool. You'll get your pool one day. So in terms of this process, what happens is we finish the concept, or what we what we think is finished, and then get Chris Stein off. Do a couple of paint schemes and then it that's passes over to uh, yeah. your department. Yeah, so so from the concept, okay, um, the, normally you know yeah, the, right we'll kind of take it just as quickly the, as possible in, into the editor, and that just allows us to um, kind of really get a good sense of the space from from the player and making sure that um, you know everything that we think we need is actually going to fit, um, making sure the components go through, and like like we were saying earlier. A lot of the time is um, what a ship starts off with its kind of um, paper design, you know, its official design document, to the point where we're actually kind of uh, working on the ship. The requirements can change. That might, you know, that's not Jesus, just because Stephen, we're you know, we're like, oh, we'll add this God. and add that to it. it it's sometimes you know, the balance <laughs> raising, done in the game. I'm not. That, you know, I'm not. Certain <laughs> ship item, you know, certain size shield. I'm incredibly, or, incredibly. Or um, it might be just that, yeah, we think well actually it'd be great if we could fit the x1 in it because it's kind of the perfect mm. ship for it um but that wasn't like say on the the original plans so yeah i mean like like you were saying the the ship is kind of a, a hard split with its its two floors so we, we've kept sort of all of engineering and cargo and storage and everything downstairs still and then the kind of the habs and the thing that i i feel like really irritates me with the 400i is it's just such an aggressive um front like knows in terms of like how quickly it goes from like being kind of like the 300 like that shot's perfect being the 300 eyes like mm. nice gentle curvature towards like being like a, a tight front end and then all of a sudden just fucking lawn dart front end yeah. and like it doesn't fit with it even the 890 like for its size it it comes to a point where like there's still all usable space in in a lot of it right and mm -hmm. with this one it just feels like the ship is essentially this back section and then you have the fucking front nose just there yeah. where if they had like done the the gradual like caving the whole way you would have had so much more space to work with and made more use of yeah, you had like... yeah originally i think on the concept you, you walked in through the docking collar um and like say the floor was a lift you had the collar on the side and then doors either side which took you to like a little antechamber that had the suit lockers in yeah, i think it was the yeah room. and yeah the, the the first bit of feedback from chris was i don't i don't really think there's very anything in the ship um, and that's when we kind of introduced the, like the stairs and the, the kind of like the big fucking, not marble staircase with that that sort it. of idea that you were kind of like you know 220 walking into the ship what are those fucking grand. um that had that some knock-ons to the interior space as well jousting yeah, it's like a jousting nose, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can use it to impale the bridge of another ship, I guess, right? Height change. I guess um, if I ever see a ship riding a ship, I can knock it off with my 400 eye, right? Yeah, see, like, the nose just ends right there in the main body. So, like, there's nothing there. It's just literally yeah. dead space. Um, I think it does, like I say, just that initial. I, if, I would have been more okay if they just cut off the nose, yeah. right? I mean, basically, like anymore, have the, go up the front it'd be it smaller, so it'd be easier yeah. to land places, I mean, and there's no yeah, way you no couldn't have rounded it out just a little bit forward of, like, yeah, most, most the body the that actually has interior. Like cargo, it? it's, it's and it would have looked more origin, and, too. And not really, no, I think yeah. you guys have done a great job on this. But I guess that's what happens when Chris Roberts is left to approve designs, and they don't just literally copy something from sci-fi. All right, give me your honest opinion. Well, if so this is like relatively like, decent and has like a good like, purpose what? or whatever, do you think I should melt the the, the Corsair for it? Oh man, I don't know. I guess it, it's hard to say because I would have to see like what what the Corsair actually ends up as. Yeah, that that's true. Fuck. Yeah, you're right. We don't even know about the Corsair yeah. yet. <laughs> I mean, you could always melt the Corsair, pick this up, and then. At least you have this as a standalone. And I have the Corsair and buy back, or yeah, 
Oh well, is the Corsair? Wait, I think the Corsair CCU'd, but when it yeah. comes out, you could they'll for sure sell a Warbond CCU. I could just, you. I could actually, you know what? No, 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 I'll just get a fucking Corsair to 400 i CCU. And hold on. Oh, does that work price wise? How much is the Corsair? Two ten. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. there you go. So I'll just get it. Yeah, it's like right under it, right? with it, I think. Um, the, yeah, there, there was a few different quirks. I'm gonna, I'll just hold on to that so, until we, um, you know, until it's figured it out. You, until we they figure it, it out or whatever. You set yeah. the bike up on its own, which was fine. But because the main entrance to the ship was at the, the, the front, it meant that yeah. you'd get off. You had to drive your bike onto this platform. Get off your bike. I don't even know how to run find around to the front of the ship. Run up like, the stairs. How do I yeah, and, and the stairs. And just look at your bike. Opening <laughs> isn't exactly like a super quick thing. So, yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, it just felt yeah. kind of like in terms of flow. Yeah, yeah. It's like, all right, no, quickly, stop showing get me this it, and fucking you're like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, send that up. Yeah. Oh, run. Yeah, okay, go. Yeah. A minute later or two minutes later, you're in, you're in the seat ready to fly. And like I say that was one of the, the issues we kind of hit. And then the other, I guess, um, oh, yeah, okay, issue was it just it started eating into the cargo space so it meant that you couldn't once you had the cargo fully loaded there was very little space for you to kind of traverse around the um, the cargo hold basically you know we we had a number of kind of ideas we played with and then uh if you click on yeah we ended up um basically putting it at the opposite end of the ship yeah. now the uh, nose should we call it the nose mm -hmm. yeah the nose now opens up and it's got like a nice little kind of dedicated x1 garage in there it's a nice use of that kind of spine yeah, that was there originally. Yeah, there was nothing really. The, the gravity drive was there. Yeah. So there is something. Nudge that back a bit. Um, Fair enough. And oh, the oh okay. They, they kind of <laughs> still tucked out at the side a little bit. So, what is it? Yeah. Um, it it's it's a dedicated sort of, yeah, like say, bay for the, the X1, one, which I guess technically yeah, you could throw like the suit lockers, delivery was, boxes in that yeah, too, or something like little hand placeable shit. Get your suit. Yeah. Back out. So yeah, taking up that space was. So if I do the Warbond edition, it only costs me really five dollars for the CC. All the controls for getting a new nice. ship and doing this. They're all but that has like right, I have to spend, to spend that money, yeah. even yeah. if I have credit, I can't use the credit for that, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's one of the kind of like um, if I do the, the, like say the nice things of it is, is you know you can look, just make sure. I guess thirty five. Oh god. And okay. it, it's just yeah, you set it up straight up and and yeah, there's no messing around. Hey, I'm finally spending money. Yeah, that's what I'm going to try and And then to be honest, most of the the rest of the ship kind of went pretty much to to plan in terms of you know what was on concept i don't think there was any kind of real surprises so you know now as, as you enter the ship and you come yeah the, i mean kind of like to be fair the 400 i is also labeled as a exploration slash pathfinder right yes yeah which yes. is so that was the corsair is exploration slash exploration so i, I imagine um, obviously we've made whether or not it's was good either of them to other ships like the they seem changed, to be so mostly the same it's not quite role. as unique as it was um but it's still very well shielded for its size uh and the other cool thing about yeah i mean engineering it, that's kind of how i generally feel about the project cool, in general cool. not yeah, just like climate controlled so what uh, what is there to even talk nice about like i don't even feel like it, with, it's worth it to really criticize it have, on a quarterly dry basis dry because like they're just full, full dry yeah, ice yeah get the, there's nothing happening the light sticks out and flow out a little bit of party mode in there yeah but yeah what are you gonna sit around like i don't know how it's fucking like hobbits like board gamer can make a video every cool fucking day? It's insane. Yeah, because we needed that space. He just talks to hear yeah, himself talk, I guess. Look at Tom. Yeah. Oh. So, and it kind of fits with the origin kind of family you know, as well. Think, Honestly, yeah. hobbits and Oompa Loompas are the best two um, things you then, can call yeah, people. Kind of, Thank you, you kind of for Willy Wonka and your storage and Lord of the Rings for bringing us that shit. Not off the top of my head no. now. No. Should, you can, should probably put that in the notes. Correct. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, so you can put a decent amount of storage in there. You've also got the escape pods. One of the other things we were doing when we were looking at this space with the bike is originally we were kind of, if we put the bike in this area, it meant that the storage reduced. So we were looking at kind of other ways of moving the storage around. At one point we thought, oh, we could put it out in the wings, but then that didn't really make sense because, you know, I did in wings where you saw your fuel and that sort of yeah. stuff and, and it just felt really awkward mm -hmm. where this kind of gives us the kind of classic traditional big block of cargo yeah big block of yeah, cargo you can't have a vehicle can't you yes yeah like um you, you can fit a cyclone in there yes and other, other smallish vehicles yeah but obviously it will take away your cargo space, your cargo yeah. space so yeah. it's not you can do it but you won't have any cargo but, but you won't have any cargo so yeah yeah okay and then, yeah, we kind of make our way upstairs. This is an exploration ship should only have a fucking motorbike. Um, 
Makes and sense. yeah, it's it's you know it's very to me anyway. The bridge is is very origin. It feels um, you know very very sleek. Um, you get a real nice view of the 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 kind of front of the ship out in front of you, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a nice place. And it's got the classic kind of origin uh, kind of HUD and, and you know, we haven't got any low tech screens. It's all kind of projected and yeah, feels right. fancy. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, I mean, you can see there's a lot of we won't talk about 600i this. influence yes. like from, the, from the original Just concepts. Let it go. Right. I, got, I got this ECU. Yeah. So I was keen They're to talk about it. I don't want to feel bad for giving them five more dollars. The black louvers. Yeah. And then get everything sort of because they're, they're one of the things that. Fucking fanboy. We, we kind of kept referencing <laughs> back during the production was like, let's just go back and have a look at the 600 because that's one of the, again, one of those kind of shapes that really sells Origin mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And. Yes, yeah, so I think it was good. Kind of it's just weird that they would go with this bridge yeah, also, layout, uh, like essentially the mimicking the 890, and then be like, "Oh, this is an explorer ship." And then you have the 600i with like essentially a full glassed-out cockpit view, and you're like, "Yeah," but like if I'm exploring, wouldn't I want to like see stuff, like see stuff underneath me, and like be able to explore a planet and like notice like landmarks or whatever? Whereas this thing, like. It's straight out. It's not even like straight out and above. Like it's restricted above and below with like the way the the top of the cockpit is, and then with the nose underneath of it. Seems like a weird design choice for an explorer. What kind of luxury? Because you know, he's he's the boss. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a, at one point it was a a four person ship, and then they reduced it down to three. So we've got that extra space for the. See, I'm learning loads of stuff. Yeah. Didn't know about today. Lots, yeah. lots of things changed during <laughs> yeah. the concept, like. Changing it from four to three might sound like a quick thing on paper, but then it's like you're losing a seat out of the bridge point, somewhere. Anathema. Fair uh, point. Yeah, you lose lockers. You lose to an extra seat in that bridge, though, because it would have yeah. you would have had to have kind of had them two banks. So it would have it's been it's in keeping yeah, with origin. Just, okay, just purely visual. It has a role. Sort of, it just doesn't it, do it well. Nicer weighted if it's. If I mean, the whole shape has a essentially a triangle. It looks fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it looks fast. Yeah. And then, yeah, as you kind of progress through to the rear of the ship, um, this is where, like I say, originally it was it was party time. Yeah, it was the party room. Yeah, we've we've kept some of the elements, I guess. Yeah, there, there's still a kitchen, a, a decent yeah, sized still, kitchen. It's still a nice space, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's like luxury. It's still yeah. that sort of luxury yacht. You have got your wine fridge, kind of so field, yeah. and a yeah. big ass table yeah, that will do nothing table. for the yeah, next ten table. years. Yeah breakout area and then yeah big nice but it's it's the back cool yeah, looking kind of though sort of like the, um, takes up you get, probably literally like one sixth of zone. the ship kind of, we, we you can stand around in an rp guys and, um, <laughs> it was a little bit more focused with the, the hollow table than the sort of you know the, the breakfast bar I like how the guy in the background just and, staring at um, her i think oh, having because we tried quite a few different ideas you're a girl we had like a war table with, with <laughs> seating and stuff. i didn't know there were girls on this ship a bit tight oh but no there's two girls and also i think um it we ended up going with like the standing kind of hollow table rather than a seating one because when you first kind of like look at it it felt like an extension of the um, relaxation area rather than like a kind of planning you know what, what we're going to do in our operation type area and then yeah basically that that kind of covers most of the 400 i guess as a, a whole all right well we covered that real quick so we'll <laughs> move from the 400i to something a bit bigger um it was an abrupt and ending something entirely new which is wait is it over liberator yeah which is oh, anvil's latest Design a spaceship. Uh -oh. Oh, like Assault that carrier. Transporting ships. So we want to do something proper. Wait, is this a uh, new ship? Sort of Anvil Liberator? Entry yeah, level. I don't yeah. think I've heard that name before. Yeah, no, it's for new. That uh, give me a second. If you a ship hauler, then this is the ship for you. It provides that good foundational base for it. It's a fairly regular sort of process on this one. As Jared and I have chatted before, you know, these ships are often described as, as births, you know, easy births, hard births, difficult births. Um, I think this one was a fast berth. It's been a while since we worked on some Anvil stuff. So in terms of the lineup, you know, we have the Ballista, the Terrapin, the Hurricane, the Valkyrie, you know, is probably more sort of, you know, it's one of those larger ships. Then we've got the Carrick. Yeah. So a lot of work has already been done for those ships and we've got... Um, you know we've got the modular kits so in terms of a concept process uh, theoretically it's it's smoother sailing 
and in terms of you know the, our process again uh, you know it's that it's that investigation and you know each manufacturer has a sort of a loose set of rules i'll say it's loose because there's always space for us to sort of slightly veer yeah. and slightly tweak the manufacturer well, i think like you said earlier like manufacturers change with time yeah, as well as they evolve yeah it's not like every ship yeah. came out with the exact same date with the exact same manufacturing processes it, it kind of all yeah no, i didn't know yeah. how to close my I, I mean that's kind of what i like played. about star city is we've got this sort of it's it's like, how do you close this Minecraft you know, game? Sort of, you know, it's sort of <laughs> everything is lines. being updated, yeah. yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it's nice that, you know, we, if, when we're at narrative and they're like, oh, well, actually, it's based on this old design. Yeah. Or whether it is, it's a new stuff. So, you know, one of the early requirements for, from John, which you can see here in this uh, fabulous des designer art. It's top quality design. Yeah, rocket. yeah. I'm liking it. I'm not sure about that. Uh, shade of green but <laughs> not quite anvil but basically this is super easy for us and also you know because we're working with a contractor about sort of laying out the limits of you know because we always you know we like to make ships big you know um so it's always okay we've got our metrics it has to fit within this like whatever you do make it cool but it has to fit within these bounds yeah so, it was quite strict on the landing pad size but you need to fit a number of ships in it but also make sure that it really kind of stayed within its... Otherwise, John will give us yeah, uh, big slap wrists. I'll and, come after you. Yeah. Because um, on, on that image there, you can see there's the red box, which is the maximum bounds that the ship can be. If, if you go outside that, it literally won't fit through the hangar doors yeah. and ceiling. So obviously it has to be in there. And that's a max, not a goal to hit. Because yeah. we've ended up in the past with ships that have a centimetre or two's clearance right, right. at the edge. Carrot. Yeah. Carrot. 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 Uh, so when you're coming in and out of the hangar you just clip yeah as soon as you clip one side of it then it throws it into yeah. the other one yeah um, it makes it difficult and you can see there for the the extra small landing pads uh the green size so once you've got three of them so at this point in the the design brief it was just three extra small ships by the time you've got these three green and they're actually they have some z height to them which i didn't put in here um mm -hmm. by the time you've got these green blocks so like you've got to have space for these and also got to fit in this, then you sort of start funneling yourself into Yeah, and shapes. I think, I mean, you'd, you know, you provided a reference image right at the start, which is of military hovercraft. Yeah, the, the American, uh, I can't remember if it's the Navy or the Army. Yeah, and so that was like, I, I mean, people will see straight away the, the correlation between the two and the sort of influence. But it, you know... It also makes sense, right? It's, it's a very functional. I'd say it's a very functional ship, isn't it? Yeah. So, and, and it feels like, I say, and obviously, the, the real life version has been yeah. for that function, and this this kind of follows suit. Yeah, definitely. I guess and there's so your combat so dropship. We'll basically, you'd be looking at some of our yeah. exterior they options, they and made, they made again, a it's always ship just for you know, that. it's quite difficult when you have something like that that reference image yeah. of the military hovercraft because instantly it sits in your mind. Yeah. And you sort of get um, it's the anvil kind of liberator sort of stuck in that thinking and so you know part of my job is also to sort of push push the concept looks out. like an assault carrier so, right okay well what about this what about that i think you know it's always a, you know it's it's always a sort of a i think they, the the interesting thing about that is like it would be able to carry its own kind of um two minds is always better than one right what do you call it so in, in this case support. we're sort of looking okay. at you know this is a sort of first first stab at it so there's a lot so of you similarities go to like an objective let's say i mean this is role playing that any of this shit ever matters you know, in star citizen but it's pretty you fly standard. towards it's an objective one, you need to take on the plate, ground launch your air support then and then go in fast stuff. with the ground vehicles not, you know, and get them off it, and it's a nice roll design target but, uh, while the air really support provides cover and suppression again but heavy role play that Star Citizen never cool. gets to a point like that, that is like a feasible game Yeah, yeah. I think just just uh, too too simple for too wedgy. Yeah, this one was asymmetrical version. You know, got that massive tank on the side. What it does, I'm not quite sure at this point, but it's you know it's just visual exploration. We've got the asymmetrical wings. Again, in, you know, sort of interesting stuff. At this point, we're starting to push. Um, into like terrapin it looks like it just looks like a giant conveyor of, belt <laughs> essentially like the bridge and it's kind of like yeah it literally just looks like a flying landing strip of, you know, it's kind of like 
the uh, yeah. What if that ship sort of moves so launch, that it can move so, the ships for you, know, you then, so you don't have to drive them game, off of it or whatever? Know, we're doing this what if it is a conveyor so. belt? It has, has some pros and cons design. Design design, because obviously it looks like we have the X, y, it looks like the fucking the Z, so like shit like um, a lot of uh, hangar metrics are quite tall not a conveyor um, belt but like so the the escalator the stuff with this but one the was, flat one, it was just right? the height of the ship it looks like uh, this the actual, yeah. the actual height it would have needed to be would have been double that so then you end up with this really tall gangly yeah. thing because yeah. we've also shortened it by a third so I like you trying to get yeah, like, to like the well, shape of a ship yeah, yeah, yeah that's a bit like yeah, like an airport. And then here is like a yeah, yeah, but sort of I don't know. Start don't, do they call them treadmills? The um, Whatever. It doesn't matter what they're I don't called. Know where the decision was made, but you know, it made sense to have the garages yeah. on that lower deck. Mm. Here, you know, you've got two tanks lying side by side, which it, you know is cool. It looks good, but it isn't actually like an official feature. Yeah. It was around this point where we were looking at the the double layer thing uh, and trying to get these. Two layers to work, or two floors to work, with the three larger ships. So we changed it from the three extra small pads to two extra small pads, which basically take any single seat fighter in the game and some around. So I think a prospector also fits on there. Yeah. And yeah. then we scaled the the front one down to an extra extra small. So mm -hmm. that's things like the the Argo MPUV, uh, Origin 85X, uh, and smaller flying ships like that. But also interestingly. That extra, extra small. Yeah, I would think, like, looking at the is models. sort of the same as the ah, medium vehicle metric. Um, there's like a meter difference in Because of how the, the, the Scorpius folds in, so I would think we it's still these three extra smalls uh, to two extra smalls on top, one extra, extra small at the front, and then these two garage slots, which can also, if you're willing to try and fly. I wonder if, um. Yeah, you if it's CAG, whenever they do like a live stream, yeah, yeah. right? Because yeah, um, like in the past they've done just, them not pre recorded, right? Like, even like shit like this, where people are just saying, I'm talking. Yeah, back in the Citizen Conship. I wonder if they stopped doing that because they were afraid, like, they'd pull a developer on to talk and the developer would, like, be like, alright, the game will buy it, right? I wonder if they're, like, afraid of that shit, right? You've got three ships on it, alright. You've 15. I need a big insurance yeah. payout. So, uh, you know, once we have the, you know, an exterior that we were happy with. I mean, it should be able to fit. Then we move on to the interior. Like and, width wise, you know, if it can fit a gladiator, because yeah, the gladiator it's, it's doesn't fold in. Uh, you have um, the and the Scorpius does. Thing. Like, it, it should uh, be able to carry the, a, the a Scorpius, no issue. Can either, it's sort of a flexible role. There, there is a turret that they can control. Mm -hmm. They can go sit in it and uh, shoot anything that comes at you, but. It's not really a ship that's a combat. I mean, that's ship. hard to it's, say. You'd have to it's look at the a transporter line. ship. If you want protection, you need to bring protection with you, or rely on the ships that you're carrying to. I don't think it would fit three. Another benefit. I think the Scorpius is topped. like longer. Yeah, 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 you can just you come under the especially yeah. when you fold the wings traps, back. Where you're not having to fly your ships. Out you one might by be one able to get two on there. there. They can get off pretty quickly. And then launch tubes, yeah, don't we? One day. One day. One day we do launch tubes. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I think about that. Um, so, yeah, basically we've moved on to interiors. Again, it's, uh, it's just investigation of, um, you know, we've got our function and what it needs to achieve. But, you know, in the last what, two, four years, definitely the last two years, is like our process has just been a lot, a lot stronger in terms of player flow. So there's no more of the star fairer. Uh, Higgledy Piggledy mystery tour. I mean, that was our first yeah. multi crew ship, so the yeah. pipeline wasn't in place. I, I mean, spaceships, interiors, I was like, I don't know. So, I mean, there's been a lot of learning going on, and so now it's like, okay, if I'm a player, what what, what experience do I want? Yeah. Like, how do I get from A to B? I don't want to do A to G to H to get to B. Yeah. None of that business. So, so as we look at these, um, uh, interiors we just sort of looked at sort of different flow basically different ideas so um, it feels quite good and we sort of worked on again just flow so if you're in the garage you can easily get from the garage into into the living quarters um, you know the elevators just run the full height it's so one for crew one for passengers so if you're under the ship you can just easily get up and down and uh -oh, so it's got jump seats uh, the whole process has 
a lot more streamlined. It's a troop carrier too. Um, and there's even it's like an everything carrier. carrier. Yeah. In yeah. those top rooms. Um, Holy shit. You know, and like it's, you know, there's a call to action. You've all got to get out. We've even put a nice little set of stairs that just run down the side of the yeah. ramp. And so you can just park, you know, run down, get in your whatever vehicle <laughs> and then off you go so a lot of I feel like a lot of thought was given to just like and improve and I think it's really nice as well the fact that you've got like I say that, that passenger section kind of sectioned off and they're always ready but then like say you were saying about like, the bowels of the ship and how that's that's like all that technical stuff's like hidden at the, the bottom and that that feels nice that that's crew only and, and you know because you don't want passengers just, yeah you know, uh, yeah just definitely milling around and then moving on to, you can see here, the garage space and where the cargo is stored. So originally that would kind of... I mean, this one I would say is essentially the troop yeah. of the garage spaces. It was going to be a, drop a compromise choice that the players can it, make. When he's trying to compare the, the fucking down, the Hercules yeah, to that, like the, this is purpose-built for ground assault. Across, like, one of the pads, so you could choose, Hercules, not, uh, but not so much. Decided to... Uh, well, we had a bit of space. Well, yeah, space basically, a, a concept guy when I went rogue was like, oh, what about this? This is cool. Yeah, this so, seems uh, more like a pull up yeah, on the front yeah, lines cool, and yeah, pop yeah, shit yeah. out. I'm like, John, can we have yeah. this? Yeah, Coming to a meeting. Oh, I've just gone uh, away and done this. Uh, the other, the, the Hercules seems more about. like delivering yeah, stuff yeah. to yeah. like the resupply areas, so right? Yeah. 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 A good Which is fine. Like, and you can deliver tanks to those areas too. It's not like you can't do that. Or troops, right? But like, it doesn't seem like one that you'd be like fucking landing in like hot zones to drop off like one tank and, and a load of guns you know what i mean like now, yeah and makes good use of the space i mean because like you said the ship is it is quite big so then we get to the fun part which is when we get onto promo uh, i think it's everyone's favorite part involved with this sort of stuff and that is really sort of i call it selling the dream so it's um you know <laughs> selling the dream that's so fucking fitting might be did he just um, say that and i i love doing this he sort of did stuff as well so um <laughs> So here we've got you know, fully loaded carrier. It's the uh, core of what that ship is. Before like, you have these these smaller carry carrier borne oh ships. As, I'm glad as that like, uh, uh, because I'm watching you watching the stream. They're not deep space fighters. Right? They can't go. When you say something in Discord, I have time to unmute to hear from it. A parent ship. So he did. He the, said the Liberator something. is unless you suddenly got an Idris to carry things with. This is you. this yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. This is what you're going to see going through these wide and long stasis. Like Pyro is incredibly large compared to Stanton, and Stanton's already quite big to go from one side to the other. So you really need these ships to help you lug all your stuff from point A to point B. Uh, Kraken was 2019, in your, right? In your Hornet, I think that's going to be I don't know, 50, 100 little stops. Whereas you cram it in one of these and send it on its way, it's going to be a much better experience for everyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm, I think this is going to be a... Like, is I'm it me or is the ginger have yeah, red shot yeah, eyes? Yeah, I think your team's going to... Uh, is he high? No, it's he's been up for 40 hours filming this over yeah. and over and over because it's of it's tiny three, little things that Chris didn't for, like in the video, hauling, probably. Three spaceships and some ground vehicles uh, long distance. Uh, mm -hmm. Very cool. Oh my god, guys, it's a merchant man! Let's, let's talk about the Banning Merchantman then. It's that, that ship that's been around for, for a long time. For a long time now. I think fans have been waiting quite a while for this. Yeah, we, we haven't really shown a, a huge amount of it beyond those original concept images. So No, and I think, um, you know, this is my second round on this. So I think maybe like... Three years ago, we did a we did an initial concept yeah. round like around the time of Defender, I guess. We, we I can't started. actually remember. So long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but sure. That's um. I think fans are gonna love this. So there's a few things that need to be updated for the Merchantman. Uh, obviously, we've talked about this many times in the past. Uh, Bring the nerfs and develops. Things get added. Bring the nerfs. Find we we improve our. our it's work. coming. This is so, the prep speech. Number one thing we had to do was look at the size and the scale of the ship because I think it was it was 160 meters wide and 160 meters long, so it was in essence a cube. Yeah, uh, but it's a very tall ship as well. Yeah, it? but it was it was very 
vague because we had never done a full interior. It's coming. Out, so oh, man, I can't wait to drop out. I called system, it. No. Yeah, so we need to make sure it fit everything in. So it's always a good starting point. Um, the cargo numbers were... They've never really been changed since they were originally concepted as freight units, not standard cargo units. So mm -hmm. the scale of cargo has changed since we did it originally. I don't remember freight units. Yeah, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was a long, my long time. time ago. The marketplace slash bazaar yeah. uh, needs to have a good working out. And then lastly, uh, we want to have some synergy between the Defender and the Merchantman. So we... We found a way to get a defender hangar on board, so that obviously has big consequences for the ship. So let's talk about the exterior. I guess the thinking about it, it seems so seems so long ago since I started on this, um, but the addition of the the defender to the ship basically had the biggest impact in a way, like just because because the defender is not a slim ship, is it? No, it's, it's deceptively yeah. big. To me, like the defender, I always think in my head that it's this tiny little yeah. thing, but it's, in fly it's, mode, it's quite slim, yeah. And then yeah, when it's nice. landed, it's got this sort of you know, big stance, yeah. So, um, this has been, uh, I, I can't, I think I've probably been on this for maybe a year, something like that now. Um, and I said before, you know, we, we did an initial round of concept work and it was sort of done more in isolation, so we didn't really have. Uh, a full interior and we sort of treated it more as okay we need a corridor we need a, an idea of a marketplace we need an idea of a bridge um, and you know we'll kind of sort of uh, piece them together and so that was maybe like three years ago something like that and obviously the process has changed mm -hmm. you know as we discussed today it's more about the player experience and the flow and Things making sense less. It, less it, rule of it's cool. quiet because they're still quiet. have the coolness. Because they're want to about yeah, to, yeah, to, to drop the gutting of when, like when one of the it, most beloved like, chips that's ever ships, been concepted. Can, oh, yeah, yeah. We can make whatever in this size and it'll be, it'll be fine, but that kind of always sets us up for just a lot more headaches when it comes to, to our size. So by you spending the time to actually like fully flesh out the interior, it just saves us so much time when we come to actually yeah, do the production yeah. side of it. Definitely, kind of takes all that risk away from us and puts it out front onto onto you basically. Yeah. So thanks. Paul. They're yeah. doing a lot of talking <laughs> and justifying yeah. and not a lot of showing. I mean, you can see here that oh you know, the yeah, have to scale I feel like I feel like it's uh, getting to a point where it's like okay, they're talking so much, trying to justify the doesn't fit doesn't fit mega nerfs that are coming. Right. We'll get to the solution in a little bit. Yeah. And just a quick shot of the front, and you can actually see that. From the front, it hasn't actually changed that much. You know, it's grown a little bit in height, but, you know, gained a little bit of body mass. But overall, pretty pretty similar. I mean, we've, you know, sort of, you know, the ethos of this whole thing is, you know, the ship was really cool anyway. Like, everybody would Yeah, that's like interesting ship, that you're so going to make it bigger, even. It wasn't even. that we wanted to change it just what? for change's sake. It was huh. just, we need to make it work. We do need to advance it. Oh wait, um, is the so is the left side the new version? The left side, I guess, is the Concept updated artist, scale. Mike Oberstein, oh, you know, I just for some reason Mark assumed Gibson, that was the old um, one. One of the I don't know CID's why. designers. We we basically met twice a week, every week for months, and I think it's going to Capital Tab the then. From top to bottom, inside to out. There's, um, there's a huge amount of ship. Yeah, yeah, and. Yeah. It, it, you know, hands down, this has been the most difficult and hardest ship to date. Like, um, I went, I've not had a nervous breakdown. Actually, you know, the, the whole process has been quite nice in a way, um, but it's just been long. It's the long, it's the... I think this is the one that, like... It's a marathon. To, to begin with, I was really scared. And then the, the kind of, like, the closer you kind of got to finishing your work, the kind of like the less scared I'm getting and the more excited I'm getting. And I'll probably have when we get into production, I'll be like, oh no, what we're we gonna do? And then then again, once we kind of start, actually kind of get over that hurdle, because it is it is a it's quite an intimidating ship, not not like just visually, but but like yeah. With the, you know. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, we're seeing here the sort of hangar opening. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically, we've you know the one of the sort of design philosophies of the Banu um, ships is. They they sort of incorporate tech where it suits them. So they use tech from humans, they use tech from Xi'an, um, whatever suits them to sort of achieve what their needs are. 
So for this ship, yeah, it's really uh, a lot of GM tech. So there's a lot to unpack that. here. I'm it's almost trying to let them talk. Tech, so stuff doesn't have to be but physically right, connected to move. It sort of it sort of hovers and then and then shifts along. So it's it's basically given us a lot of opportunity for creativity. So the hangar here, you know, it's always multi-part as well. So it's always mm. kind of nice. Basically shot from the front. This is with the the front guns out, which are. SA, that's yeah, correct, big, isn't it? big size eight guns. One of the the original core cool things of the the match one was all its weapons are sort of tucked away and and hidden, so it yes. gives you that non threatening aura to start with. And when it needs to, then everything. I was going to say it's going to be quite a powerhouse, really, isn't it? Like yeah, you know, yeah, with it's, its, its guns and its turrets. It's a proper it's, and it's a proper transformer this year. Yeah, too. I mean, there's, there's there's probably no area that doesn't transform almost, especially on the exterior. And again, you know, like John said, it's just to keep with that kind of like, oh, you know. Just a friendly trader. Yeah, just a yeah, friendly trader. Peaceful. Don't worry about me. Just yeah. going on my business. And then suddenly everything just pops out and, and it's all business. So again, sort of multi-stage animation for the guns. Again, for the turret. Um, I mean, the turret featured in the original. Um, you know, there was a hidden... They've never really fully explained. No, was, no. There was a... Uh, turret, uh, man turret there that you could get in and defend with, and it was in that top fin, I guess. You could yeah, call it. and when, when you know, when the weaponry is unmanned, it's a lot easier. We can get away with a lot smaller spaces. Once you put a person in it, then it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, and just a player experience, and it's it's a you know, twin twin gun, twin, yeah, twin <laughs> yeah. S five. So it's not giving you a little tickle. It's uh, yeah. Quite a big punch. Yeah. Even though it's only a, a you know a, a turret a gunner, you you still got to kind of take all the consideration you're taking in a like a pilot seat in terms of their visibility and, and everything else. And, and yeah, yeah, well. and, and yes, you know you you expect to see the big guns and the silhouette and get that kind of like the real feel of, of being in a gunner seat. But it, like I say, it's it's quite easy for it to just kind of grow in complexity quite yes. quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, we've, you know, we've used the GM tech again to help us sort of reveal the turret, also to elevate the turret. Um, still, you know, we've, we've had, we've got multiple ideas for that, so I think we'll just have to figure that out a lot further on. And then, uh, these, I mean, these, these guns look tiny. In yeah, they're, they're still <laughs> size. So these, these are guns that most fighters have equipped to them, but they're on these um, point defence turrets. So, obviously, the ship was big to start with. It's bigger now. It's more of a target for missiles and torpedoes. And one of the best ways we have in game to counter those is these automated point defense turrets. So, Bano again, whoop, humans have these phalanx style guns that shoot down incoming threats. We'll we'll take that and we'll use our own guns. Uh, so there's, it's got four of these on the hull. So there's two on top near the bridge, and then I think we see uh, the other two uh, underneath. Uh, so you've sort of got your your 360 degrees protection from, from missiles mm. from those. And then there's a, an additional pair of size 4 remote turrets under the wings. Uh, these are controlled from the bridge. Uh, the bridge crew mentioned them. So, yeah, it's, it's not lacking on... It's not lacking on the thing is, it, it, it can carry a fair amount of cargo and, and you know, it's got the same trading floor. And, you know, yeah. It's your livelihood. Yeah, yeah, you kind of need to make sure that I mean, basically, that. Yeah, there's a... It's it's a bit of a TARDIS. It's a bit of a you know. Yeah. There's a power there's style a guns are my favorite. There's a whole bunch of extra stuff that we've squeezed into this compared to the first one. So there's always been this feature on the on the Banu. It was there on the original, but it never really had a function. You know, some people called it the paddle. Some people call it the flipper. But Chris was like, okay, it needs it needs a reason to yeah. be there. It, it is very dominant. Yeah. In the yeah. Well, so I, I, I'll always remember that one bit of Defender concept art where it's just there just destroying a mountain <laughs> it flies over just dragging it through. so we've um, you know it's it's a multi-function essentially because um, one of the difficulties was is, uh, at the top of that flipper fuel scoop sorry um, is basically the entrance to the marketplace for traders and the public so it was you know there's that challenge of what it needs to look uh, you know, it needs to do its job, but it also needs to look visually appealing because it's going to be the entrance. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, and we'll see that a little in a second. Um, but it was, yeah, it was always, it was always a bit of a tricky thing to solve. 
And so, you know, again, we're seeing here the, as John mentioned earlier, the ship got wider and didn't yeah. actually fit on a landing pad. Which, which meant we had no hangars that it would officially fit in. We yeah. could only ever officially land at docking stations with docking yeah. ports or on a planet's surface, which is, you, as a trader, you're missing out on Living. all the places you could land to, to do trading. So we had to find a... Solution. A solution. I mean, the funny thing is, this is this is the mo this is the simplest of the of the um, of the solutions that we came up with. I mean, there's probably like ten others that we did. Some of them were super crazy, you know, part you know parts just folding back on each other and all sorts of things. So, but in the end, I think I mean, simplicity wins out. I mean, it's it's it, they're not small bits of wing to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of. I mean, there's gaps like... here. We you know we haven't got the mesh in there, yeah. but there will be. We'll, we'll work it out for you, Ben. Yeah. So you can see here, this is basically a shot of what is the fuel scoop, but it transforms again and becomes this pathway to the marketplace. So you'll have this, basically, why this experience, again, it's kind of the red carpet treatment. You're walking up into the marketplace. It's not in this image, but, you know, we will have, or hopefully, um, we'll have, like, softs, like, awnings basically that will sort of come out as well and so i'll have that sort of marketplace it, it, i think for me this, this is one of the ships that really excites me because um it's very different to you know yeah. not all the, a lot of the ships that we've kind of we've done um and i think that sort of like initial experience like you say of seeing this thing kind of like come and land down and and the traders kind of inviting you in and, and entering into you know it's it's very other world worldly yeah. kind of entering up that walking yeah. up those steps out of you know one of our kind of space stations, like you know, our human space stations. Oh, absolutely. I think it's going to be kind of really exciting to kind of... I mean, the that idea that is that as you go up those stairs, you'll have, you know, holographic visuals of products that are in the marketplace. Yeah. And so they will sort of pop up and just be spinning. So you'll have like, it's again, it's just that sort of shopping experience. And mm. it's like, oh, okay, I can get that and get that. Or maybe even artifacts that the traders picked up. Um, yeah, I that's mean, true, you've Max. got options, uh, basically. Yeah, he so. said it. Selling the dream, man. Um, and then also the He's getting cargo. Tony yeah. Yeah. Cargo, so cargo is a big One day, uh, it's going to be... Um, it was one of those things in the, the original concept, even digging out the original design brief, was, wasn't particularly clear on was the cargo bay internal, was it external, was it, uh, yeah, and it, I was mean, it a walkable space? And we kept yeah. it external for yeah. the first half of... Yeah. This development, and mm. and then uh, it was during a meeting where I think a bunch of us were in there with Chris, and we were all like, "Oh no, it's internal." And then someone else was like, "Oh no, it's external." And, and we just decided, like, let's make it enclosed. Um, we'll keep the the styling of how it was in the original concept, so you have that sort of, I don't know how you want to call it, shuttering or on the outside. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm struggling to actually remember it now because I'm kind of like yeah. not locked into this one. But yeah. it was more that it was it was you saw the cargo crates, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, exposed. Yeah, they? Yeah. they were they were exposed. Certainly from underneath, you could see them all. Yeah, they were tops top mounted, and you, they could all drop down. But that caused huge problems with the entrance case, where if they could all drop down at the same time, then you couldn't get in the ship to start with. So we did have a solution, but yeah. th this is definitely better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now it's now it's enclosed. You just have one way of dropping at the front. And then we'll see later how it's all managed inside. So you just have you can have the front ramp open and cargo coming up and down. Mm -hmm. The two the two systems are not interfering with each other. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that was your cargo thing. is more protected as well. Yeah, and that's kind of I guess a key element of it, isn't it? Is is you know not only having the um, like footfall into your your marketplace, but these big trade items you're going to need to deliver them. Yeah. 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 So we're going to move on to, um, so we've been looking at sort of uh, sort of functional images of, you know, basically explaining um, how we've been dealing with design decisions and how that's affected art. And so now we move on to the sort of the sexy stuff of looking at how we've taken the sort of the existing Banu materials, you know, from the early Merchantmen, which uh, there was a lot of good stuff on that, and then just progressing it a little bit further. And, you know, again, this is still, you know, this is subject to change still, you know, it's, it's a previs, but in terms of where it's heading, you know, it's really quite exciting. And so 
Um, you know, not everything is modelled in this, so, you know, the, there probably will be more folds in the metal, mm -hmm. kind of like there is on the Defender. Or, yeah. You know, yeah, if you look at the concept images versus where it all ends up pivoting on those those arms, yeah. there's a lot more detail. There's decided. a lot more, yeah, there's a lot more sort of intricate sort of folding of the metal. And so we're just kind of like working in, we're kind of sort of turning it into more, it, it is more ornate, it's more of a sort of... Uh, a, a sort of special item essentially um, and sort of really trying to sort of get that impression so you know we're layering in the gold we're layering in the sort of all the sort of um, sort of art nouveau line work sort of with a sort of banner influence you know we're looking at sort of taking um, sort of uh, materials like opal or whatever the Star Citizen equivalent is of that, and also integrating that into the ship. So it really is sort of a display of wealth. It's yeah. like, if you've got this, like, you, you're you loaded. <laughs> it's the crown jewel of your fleet. <laughs> it is. So, uh, you know, I think it, you know, it, it's, it's going to some really nice places. And so, you know, we're looking at this heavy bruiser of a turret. Um, and this is still work in progress. You know, ideally, there would be more work to do with this. And so we'd get more of the sort of um, the curvature in the in the metalwork and stuff, but because we're on a you know because of time scale and stuff, we've got to make some compromises. But um, we'll pass that information on. To yeah, you yeah, I'm sure we'll get a, have a good kick off on this one. I like the tower on this one. Yeah, it's good. So that's the exterior. Um, we'll move on to the interior. Uh, I guess we'll go over how it was, uh, mm -hmm. how it is, and then we'll go on a magical mystery tour. Through the interior, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, it was uh, a lot simpler, wasn't it? Yeah. Back in the day, it was pre pre metric, so we didn't have all. I'm just the kind of waiting for them place. to like stop yeah, work salad and everything, and actually, the marketplace is a lot simpler in here. Yeah, they've been so, rambling. Yeah, this, like, is, this is a horrible fucking segment. Manu, Merchant Men 2.0, or is and it, and it's like three guys who all sound like they're um, half asleep you know, too. We so basically it just makes moved it worse. on to a, yeah. A, a fully upgraded interior all drawn and so you can see from this cutaway and it's kind of hard to show uh, all the pathways in this ship we, we and I'm, i feel like i'm banging this drum but again we did a lot of work on pathways and navigation and so you can you know as a trader you're locked off to a certain route as a crew you, you've got access to everywhere but as a trader you're like okay well you've got these areas you can get to you can come in from the docking collar, and there's two different docking collars. Oh, it was like, there's, why did they have paint the on the ship? <laughs> and the ship to station, yeah. and then that funnels you into the marketplace, and then you can go back down through the flipper or vice versa, the fuel scoop. And so, you know, in terms of what's changed, you know, we've, you know, just we've had to create space for the cargo, of you know, the hangar for the defender that was a massive one. So, a lot of just shifting. Just shifting the internals around um you know there's two elevators in this there's one for crew there's one for traders again just... I, think, I think that kind of like builds on the experience of, of someone coming to buy stuff there though and to, to me that's kind of like part of the, the lure of the ship is that i feel like, know, like there, say, there's the, no the world where this has yeah. a up, huge the, cargo the kind of like capacity you know, anymore. spend money like that experience the... is like the, the of like one of the core elements of that ship that's what makes it that's having the like hangar bay put into it too. and like yeah. the market Coming taking up so much space like there's board, just yeah. no way yeah i don't, totally. I don't know how this and thing so we'll see here that the these are the like previous images these are straight straight out of 3d studio max with a bit of photoshop magic but it's just giving you an idea of that going up the fuel scoop or the, or the market entrance you know, you'll have the you'll have the awnings all full. Hey, Dice Man. Good morning, man. Should be a real I feel you. I wish I was just waking experience. up. I feel like I'm just well, now falling asleep. I, 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 kind of, like, I don't know why my, my head is like on chat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. that time. Yeah, this is like. And we've got we had I'm some getting tired because it's uh, yeah. like the, the market the, place. Is like pretty and so you, here, you basically you walked up, and you're you're again. I was drinking. I would for sure. Always in this concept, theory has always been this tree of life, essentially. So basically, you enter at the base of the tree. And then it forms the spine, and then 
that tree branches out. Yeah, but like if you look at the cross section, it's like fucking three the levels of the market. It's always been this little like, takes up a ton same of the same as the defender. You come in the defender up the ramp. Yes. And then you have that big central tree yeah. which houses components, and then that stretches out and back around to form. So the line the work in this is is a little more sort of refined. Like, into it's, it has gone less organic. Like um, you have two floors of just market. Kind of gone for a conference room. Less oh fuck me! Alien feeling. Yeah, my screen like, like doesn't feel like it's a actually a tree that has grown. Yeah. And they build the ship around yeah. this kind of organic thing. It is a Ugh. ship. Yeah, absolutely. And so like, here you have two floors of just market capture. This shit for whatever Max. reason. I don't know why you need a just conference so room and a fucking guest room like, on a trade ship, where, but okay. This is the a sanctuary for floor, some so reason. The marketplace is split into two floors. What is the sanctuary? Is it just know. like a chill out place or something? No, sorry, for you a, a four, fucking keep your slaves, I guess. Um, yeah. And then you have this little walkway that sort of goes over the top. You can kind like of see here, obviously, know, we've got a flying jellyfish. Yep. <laughs> well, the theory is that that'll be a holographic display. Uh, you know, hopefully the captain. Oh, you got a mute Discord now. What's on there. Yeah. It's a special offer for the day. <laughs> could be special offer, could show a weapon, could just... You don't want to risk your channel, right? Flies, 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 flies. The but fuck is he this doing really gives you a vibe of <laughs> touching um, myself inappropriately. You know, the yeah, okay, TV all right. Uh, <laughs> starting immediately. Fucking, you asked. Sort of just that overall experience. Yeah, I don't know. Was there a med room? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 And that Storage bridge. bridge. Yeah, yeah. You know, mass have little med. little jewels hanging off the... Oh, really, really mass have like and med. Those, like, so, yeah, there is some kind of med. It's all kind of like crammed into this one. Oh, yeah. Oh. The, the, the sort of, God um, damn, now I gotta the, again. These jewels and stones that are kind of going to be used as lights <sighs> and shit. And I think that's, that's struggles like of yeah. big just, monitor just life. Different. Um, and it, it, all yeah, three of them are crammed into this yeah, area right here. Or... Yeah. And so, so we're really sort of pushed have on that on this one. And so here is like. Which is weird that that's all three of those, which are pretty critical for like the crew take up less space than all this other junk. You can then go up there into the oh. negotiation mm, yes. room, which was in the original. One of the, the images that everyone remembers from yes. the, the original concept um, was that. He's streaming. Room with the table and yeah. the cargo. And so we've kind of kept that. Uh, we'll come to that in a second, but before you get there, uh, upstream. You come yeah. out of the elevator and you're sort of in a in a central corridor, which also leads to guests, habitation rooms. Uh, you need to deliver some to your brother. Take I think a long amount of time. Yeah, so. There's, there's a lot of back and forth with the, the narrative team on failure. The ship he's, in particular not, with, he's not going to share his alcohol how with do you. Banners, yeah, he's uh, been used trade, how, how do they eat? How do they? <laughs> because for yeah, the Defender, sure. it was sort of very small scale. Mm -hmm. it's, it's long duration. Um, but then, I get so all these, you these trades can take edibles days, weeks, and alcohol. Or months. So the, the people that are coming on board to trade. A good day. I need a place to stay yeah. whilst. And, and it's not like you know the people that are going to be kind of flying this. They they don't have a well. Yeah, it might have like a base of operations, like this is their, their this is their home. Yeah. So, you know, like you say, if you're trading, hey, Dak, how you doing, some of these things could be their livelihood. They're, they're you know, they're trying to trading these really expensive high end items, and that's kind of. And you want them to feel special, like yeah. you know, the, the thing about this always has been that uh, you know making making the people feel you know the more i sit here and listen to these guys talk and so you can see here watch them talk, know, in this image i'm like, like man i really want to go to bed yeah <laughs> you know, you're talking about like one of the mm, mute, mute real quick. um you're talking about like one of the most like hyped up concepts the loved ships yeah like, yeah like it was literally the carrick and the merchantman and yeah. i think still to this day like those two have probably the biggest backer following and you guys could not sound less excited. Yeah. Like, they literally sound like... If they're not falling asleep right now, then their objective is to put us to sleep. Like, holy shit, man. Um, and, and they just... Like, I feel like 90% of what they're talking about is just word salad shit. It's not even really, like, anything new or interesting. It feels like they're trying to time. Right? Yeah, it 100% feels like, okay, guys, so we're giving you this block of time try and stretch it and that's what it feels like i mean i guess yeah. it's better than having jared back out here in his fucking i'm a hobo costume but still like just barely 
And, you know, in terms I wonder of, if, like, and, you know, I don't know, he goes to, like, the grocery store in, like, and L.A. or something. If he's in L.A., I don't know. It doesn't matter. I think he is, yeah. some, some tech city, right? And I wonder if somebody's like, oh, is that Gabe? And he's like, yes, they did. They yeah, thought it was Gabe it's, it's once, quiet. right? <laughs> I wonder if that's, like, what he's going for. He, like, goes home and jerks off to the thought. He's like, oh, they thought I was Gabe. Ha! Ah. <laughs> and you were talking about me, you know. It's like saying too much here. <laughs> this is a really. Uh, well, yeah, but there's no slippery yeah, slope with, with the me. Organic theme, you keep the body <laughs> shapes, but pushing in a slightly different palette and materials, and so it's kind of basic. And I know exactly what I can and can't say on stream. Um, well, let me touch so myself can't really tell from here, but actually, it circles back things. on itself. So there's a. A little internal wall there that you go behind. And, and for the record, uh, it's thinking of you. Bruce toilet B. and yeah. shower and nice. all that sort of stuff is. And then you've got the bed in the back, and then you've got lockers and little seating area. So uh, he literally like sounds it, like he's like trying to ASM army right now. So again, yeah, and, just and pushing there's on. There's a ramp there, and, and it, it's really cool. And, and and tech and as well, so like holy fuck, dude! Desk, you know, like he's always kind of soft spoken, but fuck, held, man! Yeah. When you have to listen to him for this long, it's yeah. hard. Um, quite different. Where are you yeah. Watching? The source is. So stream. that's that's where the uh, traders go. But yeah. So instead crew, of streaming, he's watching. He's got. Right. He's watching. So, you, do you know what source is in this? Yeah. It's they, 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 every year they do yeah. a, a like so a convention, citizen con, um, right? For the last couple of years, obviously, it's been is, is still uh, online only, right? Can be shared because COVID. Yeah, yeah. It's more of a um, so they're like they're doing their like yearly citizen con stream or whatever. You know, this has always uh, been, and it's a theory it's of like basically just like been three or four guys the whole time just sitting around the table talking, um, like the body work, about the shit the whole the, this whole like the whole time for like two hours now or three hours or something like that. Um, but like they're saying a lot about some things that the things that don't need a lot said about them, right? Like they're just like ta they're basically like rehashing the same shit over and over and over to fill airtime. It's gonna be a Find, yeah. find a way to state the same fact yeah. in about 20 different uh, ways. You know, how we See, he, he doesn't even fucking know what Star Citizen is, basically, and even he knows what the fuck they're doing. Oh, I know what filler is. <laughs> See? Take note, chat. This fucking retarded monkey over here, like, barely knows how to put his pants on, and even he knows what hey. they're doing. No pants right now. Just state facts. <laughs> He's done I, ducking it. I would be all about it, Patrick. At least that would liven it up, hopefully. At least they'd fucking sound like they had some kind of energy reserve left. She can force them. I know how she can force them. She could say either they do the coke or they're forced to watch her tickle porn. <laughs> I'm sure they'll, they'll take, all they'll seen take it. the coke. I was about to say, let's go for both. I can't imagine there's anybody who works at CIG that hasn't seen that video. <laughs> Somebody probably walks around with like a phone with the video on it, right? Just be like, hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you seen this? <laughs> hey, welcome to the studio. Here's our uh, executive's wife. Watch this. <laughs> Display of wealth. Yeah, keep it classy. More functional, <laughs> but still got that 3D printing. You get a lot of that sort of like layering in here as well. Aren't yeah, you? yeah. That in the middle is the. What do we call it? The magic tagine. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. so it's fed from underneath, and you you know you choose what you want, and then it appears, and the top comes off, and you get your food out. Yeah. And you get your cutlery. Is that one of the like market areas? About, I think it's the mess hall. Oh, it's, it's, fuck, dude. <laughs> it's, a it's, it's a tricky one because it's a. Uh, it's a well, it's, I like how they all have different um, versions of like CA or like Star Citizen or CIG yeah, mods. Yeah. It. Um, if you had an entirely banner crew, if you were playing as a banner, wait, all, all different. Some of what? Of this, you don't need mugs, yes. like coffee mugs. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. I like how he turned his to showcase hey, it. Like somebody was like, hey. One, yeah. somebody in the background was like, yeah. turn the cup so, so they can buy it. Uh, uh, yeah, to be fair, well, I wasn't sure, stuff, and I and I held back saying that because every time it would go to them, his was turned towards yeah. him, yeah. right? Which rightfully, like to drink it, you don't want the handle facing away from you, right? But that made the it hid the label from us, and then finally he turned it. So you're right, somebody said something. Jared was in the background, fucking miming in his fucking hobo jester motions, like turn the cup, turn the cup, man, they're not gonna buy it. And you know, of course, CIG's 
fucking made in China fucking Dude, coffee cup can't have the fucking graphics on both sides, so Shadow they have to turn the cup. Well, that would cost 12 cents more on their $22 cup. Just eats into our subscriber money. Come on now, we're we're not gonna fucking pay them that. It sounds like a good idea, so I'm gonna say yes. So you know, if the engine's malfunctioning and it's sort of slowing down and stuff, that'd be kind of cool. I'll I'll take I'll claim that one. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure it was. And then you know, in in terms of the cargo space. Oh shit! You gotta work the. The fucking connexes by like manually, manually. The that'll be fun. Cargo containers that you see in all the <laughs> the rest stops and the cargo decks. These yeah. are those. Wait, what? The modern day big. Like they're showing the cargo bay and it's yeah. got like a loading crane for like moving quite, the connex oh. containers. Yeah. So you can't pick them up by yourself. <laughs> oh my god! With handheld tractor beams. It, all, all that, all that time in farm sim, yes. fucking so moving logs around with the fucking the claw. It's gonna pay off. I'm gonna be good, dude. I'm gonna be real good at this. You can control from this position that you can see in this. In the screenshot. This is my purpose um, in life. So that'll be something else to work out then. Um, but it's like it's, to work out, John. <laughs> but you know, will be a really cool area. And sort of just below you, that's basically where the sort of the loading platform is. Yeah, because it moves the, the cargo containers into that space, yes, and then that and space then kind of down. drops down, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. So there will be that sort of like, oh, I need the bottom one on the third yes. stack. And, All right, okay, yeah. let's let's shift everything out and. There yeah. is that sort of mini game of Jenga almost with mm. how stuff is going to hang out. Spaceship Tetris, oh and yeah. All the time you'll be able to see from the negotiation room. The, into the poor the... guy moving it around, just <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mess it up. Um, but yeah, oh. as, as a result of all this, they're going to overcomplicate it, Archer, or down they're going to fucking make it little, really cheesy, arcadey. It was a nebulous because number to start with. Won't want to dick with it. Really it's still, big. It's, still big, so yeah. it's, it's around 2,800. You're going to have to manage the power levels while small, there's a container hooked anyway. to the fucking yeah. thing while you're moving so it, right? Well above. Most <laughs> it's going to be the same mini mini game as mining. I bet. Don't say that. Still, yeah, it's a lot. Well, but they hate me. Maybe not quite as much as people were hoping for originally. Although I think it looks pretty. Though. It does. A lot yeah. of cargo, but you're gaining so much more. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's always a. That's true. I do. Take with I, these things I, I of, do have the possibility of having a 400 eye. Every ship do everything, but then mm -hmm. they just become yeah. these humongous vessels. Um, yeah. so it's a, it's Whoa, a Archer! So moving now up to Watch it, bud. the bridge area. And what we're looking at here is very much work in progress. I mean, we are Wait, literally working on this it, right now. Wait, what the is the top left? I had to think then is um, an image that, that we created oh, sort of in round chat. two, I'm, and we're and we're chat. sort of leveraging leveraging oh, that heavily. God. So a lot of a lot of those my, shapes. Oh, I read the on-screen chat now. Stuff. I'm confused if I... But in this new sort of configuration, Anyways. you're able to access the bridge, but you're also at able to access the remote, not the, the man turret. It's more of an experience. And then also you've got side corridors, which leads you to... Oh, it's got a special I, name, though. It's like a med it's not a meditation know. room. I can't remember the name oh. of it. There was a, a proof name, wasn't there? Yeah. I can't think what it is. Um, it's kind of like a sort of sacred space um, where sort of the Banu can sort of pay, you know... We've kind of got sort of the equivalent of prayer. Wheels. Is that the cockpit? That's kind of the theory. So it's like this little, this little nice little calm space. Um, so that's been quite fun. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the areas on this on this ship are very sort of multi-threaded. Mm -hmm. You know, you often have your central area and then stuff coming off it. Um, so like I said, there's been a lot of a lot of thought given to navigation, and in this area also. Uh, are two two lifts which also can take you quickly to other areas mm. from this bridge and it's a an eight person crew now um so there's space for four on the bridge obviously there's there's four uh, stations there uh, you have one person that can go to the the manned turrets towards the rear one person that can fly the defender and that leaves two to to deal with everything else whilst you're flying around because you, you can still trade whilst flying around but it's probably not the the wisest of ideas if the person who's come on board to trade has left their ship behind. So it's, I, I mean, it might be good for negotiations. Yeah, good for negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the eight crew can then fill the eight shops if you're just landed on a planet somewhere. You, mm -hmm. sort of, you pull double G. You don't need, obviously don't need to be flying if you landed. You can man your shop or you can let one person do, do double duty in shops. Yeah. Yeah. 
This is a um, an example. Well, a full size image of uh, that round two. Yeah, it, it's literally like the worst Bridge, pairing again, of people you can see possible. Max, like John is always fucking quiet as fuck. Um, this dude is always quiet as fuck, and then the other guy's just so junior that like he doesn't really have anything to add. Like every time he opens his mouth, it's to like basically be like a hype man for what the other two said. Like he he's added nothing uh, of note to the conversation other than to go, yeah, I think that that feature's really cool. Yeah, that that's really neat. Oh, that's before my time. Like, damn, dude, you're you're a developer and you don't know about that shit. I'm just fucking Joe Blow backer, and like, if I know about it, you should probably at least be brushed up on like the shit you're working on, man. But yeah, the the other two are just so fucking quiet and soft spoken, and then like this dude just literally. All he does is go, yeah, this is this is a good, I, I think this thing is interesting. And it's like, okay, cool, great. So you have two dudes who should never be allowed to be in a room together because they're both just like, they barely sound like they're out of a coma. And then you have the, the other guy is just set dressing. Okay, in production? Yep. So to close our, our talk out, I uh, thought we would revisit the, the idea that we had the last time we, we did one of these panels. We showed some concept ships or some ideas for concept ships mm -hmm. and talked about it and everyone voted for them. Obviously, as this is pre-recorded segment, we can't interact with the crowd and uh, get a feel mm -hmm. of that. So Fight amongst ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Arm wrestle for which one we do. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I do. Um, so <laughs> at the end, Jared will uh, explain how you can sort of vote or express your preference for what we show today, uh, and we will see what comes of that. But first, let's go over what we did last time. So we had this ground mining vehicle concept. We had the uh, Xi'an small cargo. We had the Tavarin light fighter. Uh, people may recognize I mean, they, sort of they ended up making all of these the except here. for the refinery, right? Uh, and then a small refinery ship. So let's see what's happened to those over the last few years. So that small ground miner turned into the Grey Cat Rock and the Rock DS. The Gatak Raylan was the Jian Small Cargo, and that was very close to that, that concept thumbnail mm -hmm. that we did. It was, wasn't it? Uh, we have the Asperia Talon, which was the Talon light fighter. And then the fourth one, which is a bit of a, a, a mystery. A so, mystery. A mystery. <laughs> I like this because time. I wasn't involved with this last time, but you've got a couple of my favourite ships in that, so... Yes, it's good. Mm -hmm. Read your mind in the, in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah nice yeah. add-on uh, there, bud. So that fourth one, the small refinery ship, obviously people don't know about, but uh, I can pretty confidently say people will know about it very That's soon. Good. Fingers crossed. So, it's a, a new year. We'll hey, Sean, we've got gone, four man. more sort of cuts of options here, so we go over those. Option A is a, a big explorer ship. So we obviously have the Carrick as the, the, the pinnacle of uh, explorer ships, but there can always be bummer. more. Yeah, it would be nice to get a bit of competition in for the Carrick, really. Yeah, maybe something misky. It'll be a bomber. And, uh, That's what, oh, man. It's a fucking bomber. Yeah. I'm down for that. What is this shit? Is this like... Have a selection of ground a vote thing? So yeah, this a, is a uh, vote a for what you want them there. to so we've make got two next. little small vehicles and uh, what looks like a, an APC car. based off the ballista chassis. They they all look cool. Yeah, the ground vehicles yeah, are kind it, of... Yeah, for sure. Um, it looks like a, although they're not an as, as grand and exciting as the else. ships, I think they're just really fun. They're not an amble, um, and, it, and it's nice. Yeah. They're nice things to work on because they are kind of contained and they are quite small. They are... I was going to say, like less complex but they're probably not that much less complex mm -hmm. than a ship because they still require all the same sort of setup and everything else yeah. but, and confinement yeah you, everything, you've got everything in, a, in a small space um but i think i think the ground vehicles kind of um they just add that extra element of fun when you are playing with yeah, friends by kyle it, it's it's okay, um back. You you know, just disconnected. it's not all just about space we've got some beautiful planets and being able to explore them 
Yeah, so if, if last year taught us anything, it's that they're going to build all of them, so the voting part doesn't really matter. That's still on the list. Yeah, it's like PJ special, yeah. yeah. I've maybe. got a few that are trying to like just wear John down with. Maybe, the, well, maybe option C, this hover hover vehicle could be a floating big pennies. Uh, delivery bike. Delivery quad yeah. bike. Yeah. Could be. So you could have like flying green zones, though, wouldn't you? And that would, that would be like, ooh, ooh, yeah, actual kind of landing zones would be all sorts of difficulties. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's we have some gravel of bikes in game at the moment, but this is a sort of a more stable, secure option because anyone that's flown gravel of bikes has experienced probably some mild terror as yeah. they, they try and do it. It's turns. been a while since we've done. Yeah, we've not done a. I'm trying to think when the last proper gravel of vehicle was. Well, I mean, not I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's been a while. Yeah. So the the last option, option D, is a a bomber ship. So we we have the Hercules A two, which is coming this patch. Uh, that obviously carries very big bombs, very. or it's a collection of smaller yeah, bombs. I don't even know what I was it is our only things. dedicated. Like, do we really need a new bomb. exploration ship? Like right? Like, I... Ships, they're more torpedoes. This is. I feel like all of these man, options kind of get in, get out, are pointless. bombs job yeah honestly um, like so yeah do we need another like, like how many exploration like, ships do we have at this point there's the still nothing to explore of the bombers is kind of like the and then like ground vehicles okay but like what do you, what's it gonna do there's yeah. nothing on the ground to do really like nothing matters on the ground hover bike yeah. fucking why like you still haven't ships. even made the x1 so like you guys, <laughs> you know, I was wondering if you were going to do it. And you it's going like, to yeah, have yeah. the back or yeah. ground so bike. You still yeah. don't have the motorcycle bike, yeah, and you still I, don't I have the nice one. So like, who cares? Even then, they work like shit too. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. really yeah. where you have the, the huge amount of fun. Um, and then yeah. is, is bomber, yeah. who yeah. fucking cares? Like just going off. I mean, I guess technically, we don't have a bomber bomber if it's going to actually be a bomber. Um, besides the A two. So like cool a fighter size like strike bomber I get that maybe, maybe. oh I see what you're saying. I was like wait what do you mean but like yeah you're right because the bombers aren't yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was thinking of it as the same well in, but, you know, in right. the past they always so called like the gladiator Just the retaliator the eclipse and stuff like that like bombers even though they can't drop bombs and like I but now we have a ship that can is the problem right so I see what yeah I see what you're saying if it was if it was gonna be more like the the C two or whatever and be a legit bomber this, then i'd be like okay the then like i can see them making that doesn't allow that at the right because we don't yeah. have yeah. a lot of that yeah. i guess yeah jared will come on but like in a we do have at least a good handful of uh, of like torpedo suggestions boats, on right? them and we'll, yeah we'll kind of ships. so like uh, i don't necessarily want one of those and i mean last year was basically so like we got a torpedo uh version of the um ben uh the fuck is that? Uh, is the talent, <laughs> yeah. right? The talent yeah. strike. To the Isn't that yeah. a um, repeater version? Missile. Missile. Whatever. Uh, Thanks fuck, for watching. I don't care. Uh, God, talk stupid time. versions of everything. All right. <laughs> fuck. Uh, yeah. I don't, I, honestly, what kind of ship could they make that isn't something that's overdone? Right. Do you hunger yeah. for the challenge? Oh God, more. More cringe. Against nature. I, I feel like I'd have to go through like every ship and like label out what they all are in like a spreadsheet and then also put what size they are because like you know if if all of our I know this isn't the case right but just like for example I guess if all of the exploration ships were medium then like yeah of course like a large or a small exploration ship would be you know but I like so I, I like I just don't know at this point like what we're what we're missing. What we're missing. I feel like these people are only getting acknowledged because this of the effort AI. you have to put in to like get a person with like a beer bottle in your nowhere, I guess. Welcome like to Nova. Today you can join you one have, of our like, five yeah. branches. Nova Core. Specializing in industry and commerce. Nova Skyline. Recreational activities and public relations. Nova Defense. Aggressive negotiations and security management. Nova Relief, our medical aid and first responders. And Nova Frontiers, the science and exploration branch. 
the future is in your hands. Look that there's gameplay. Universe, where a hardened reaver on the edge of civilization soothes his loneliness on the spectrum. But I'm too old to find love. That is a load of space whale crap, and you know it. Where a slaver in the heart of Cathcart meets new people is, is every this... day, but just can't find that. Oh, shit, this is special. so dumb. I can't handle this anymore, Maurice. I do. I know. This is the person in, like, Perhaps a little magic. No, he's not doing the fake walk with a space. Uh, no. From the producers of Replace Me comes a romantic comedy with a pirate's heart of gold, Sleepless, in Stanton. Coming soon to the Spectrum on Cathcart Public Access. What? I don't understand. Okay, I can't. That was the we most cringe that this fucking thing afford. has been. The whole time. And that's saying a lot. Power. It's been Not pretty fucking yet. cringe. Uh, yeah, but I mean, so far, I meant. Yeah, it, it's together. so much time to be more cringe. In unity. We are the Galactic Union. Oh, so cool. A bunch of people pressed the space bar and held it down. I love how, like, half of these videos unintentionally show how jank Star Citizen is. Yeah. Welcome so back. You're the watching background. Citizen Gun 2951. Just in the case fucking, you uh, saw the Benny Merchantman yeah. and lost uh, all yeah, sense yeah. of time, space, and reality there. That oh my god, he's back! Yay! Followed by another set of community videos. Uh, so the 400i is real and visible. Uh, the Anvil Liberator may become the hero of Pyro when players are left without all the gas stations everywhere, and the Banu Merchantman aims to take the crowd of coolest spacecraft in the game. Like it didn't have it already. Plus, you can vote to prioritize one of the next ships to move into development. Uh, voting should be enabled now on the very special comm link of, uh, found on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And uh, if it isn't, Give it some time. I'm willing to bet the site is being hammered just a little bit at the moment. Now, as for what you folks had to say during the presentation, we're going to try this again. All right, Twitch chat, don't let me down. I feel uh, like Jerry like the complete said, opposite of that. Other Yo, group, dog, right? you heard you like ships. Like he tries so we made a hard. ship to ship your ships so you can ship while you ship. Uh, Ora Valido said, they're shipping the shipping ships, ship shippings, ships. Yeah, he's like citizen on a lot overly of excited for no reason, guy. Uh, Medusa One says, it's so stupid. I love it. I don't know which ship he's talking about, but we'll take it. Uh, Enig Marin says, the new most important ship in Star Citizen. That's still me and Jay Lee, dude. Uh, Blix88 says, pocket carrier. Yes, finally, pocket carrier. And Lars19 says, Balloon Merchunk Man! God. I asked for the best of the best, and they gave me Lars 19. Back to the 400i, that promotion should have launched just a little while ago, so be sure you check that out, as well as the pre-Q&A FAQ, where the community team anticipated some of your most likely questions and put them to John Crew ahead of time. I hope there's at least one question about the bathrooms there. Now, of course, what we really want to do is fly the 400i. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that the 400i is not only straight to flyable, but will be available when Alpha 315 goes to PTU for Wave 1 testers, subscribers, and concierge. And as for when that is... Oh, straight to flyable. I'm told the platform team is literally watching this stream right now waiting for me to say the Wait, word what? and they will drop the patch so all i have to do is say the word Wait, what the fuck does that mean Whew. hey it's it's straight to flyable That's a lot of pressure and it will be available at a later date right but like I did i just it? not fucking hear that wrong or something like what it's he's saying it's going to be available in the ptu so it's going straight to flyable on the ptu which is going live today 
Oh, it's going. Okay, sorry. He uh, the way he said that now, uh, it made it seem like live you know, like and everybody was like, "Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right." right. And then CR okay. made everybody that's okay, wait that's an additional five minutes just to torture I, me. I misunderstood that, I guess. Yeah, big you remember that CR? And I was just like, "Wait, wait, why would you be like Pepperidge Farm? It's straight to flyable, really and in this patch, it'll be on the PTU, right? It just doesn't make sense to like say those both of those things. I don't know. To me, at least. All right, I've pushed the gag too far, as it seems. All right, here we go. Countdown ready. And three, two, one, go. Ha, 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 ha. He sounds that was funny. Uh. All right. Let's go now to Allie Brown, Christopher Bolte, and Daryl Barnes and... Learn more about Gen 12 and the, uh, the multi-core of Vulcan. God, that guy's hilarious. Hi, I'm Ali Brown, Director of Graphics Engineering here at Cloud Imperium Games. And today we're going to be talking about Gen 12, our new multi-core renderer. In addition to myself, we'll also be hearing from Christopher Bolte, our core engine architect, and Daryl Barnes, our graphics programmer. And today we're going to be talking about the need for our new renderer, the architecture and how it's built, Vulkan, uh, which is the back-end API we use, and the progress of how we're doing so far, and then what's next for the graphics team. So to help understand the need for the Gen 12 renderer, we we'll first want to take a look at the high-level structure of our existing renderer to try and understand how the new render will differ. So here you see a diagram very simplified of our overall architecture. And on the left-hand side, you can see the 3D engine. And this is what manages all the visible objects in the scene, for example, their position, their size, and ultimately is responsible for the culling of them objects and deciding what should be sent through on screen each frame to the renderer. And obviously, the job of the renderer is just to feed out the image at the end of the frame. And to do this, to manage this process, all of these objects have to pass through the single universal pipe, this conduit of information in the center. And as a result of that, every object has to come through with a certain amount of uh, settings or paperwork and baggage to describe how they should be configured and just have represented on the diagram by these uh, switches. So this type of design initially seems very flexible. And having this universal pipe, you can very easily toggle certain settings and get a very different rendered result for each object. But the reality is actually that the objects and the render so both end up extremely complicated because they have to decipher this list of instructions well, and distribute these objects through the various pipelines and stages and inside this the guy render. talk about this shit? And this has to happen for every object, every frame. Yeah, dude, this, this is all new tech. No one's ever done this before. Really quite a significant you think they're going to offer to sell this off to like Amazon for New World when New World has to be redone? It's quite complicated and hard to change the architecture. So how does our Gen 12 renderer differ from this? Well, the methodology we're taking on is to try and make everything as explicit as possible. And we're trying to minimize all these redundant connections uh, and switches and configuration options and try and get things much more streamlined. So to do this, each object in the world will directly communicate with the render pass responsible for drawing that object at startup time. So when the object is first spawned, it will communicate directly with the pass responsible for it and pre-configure everything possible at that stage. Now, this has a bunch of benefits. So by speaking directly like to the thing rendering it, it doesn't have to worry about, about all the other like literally rendering it. systems. So they end up with a much yeah, more yeah, limited set of parameters, like both on the object and on the rendering pass. Or whatever, and like, all the settings like we do have are very relevant industry. for the task, which makes yeah, it they act like they're like literally the first people to, to do this shit. More when like more ninety percent of games so out there have done like this, done it, or have done like smaller versions. They're actually going to map directly to our graphics API, which is the piece of software that sits just above your GPU driver. And this back end collects and executes all of these instructions. And because there is no high level knowledge of the rendering in this back end, it is just simply just issuing commands. It ends up very simple and streamlined and much simpler than the equivalent on our old renderer. So the benefit of this simpler code is it's much easier to multi-thread, which is to say to run it on multiple CPU cores in parallel, something that is crucial for modern CPUs. So multi-threading is a complex and often misunderstood paradigm, so I thought it was worth us talking briefly about how we optimize multi-threaded code. And for that, I'm going to use an analogy of building a house, which is another complex engineering task with dependencies. 
So here you can see a list of tasks for a builder, a joiner, and an electrician, all running uh, one after another, and there's dependencies between them shown in red. And in this example, the house is equivalent to rendering our frame. Each tradesman might be a different system, and then the capacity of three people in our house is equivalent to the three CPU cores we might have on our system. And the occupancy, as in the average number of people in the house, is effectively the same as the CPU or GPU utilization numbers you might see in Task Manager. So in this example, we can see the, the project takes 11 units of time and is on average 60% full for this house. Now, this occupancy of 60% isn't the direct reason that it takes 11 units of time, and that is in fact down to the critical path of work where the builder is blocking the joiner and the joiner is then blocking the electrician. So the obvious answer here is that you need another builder or multiple builders to work on this in parallel to unblock the joiner and, and so on. You can keep on parallelizing this work to try and reduce the critical path. And that is our focus when we are optimizing multi-threaded code. However, not all tasks are, are trivial to run in parallel, and Noxious sometimes it's spray. impossible to actually run them in parallel. So you will end up with these unallocated. Capacity Remember when they were going to charge bubbles, money to watch this? In this case, <laughs> oh my God. Was in fact our Can you imagine then if people paid ten bucks for this? Takes longer, I think it was going to be like forty-five or some shit. Wait, no. Yeah, it was and like twenty. It was a legit actually, convention a price ticket. Configuration, for example, a very fast. GPU oh my God! I just assume that they do the like the cheaper online version that like Blizzard and so we can fill these. Yeah, no, it, it was going to be like a legit ticket. And this can help fill the unused and, uh, Well, I do remember um, when people threw a fit, Chris was basically like, well, if you don't want a good quality yeah, show. If you want a lesser the experience, the then I guess the fine. I, I underestimated how selfish guys, some people could be. <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck. I couldn't believe when he said that shit. the frame time is the only thing that matters and the critical path that resulted in that frame time. So as we roll out Gen 12, sorry that people that spend fucking there, that the hundreds of dollars or even more on that don't think that they should have to spend another fifty dollars to hear a, a, a big update. So how every we year, actually achieve you know? this parallelism in practice? That's going to come down to two major changes. One is the architectural changes, which Christopher will talk us through, and the second is the Vulkan graphics API that Daryl is going to talk us through. We come to the next section of our Gen 12 renderer presentation. My name is Christopher Bolte, co-engine architect here at Cloud Imperium Games, and I would like to spend the next few minutes introducing the high-level architecture of our in-development Gen 12 renderer. For this section, I will focus on the rendering of object instances in the world. For example, chairs, walls. Oh, architecture! Places. This part of the rendering pipeline is called scene oh, object so rendering and has the largest impact on runtime Over performance. Back. There is also a lot of work happening on the architecture to manage operations which work on all pixels on the screen, so called post effects. But I won't cover those. The current slide shows our existing renderer code setup. We have a main thread, which does all game simulation as well as figuring out what objects we should draw for every frame. And we have a render thread, which takes all those this objects and translates the part of the show description where I run and into grab GPU alcohol. commands to render them on the screen. The system is set up to double buffer the data. In other words, the render thread is working on data from the previous frame, while the main thread produces data for the next frame. Such a setup allows easy performance improvements in some situations, but it also has two issues on modern hardware. First, the rendering code won't scale over multiple CPU cores, which can result in a bottleneck during execution. In other words, every visible object adds a certain cost. The more objects we render, the higher the cost. And as a single CPU processes this cost, no matter how well we optimize, at some object count we will run into performance issues. Second, since the main thread and render thread must be synchronized with vSync, we can end up with very bad load balancing. As shown in the slide, if the main thread takes longer than the render thread, the render thread has to, to be idle and wait. And vice versa, if the render thread takes longer, then the main thread has to wait. During such wait time, the CPU is underutilized, especially if waiting for the single core render thread. One goal for the Gen 12 renderer is to remove this kind of bottleneck and extend architecture as a system without those weights and allowing every operation to utilize all CPU cores. When we utilize all CPU cores, we would still have an object limit, 
if every visible object must be processed. That's definitely what it feels like. But we like can a process a high object count, and at the same time, we do the latency on the main thread until all objects are processed. As we will be making better use of modern multi-core CPUs. Let's take a look at some details. For example, please keep in mind that the size of the sections are chosen to visualize the cost. Relation in size doesn't necessarily translate to the same relation in CPU cost. When looking at the cost of the operations done by the vendor thread, a pattern quickly emerges. We pay a similar cost for every vendored object. This is called a draw call. For every draw call, some time that is spent inside our own vendor code and some part of it is spent in the GPU driver code. In the next slide, we will cover our current process as well as the next steps to move the draw call cost out of the vendor thread. I think the jump gate, uh, demo cost. was 2019, yeah. We already have a level of parallelization on the main thread, used to find out what objects are visible. There we use our batch worker job system. This is a parallelization system to execute the same code on a different object instance of all CPU cores. To give an example, Oof. checking 400 objects can be yeah, split over a, 10 threads. That, that should be like their great shame, for sure, Sean. 40 objects. Turn the time guy latency. down. Um, the fact that it took us, what, like seven years to get the Delta patcher? It's like, holy shit, you guys. You, you're sitting here. Well, I, I think the the weirder thing was how many backers slash fans constantly talked about how like CIG was literally inventing tech that they were going to license out to the industry and that was going to pay for everything, but they couldn't get a fucking patcher put in like random Patreon games managed that. And it took them how long to get a fucking patcher in. It was insane. Well, oh, new, new fucking build of the game. Time to to totally download the entire fucking client all over again because Big money CIG with all the talent and revolutionary tech for the industry can't fucking put in a fucking patcher. Its vendor description is copied into multiple temporary buffers. Those temporary buffers are processed in the next vendor thread frame to submit every object's draw call to the GPU. In other words, object calling is already at the point where we want to have the draw call processing. Right now, we are in the first implementation phase. We have defined our low-level code building blocks, ensured our APIs work, and are now in the process of moving our own rendering code out of the render thread into the existing batch worker execution. This is a very time-consuming refactor, as we need to change every rendering feature in a very old and large code base. But we have set it up in a way to allow us to gradually move over parts step by step. After this operation is done, we still copy state to a temporary buffer to be processed by the render thread. But the state which we copy is prepared in a way that we can directly send it to the GPU with minimal processing on the render thread. Doing this step will already give us performance benefits when we are render thread bound, as less code will be run on the render thread. Additionally, this is a necessary stepping stone for the next phase. After we manage to move our own rendering code to multiple CPU cores, we will start to utilize the Vulkan API. One major selling point of the newest generation of graphics APIs like Vulkan is the possibility to generate GPU commands on multiple threads. That is something which wasn't possible before, and mostly the cause for the existing renderer design. The catch is, to allow efficient parallel generation of GPU commands, the data must be prepared in a certain way. And that is what we are doing right now as part of porting the scene object rendering to Gen12 and moving our renderer code to the batch worker system. When this is done, we can implement the parallel work in backend and remove the render thread. After all that work is done, our renderer should be able to process a very high number of visible objects at lower impact on the frame time. At the same time, it will make better use of the available CPU resources and have less idle time when major systems wait for each other. Thank you for your time. Daryl will now take over to cover the work inside of the Gen12 renderer. Hi, my name is Daryl. I'm a graphics programmer here at Cloud Imperium Games, and I work closely with Vulkan and our graphics renderer to make the game look as good as it does. I mean, that's kind of like the unfortunate 
space where I'm at also fair is like so what exactly is sorry guy I'm sure you're gonna say something really interesting um I'm just at a point where like they show all this cool stuff like during the the pyro demo and stuff and I can't even trust it like the whole time I see it I'm like okay how did they fake this because it's never fucking real uh and, and it just sucks that like and it's not like I'm I'm jaded towards them because I'm like, oh, yeah, I want it to fail. It's just that, like, historically, these conventions are just always bullshit. Either they fake stuff or they drastically lie about timelines or whatever the case may be, right? Like, it, it's just always some kind of fucking bullshit that you can't – you can't see them presenting things that, like, would be cool new additions to the game and, and trust that, like, it's real, right? Whether it's fucking Tony going on about fucking quanta, quantum, whatever the fuck he wanted to call it. Even the cloth physics, like, that shit's all fucking fake. Like, you you go into that outpost that we just saw at Pyro, and, like, all the fucking tarps are blowing in the wind, and the flag is flapping. But they're just fucking an animation of, like, that cloth, right? Like, it's not real, You mean you don't real, believe that that cloth is simulating its fucking movement at all times based yeah, on exactly. the weather and wind direction. Right. You don't believe that? Nope. Wow. Nope. Wow. Or like the nope. vaulting. Like, I, like most people like, oh, that's awesome. And I'm like, in in my like naive heart, I'm like, that is awesome. But then in my like, I've been around this project for a decade heart, I'm like, it's fake. <laughs> Fuck you. I don't Does believe that, it. Wait, wait, wait. That heart doesn't exist. The second yeah. one. There's no heart there. <laughs> Just a big block of Lack ice. of heart, yeah. It's just, it sucks that, like, they've conditioned, like, me as an old backer so much that, like, I just can't believe anything they present at these anymore because it's almost always marketing and hype and, like, handcrafted bullshit meant to get people to spend money. To target specific features and extensions. We're not aware of any large-scale multiplayer games that captures Vulcan data live in the exact same way we do. Capturing this data allows us to plan ahead for any optimizations and then leverage that for the larger majority of players so we can bring you the latest and greatest. It's bad. On screen at the moment also, is a diagram uh, that shows I mean, the distribution listen, available. I am a true believer. Vulcan I dropped another five dollars this year. Amongst currently active Big players. money. <laughs> this was captured in the last three months, and as can be seen, there is ninety-eight percent of players that are able to use Vulcan fully in one point two. We did see a negligible amount of one point oh and some that were unavailable. We are actively looking into these cases, especially those that cannot currently run Vulcan as it is seen as unavailable. I'd like to take this opportunity to also say, please update your drivers as we do see a few cases where this can take you straight to the latest version. I'd like to now explain a bit more about the render graph and how this works hand in hand with the Vulcan API in order to improve our usage of Vulcan. So a render graph can be seen All right, it's it's officially time for me to uh, depend on each other to find the schedule here so this I can see what's skippable. The ordering, the scheduling, and the flow <sighs> of the actual frame. Wow. This allows us also to then addition that we need to during that frame. It also helps us from a design point of view as we can look at the render graph and see where there may be issues or potential optimizations. The render graph also allows us to keep track of any state of resources and we can also validate against those resources as well. Now I would like to explain the render graph as a whole and give you an overview of how it works between the GPU and also how it works in terms of our frame. So a frame is made up of a collection of passes. And sometimes we require... I mean, that's that's one of the issues I have with it, too, right, Noxious, is that, like, it feels like a lot of this stuff ends up being, like, uh, like, how much time did they waste on a demo to give an idea of how insert thing is going to work, right? <sighs> you know, 
I generally don't like to make fun of the way people look, right? And maybe this isn't really make, me making fun of him, but god damn, dude, that guy shouldn't have a beard, right? <laughs> he should shave that shit off. It <laughs> it looks like somebody like shaved a bunch of rat hair off of a rat and then like glued it onto spots on his chin. Yeah, face, I I right? I think like some people are very not self aware of the fact that like you can't grow facial hair and you should. Dude, be. I have like patchiness like the sides he has right there on his cheeks up mm-hmm. on the top part of my cheeks, but I just shave that off and then I have like a thick beard below it, right? Yeah. But like, like that's not like that's not a beard you keep any of, in my opinion, right? Yeah, yep, exactly. Like I I feel like I don't really have thick facial hair and I'm like insecure about like how thin mine is and I'm always like, "Oh god, I I would totally just rather mm-hmm. shave this off." But Heather Heather won't let me. Um well, it's not even. I <laughs> feel like for most people, but then you have people, this dude. Yeah, you don't have to shave it all off for most people. For most people, what? it's a matter of just keeping it trimmed. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I think like his hair color too makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah. He's got dark hair and then fucking super light skin. I like that he's got the, the patch on his lip just enough for the. <laughs> yeah dude i that's the first thing i shave completely is the part on the bottom lip (laughs) i hate that i hate it so much are you calling him not a man yeah maybe he's not oh shit did i just assume his gender fuck twitch ban (laughs) you're fucked dude (laughs) you are fucked maybe they transitioned and that's why Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! So the liberators up. Uh, standalone five seventy five. War bond five hundred. Is that the troop the carrier thing? one? Yeah, yeah, the transport transport. Hmm. Oh. All right, I need to find the schedule because uh, my mom's here and wants to take the kids out. Oh, Citizen Con. <laughs> Wait, isn't that a good thing? It just gets your kids away from you? Well, I feel bad if she takes them out and then I'm not. Oh, so what she means is take the kids out with you. Yeah. Oh, Um, ew. Okay. But you're just going to abandon us like that? I guess we're not playing Star Citizen like you promised, huh? Oh, it's not going to be all night. No. I'm (laughs) I'm kidding. I'll be back. (laughs) So it ends at 7. Where are we at right now in this bullshit? So next is Crafting Worlds, more planetary tech, and I'm talking about how amazing planets are going to be soon. Um, what's this, 20 minutes later? That's, man, see, like, <laughs> the shit that, like, I feel like they could spend a lot of time talking about is some of the shortest panels, and then, like, just word salad shit are the long ones. Like, holy fuck, really? So we have crafting worlds for 20 minutes, server meshing, and the state of persistence. Fuck! That's like the one thing I kind of want to see them talk about, too. Your mother will be very disappointed in you. And then, of course, Tony Z has like fucking two hours to fucking flap his fucking cum dumpster. What do you want, 15 to 2300? That dude's going to fucking just ramble. Legit just ramble. Like, you're going to have to rewatch his segment like eight fucking times to make sense of what he talks about tonight. And it, it's just going to be word word salad fucking bonanza out of Tony for sure. Like, none of it will make sense. It'll 100% be, be like listening to fucking those socialist YouTubers that try to get everyone to be socialist with them. <laughs> it's going to be like that. <laughs> So I think what's gonna happen, chat. Um, let me talk to my mom real quick and see how long she wants to go out for. Um, oh man, this sucks because I I do want to. Oh, God damn it, I do want to catch the uh, the persistent stream. I might have to just remote that part. Wait, do they uh do they stream on YouTube as well? 
No, only Twitch. Oh, uh, man. Do you, go see if you can check to see if their VODs are locked. Or wait, will this be put up on YouTube afterwards? Eventually, yeah. It usually oh, is. Oh, just not right away. Yeah. Um, You know what you could do? Big brain. Leave your stream running. Let it restream it. And yeah. Then, and then take when you get home, stop your stream. Right? So you can uh, fucking watch your own stream of it. <laughs> well, what it, what I think I might try to do, hoping that I can get service, um, I'm going to leave it going on my computer and join Discord on my phone and watch it on YouTube. Um, on, like on my phone, and then I can mm -hmm. still kind of like comment as all this shit's happening. Um, it'll just be kind of awkward with other people around me because we're going out. <laughs> but fuck it. Um, no, just... Eat. Listen, you gotta stream from your phone, all right? And then we can, you can ask your mom her opinions too, and she can be there. Yeah, yeah. Because we have an hour of fucking bullshit. There's a. Um, Better drunk, it'll probably be the best stream ever. <laughs> there's 33 <laughs> minutes of this dude fucking going on, or whoever else they have talking also. Um, but 33 minutes left of talking about Vulcan and how revolutionary CIG is making Vulcan. And then there's 20 minutes of, uh, the world building shit and then in an hour roughly um starts the server meshing and state of persistence which is really like the only important thing that they could talk about and it's 30 minutes long that says a lot right there <laughs> uh my phone is at 100 percent, so we're good uh i've been charging it so uh we should be able i should be able to still stay in chat and still cover the everything Um, but yeah, man, how are you going to have a, a fucking panel on this shit and it's only fucking 30 minutes long for persistence? Like, that's so crazy. Probably means it's either they're going to come on and be like, hey, it's done. Yeah. We're putting it in the game. Or they're going to come on and be like, well, here's making, why it's still not here will we, will we hard yeah <laughs> right that, that's <laughs> absolutely what will happen mother of fuck oh shit i wonder if I, I might need to make a different i might have to use a different discord account so that this still captures discord so i don't get moved out of it Yeah, I think that's uh, what I'll have to do. <sighs> All right. Um, I'll be right back, guys. Uh, I'll keep this going and unmute it, obviously. After this, that's where we'll start seeing the public milestones. And the first of that will be 100% uh, usage of Gen 12 and none of the hybrid approach. This will still be at DirectX 11, our current graphics API at this point. And then our second milestone will be the Vulkan API release. That will be optional at first and then mandatory after we've removed all the bugs. And then our final milestone will be when we so I got to play a little bit of the optimizations multi threaded. So that will only happen once the like Vulkan it? is in place and we can find so far, I'm liking it. on the final graphics. <laughs> what, really? And optimize. Yeah. The it's way. trash. How so? All right, listen. Assuming that the dev that said it is so telling the truth 12, about that build being a three month old build, then it could absolutely be really good. So a lot of Gen 12 but I think that the demo is bad. I think that they chose so one of the worst 12, maps really that they, they could the have. The performance. The and yeah, yeah, the map. Air, but but aircraft is like way too strong. Aircraft is way too strong. Oh, I literally. After Dude, I spawn in with a fucking people, the rocket launcher that homes in on shit, right? Visual features. Mm. And all I do is stare at the sky shooting rockets, traders, and I don't get to fire my actual gun geometry. once. And, this and I don't... Really exciting, it's like one in four like, rockets hits, and it just does damage and says that I broke apart on the plane, but doesn't destroy it, right? It's 
They have all the flares they could ever want, right? On top of that, it takes like three hits to break to kill one. a lot of exciting areas for us to look at. So insane. So that's it. I just wanted to I say think, um, thanks to everyone has been I think the movement is a step back from Battlefield 5 or 1 or whatever the last one was. The movement system, it seems like they... Personally, it feels like they... Instead of, like, being like, alright guys, let's take all the good stuff from Battlefield 5, right? And and improve on it a little bit, but you know, make make a new modern setting game, right? What they did was yeah. like, all right, let's improve on Battlefield Four instead, and forget the improvements we made on One and Five. That's what it feels like they did. Like if you like if you like Three and Four, then you'll like this one. I, think, right? I mean, I liked Four as well. So it's like Battlefield to me has been like the one like shooter series not to really disappoint me as much, I should say. But like for me, it's like I'm more like the game as a whole kind of thing it's like i don't know i mean granted it's like i couldn't really tell you how the movements feel but like much because of the fact that last i played was on the console so have you seen um you know how the, did you know there's bunny hopping in battlefield now <laughs> there's bunny they brought it back <laughs> so there's bunny hopping but also your character if you bunny hop maintains its momentum right so it's like so, while hopping, it's like instead of slowing down, it's like you're still to play like at a fucking sprint. Yeah, yeah. Sprint. No, but hold on. So if you fly a, a jet or a helicopter real close to the ground, right? And then hop mm -hmm. out and bunny hop, you carry the momentum from flying. It's what? insane, dude. I've seen people fucking zoom across the map on foot bunny hopping because they fucking jumped out of a plane <laughs> as it was like coming into like a skim on the ground, right? I'm gonna have to really, really hope that it's just like beta kind of thing. But yeah, I, yeah, it, I'm not like this wouldn't break this like this happening in the game. It's not like everyone's gonna be doing it. It happens rarely, right? Yeah. It's it's mostly just really funny, right? Shut but it's, <laughs> it's, it, it's really, really fucking funny, honestly. I kind of want to see that. I'm gonna be Dude, here, I got a link for you. Okay, I got a link for you. Give me a second. Piracy. Assassins, you're the scum of the verse, I say. Uh, I'm gonna put it in the the Is chat we have. All you oh. heard about us? There you go. Nah. I mean, it's really funny. Even the guys on here are laughing their asses Which off, right? I he hits a dope shot ass. too, a dope headshot no, on a guy parachuting. This is the way. Are you traveling the stars? Exploring the galaxy? That's lonely, lonely, hungry work. Always remember, though, Big Benny's with you. Big Benny always has your back. Big Benny, eat his food. Oh shit. Uh, Billy, are you still here? <laughs> the dude really I just finished that. Yeah, drivers. it's like in the fact that he like comes to a stop and he's pops my favorite that guy kind of parachute yeah. because they're precisely the that kind of thing <laughs> no other game studio would ever dream of sharing with folks. And as Citizen Gun 2051 rolls along, be an extreme, like, there was a lot to take in there, wasn't there? <laughs> I know server meshing and the like are the big buzzwords. I think um, performance improvements to be gained. Uh, the, the like, I think there's also citizen. some hit registration for graphics, issues. They're not only moving. There to are the times where I'm like, I, I didn't hit any of those shots really. Right. That it brings. But I think, yeah. I think they're also a focused bit of on reengineering. But, but again, I think so too because it's like there's a couple of people where it's like I killed them, like I was some of our shooting them, but it wasn't like showing the hit register, and then like the final hit, it would register and they would die. But things are ready. It's like it's one of those. There's nobody else near. Me, it's uh, like they basically folks, had to be database them, folks, the like, optimization okay, folks, I know and that countless other kind of folks thing. have used that word a lot but, uh, you know, from teams across oh, every shit. studio I'm is how we're going to get Star Citizen to that performance promised land and it takes all these teams to make that dream a reality and speaking of dreams made reality hey 
Sleepless in Stanton folks, don't think I forgot about you. Don't think because you're a community effort, I can't expect yeah, I mean, and I think demand it's fun, a full right? feature. I just, um, mm -hmm. I await my stream. I don't think it's worth $60. If, and in other community news, uh, one of the play, best things right? to come out of the Star Citizen oh, community yeah, over the years... Assuming there are improvements on it, like um, Game Glass. some UI it's fixes and It's an app turns your tablet or phone and maybe, into a control right? surface for the game. Um, so let's take a closer look at that now. And if they're right about this being a three-month-old build, and we're going to get, instead of a month of improvements, four or five months, right? Because it's yeah. a three-month-old build, then I'm a lot more... Uh, a lot happier about it, right? Yeah, no, that I would definitely understand because it's like I have noticed like some issues with like the elevator doors and shit like that. It's like oh, the elevator doors are so weird. Yeah, how they and then, like and then everybody else on the elevator falls through the floor for you. I've noticed but, that too. No, it's like so far it's like anytime I've gotten in the elevator, it's just been me sort of thing. Oh no, um, but whenever I'm in the elevator with anyone else. They like glitch through the floor over and over until we get to the top, and then they're back in there with me. It's like, okay. Up Wait. Next, we've got Anise, Mark, stream Morgan, chat. Will, is this and Marco a fucking taking a look what, at some is this of the like a legit app that they're doing? Including Rastar, which you may have seen a or, little bit of in the Pyro presentation. Crafting Fuck, worlds, planetary tech and tools. Uh, Star starts and shit. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're technically still on stream, man. The failure was AFK, I guess. I'm, I'm giving him, like, five or ten minutes to come back, and then I'm going to move him to another chat. Him and that skank of a mother of his... Hello, I am Mark Your mom, Bobo yeah. VP of technology, <laughs> and we're going to That's why it's funny, I know. Features today. First, Anis is going to give us an introduction about... It's funny, it's like we were just at Applebee's a bit of a go with her. It's like I was sitting there drinking some beers. It's like I stole Jessica's drink. I was like, I'll take this. You're clearly not finishing it. And seasons, and he's going to show us... A oh, he was, was making one. another account. He's Mark on his phone and Morgan now. are going uh, to talk about Rasta, our new base building tool. So, let's get started with Dad? Anis. Hello? Hi. Hi. My name is Anis and I'm right. senior uh, we, program. Me and him were sitting in here talking about Battlefield, and I'm and like, wait, the stream can still hear us, fuck. Right, the failure is dip, 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 for good, or? I like it. It's a little awkward sitting in here with your stream running and you not being here. <laughs> yeah, I thought he ended the stream. I was just like, okay. <laughs> While there is another oh, that's that dangerous as fuck. I wanted to touch a little bit on how it applies to the well, like, to character. He, he only How'd advocated for I murdering a lot of people, not all people, API. just a lot. He tends to provide next generation features for our 3D engine. Alright, I'll be right back. I uh, just want to figure out like this little... ...rendering common submission overlord, which is a Set up shit. button um, for but the back. Part of our recent efforts have been put to modernize our old school renderer to shape it in a conformant, modern API rendering style. Okay, to be so suitable the for the newer slow of the red API, such as Vulkan. Tony, I'm so Today, used to I'm going to talk a bit about Gen12 benefits for planetary rendering features. As I said, Gen12 keep aspect is performance. The way this is achieved have you, uh, is have to you make been the tornado yet? easier for multi-core security. No, uh, I haven't Old seen Gen's one yet. Like, I'm doing, really? like, rely uh, on a single track. Yeah, like, is it only in a certain game, game mode, or is it just... There's, there's only one game mode and one map. The oh, I thought there was a couple of and there's a ones, like, uh, no, 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 there, there are three game mode things listed there, right? But only oh, so one works. Only the one works. That oh, okay. See, that's weird. Modes. It's like, I mean, well, this game, it's Normally like, was is directly handled like the very the start of it. So maybe I'll actually see it this time. But to make sure I think it has, has to be raining. Like, 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 it has to be, like, raining and shit. For it to turn, for the tornado to happen. Since the rendering and so, but, dude, I was in a tornado earlier. And more responsibility where, is given it, to like, the I, Dude, I just run at the this tornado the moment I see it, right? And just get in it and parachute around the map over and over and wait for the fucking and rocket to explode or take off while I'm in the air, and that's all I do that whole Our game. Our <laughs> technology introduced a new set of engineering uh, challenges. Dude, uh, honestly, the, so the, the, the thing that they the seem to have worked the hardest that on in that game is the tornado. It's really well done. Techniques are not working very well for what now? Citizen. The tornado. To it's like really, it's really we well done. Like, planetary rendering computation I was going over a post more GPU in, um... This translates in the, the, the battlefield users, subreddit of somebody being like, hey, I'm a meteorologist or As some shit, right? Team, um, and he's like, they, they modeled the tornado, like, 
planetary terrain like pretty perfectly happening. right They're, he's like yeah, it, like it literally is like terrain improvements it's like one of the better modeled tornadoes i've ever seen right like <laughs> it's like both that's the one part of the game that runs like really well jesus fuck. <laughs> is a which allows to increase yeah. the they got fucking the freaks fly. of mother the nature down but really everything down. else is shit <laughs> The yeah. new triangle oh, are then manipulated to shape yes. the terrain high frequency details and improve surface speed. I think the other thing I just like um this new technique is, is uh, I don't like the like ammo bag, bag medical bag and uh and instead that of stuff, creating geometric details I don't like, like that being does, free for any simulating the specialist right after the I think that the uh, like I think that the only thing that they should have left from of it, of like free, like unlocked to anybody, right, are guns and uh, equipment. Distance. So like yeah, C4, C4, C4 rocket launcher, really and then guns to should be, oh, you, you could use any of those on anybody, right? Yeah, but I think that the healing is a class for the guns. It's like that. Yeah, I agree with that. That's stupid. Right, it makes sense. Especially no considering it's right. like they're all supposed to be fucking SF units or something like that. Like that. It's like, shit, like yeah. you think it they makes got no their sense. free pick of shit? <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. But I can see that, like, you know, like, in in a world where I'm, on a, I'm a soldier or whatever, to, uh, right? System, like, system, which if I'm a medic, I'm always a medic, on all right? Planets. Yeah, like you're specialist, you your you're specialized like into that, right? Yeah. So that makes sense to me, right? But they're not also going to be like, and since you're a medic, you can only have this one specific kind of gun, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. like you get this little fucking cap gun. Like there you go. That's it. The to you. And that we could only spawn new objects when we were creating new terrain. Like I'm sure that there are like some kind of like limitations on things, but I I doubt it's like the way Battlefield has ever done it. Control over the resolution of our objects when they're spawned and how we spread it across multiple frames which means that we get better performance in the client this also means that we add we are able to add a setting for the clients to control how far away each object preset was spawned the next improvement we've started to look at is making the ecosystems react to their situation we're gonna end up having to kick kyle out because he's gonna fucking end up turning us into the battlefield fucking citizen con humidity so that certain objects it's all his fault i swear higher humidity can be you're the one that walked away you left us free reign a new system has been designed for animal and entity spawning using tokens which means that we can specialize our object presets better for different planets for example, this is why we can't fucking hang out with Kyle. He just fucking ruins everything. <laughs> Get me drunk. I'll talk about anything you want. <laughs> yeah, we don't need you to. That's the problem. We can specify a small herb. Or would I just make it that much better? Snow, this might spawn some sort of Arctic rabbit, and in the jungle, this might spawn something completely different. I think you meant to say worse. We've also begun to experiment with a new foliage shader better. that takes into account the health it's of the plant me. based yeah. on its surroundings again, and the current season of the planet. Though what you're seeing on the screen is far from final. In the same vein as that, we've been working towards having more dynamically placed biomes around natural areas. We've created dressing object presets that are automatically placed around hosts, and of course my favourite thing to work on, rivers. In the most recent couple months, I've been doing more work on the rivers to prepare them to be closer to what we consider shippable, so that we can get them out to the players. This has included finer control of both the shape of our rivers as they flow from springs to larger rivers, but also the objects that spawn around our rivers. So we have control over what spawns in the water, what is spawning on the banks of the river, and what is spawning further away and blending it into the biome that it flows through. The other thing yeah, if, uh, if they don't have something to say in that 30 minute block about persistence and, uh, and in rivers, which server meshing, the then yeah, the Jesus Tech probably disappointment for how many years now? A lot more shiny. We've also been working on introducing basins to the river system so that we can have more natural pauses in our river systems and other bodies of water than just the oceans. Another major change was to stop using the planet's ocean mesh and just displacing it up to the river and instead building specific river mesh sections around If the they river. don't announce this that server that meshing and all that shit is done today, I'm water, just... And we can use our own... Like, honestly, like, I have no faith. Shader, meaning that we can specify <laughs> colours, flow... And other Hi, properties of the river water separately to the ocean of that. Hi, mom. Place. Rivers aren't done oh, yet, man. but they're closer Hello, to child. production than ever before. Your other child, he, when he put his pants on, he put them on backwards. So no. I told him to fix it, and he didn't. River so. system across a planet, <laughs> and maybe working on a little bit of lava flow, but we'll have Fuck, to see. Dude, I don't... Next is, so uh, before Mark I switch to this, like, Thanks, phone filler account, like, Discord did, like, a pop-out, kind of like... Ah. Facebook Messenger I'm talking head thing, so I could easily like team, basically I'm have Discord going while 
having the YouTube open, and now it's not doing it. It's really frustrating. What is a Rasta? Rasta is our like a uh, like a is it you mean like um an edition. The name stands for sort of like when you have like a YouTube uh, video going, RCS, it has like picture in picture when you mm -hmm. YouTube. Inspiration yeah. from its map editor system uh -huh. and stuff. Uh, well, you know. Its goals are to replace our previous placement system based on prefabs to a better object container oriented solution. As our previous system was based on prefabs, any changes to location was source of yeah, issue, as it needs to re-enable the whole set of data to have things like missions or shops to work again. With this new system, any change will be easily manageable and won't require us to redo work when a change is made. Plus, as it's now object container oriented, it can be used for outpost, case, or even derelicts, and more. It works as a modular system where locations will I got it. Work now. small elements nice. that will be placed I'm just so like you do in City Builder RTS editor. In a matter of minutes, we now have a new location where we can now create a bunch of cool gameplay. You're so smart. Let's go to Mark, who will tell us about the connector system. Thanks, Morgan. So, I'm Mark. I'm also a tools developer for the Plant Tech team. Do you know what's better? I think the uh, the big disappointment for me oh, is that like the only two like new that, citizen con things seem to be the 400i and that liberator. Basically, artists create small parts of homesteads that we can then snap together. Every part is modular, so we can uh, interchange multiple ones. In order to have uh, Wait, procedural so like, homesteads. things that they can sell today? Every change is very simple. We can change like the whole inside uh, of a homestead. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. I, would, I thought you were like mocking, or I didn't realize that you were mockingly answering that. And I thought you were seriously answering it. And I was like, oh, well, you know, like things that are new, like all we've really seen is the Liberator and the 400. And then I realized you were mocking me. So, it can be yeah. deleted and changed. And well, I wasn't mocking you. I was mocking the fact that that's what they actually so, uh, did. Back Great. to you, Morgan. And last but not I, I least, think I was mocking yeah. you might have noticed was, that the UI... Is well, not no, not, quite I guess not necessarily engine. mocking me, but like that's mocking normal. what, uh, what was presented. Yeah. UI tech building blocks, and that for a reason. Well, today it's being used by our developers. One day, when it's ready and been properly tested internally, we'll make a version available to you, the player. And Rasta, it's what will make you a pioneer. Thank you for watching. We are very excited about the tech we've shown you today, and we hope. Uh, no, Eric. Rasta. So far, it's all just been fluff. They haven't showed anything like really new or big. They showed a demo of like them doing a mission on Pyro, like one of the planets oh, on Pi in Pyro. But, uh, is working on. I don't know, like, I think we're kind of split on how much of it was real and how much of it is, like, microtech, Daymar, whatever, fucking fake demo shit, so, I don't know. I guess take that as you want. I'm sure there will be a VOD up no, of it later. No, it's not me! It's time for... Oh, shit, the drugs and alcohol are kicking in. <laughs> the days that fucking Asperger's fucking Kyle never joins chat and then like this is the day he joins. Yo, it's technically Are you gonna shame all for never telling me. All fingers point to you. We fucking at you like all the time and talk shit about you all the time in this channel and you never ever ever show up. Well, yeah, if I'm not playing a game, I'm not gonna have it open. <laughs> <laughs> push up, push up, moving, moving. Stop it with your stupid logic, Kyle. Yeah, I can't argue that. <laughs> Get down, <laughs> down <laughs> If any That's of my logic was no, sound, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> what the? What is this? It's goddamn failure. That's what it is. Sound logic on. kills. The target is gone. We've been stitched up. Bastard! Bastard! Catch this bastard. He will run out of luck eventually. 
the fuck is this shit? That, okay, this is un this is unrealistic. They left it there. No fucking train. way. Feel like I don't believe that one bit. Crowd. Was that burrito the best thing about your day? Out on the frontier, there are opportunities. How insane is it that they have so little to, help you find to fucking uh, show off that they're letting fucking orgs advertise for recruitment? Somebody to pick you up. Damn, we pumped up. We should have made an org fucking Somebody video. Dude, they would have. You would have had to sneak it through me or something. I bet. Yeah, no, they won't have a percent secure connection on it. You would have had to sign the org over to me, leave the org, let me do the recruitment, and then rejoin after they played the video on their we, shit. Dude, we could have paid, like, professional fucking editors to fucking make a video advertising our org, and, like, full soundtrack, like, fucking gone crazy with it. And they still and would have said no because of you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely 100%. how it spread through the stand-up system. We would have had to like have a front man. Whether like I don't even know if I would have worked. They probably have my account tagged as like failures butt buddy or something. Yeah, yeah. They, there's no way. They would well, I could use a front man. <laughs> Why can't I recreate it? I just don't know what we don't trust you actually. <laughs> <laughs> You're correct for not trusting me. <laughs> Can they stop it in time? Struggling with your career out in the verse? We are too, but we're here to help. The Garden Interstellar Initiative. The Garden Interstellar does not guarantee fruits and vegetables will be available for all, do not be held accountable for the lack thereof. I feel a little called out by both Project Black Space and Garden Interstellar. And hey, at least we all know what my surprised voice sounds like now. That was new. That was the Planet Tech panel, and the big news watching the chat was clearly Rastar, the beginnings of which will one day let players build their own outposts like the ones we've seen, and others still yet to come. But up next, the cosplay contest returned this year, and it's been open for a couple months now. So the community team narrowed it down to a couple finalists, and then their panel of judges have selected the winners. And... I was not asked to judge this year. Why was I not asked to judge this year? It might be because they figured out I was buzzed on British cops syrup during the 2019 event. Could hardly tell. So let's take a look now at some of the finalists. Alright, well, we're uh, back, guys. Okay. We're back, guys. I have to keep moving Failure's other account back in here when it moves out so that you can hear him and us, but him mostly. It's gonna be a pro juggling act. Is it, is it persistent talk time? Oh, no, wait, it's no, showing, no. It's showing weird people dressed up. Okay. Oh, are we doing cosplay? Yeah. Fuck yeah. This gets my PP start. Oh my god. Oh my. What is this? Alright, and the winner is just doing that. Yeah, in third place, like... Calamity, who's worked to prove that it's not all about armors and weapons. Sometimes it's all about. Uh, it's all about. 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 It's all
like 50 year old virgin cosplaying. Yeah, so there's yeah. no, again, no titties, always a force to be reckoned with. Well, no, there were three girls dressed up, but it wasn't outlaw yeah. armor yeah. and a laser sword. Were they like you why just though? Add a laser sword. Uh, no, one girl earlier on Finally, was, and then place, uh, these were like OG old, Star like citizen Ken Shadow, no, ladies, yeah, like no load, right? Like, through a combination of even well, like, pretty printed, like, I don't want to say like, uh, you know, like. Like fucking uh, now, like uh, like story. they look like they're a part of the Forsaken, the but pushing Ken Shadow around Disneyland in a wheelchair. <laughs> See, they they look... never <laughs> actually explained <laughs> to me what his injury was. It's possible yep. I was taken advantage of. <laughs> now, congratulations yeah, to all the winners, but there's still a fan favorite times award. My, you can head over to the website like now and cast your vote. Yeah. Um, all you have to do is I promise to sell your bathwater. The prize was so I have no idea what any of these people won. But I'm gonna assume it's a fifty. You make the bathwater promise, and you're set for life. Honestly, you, you don't even have to ever, ever actually do it. You just have to say you will. Up next, it's one, folks. Have yeah, been it's still in development. The bathwater is in early access. Benoit Beausejour, take us through the programming. Yeah, and the bathwater pledge will uh, release the same day as Robin Forty Two does. In a state of persistence, starting meow. The concept of server, which has been ingrained since the it's beginning, like has been under So, out of the selfless, the answer should be simple. Hi, my name is Paul Reindel, and I'm the director of online technology here at CAG. I wanted to take this year's CitizenCon as an opportunity to give you some insight into our exciting persistent streaming and server meshing technology. All right, server meshing, failure. In this talk, I will cover a quick overview of the current streaming and server architecture and how we plan to transform failure. the existing tech into what we call persistent what? streaming and server meshing. Server meshing is up. I also oh, have Benoit yeah, actually watch this part. who yeah. laid in the it, it, like it literally just started. The graph so. database that is powering persistent streaming. Hey, Ben, how's it going? Hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to share some of the details about what the game services team at Turbulent has been working on to support the efforts to build this technology and make it a reality for you guys. Cool. Uh, let's get started. Before we look into persistent streaming and server meshing and how this new technology will work, let's have a brief look at entity streaming and how our solar system is set up. Each solar system can be seen as one giant level containing every single object inside the solar system. From the sun to the wind or rock, stand in this one large map. Since this is a lot of data, the setup is split up into a hierarchy of nested object containers, which can be streamed in and out individually. If you look at an abstract view of Stanton, it all starts with one solar system root object container. This object container contains the sun, the planets, and the moons around each planet. Each of those locations then has its own object container, and if you take a closer look at a moon, you will find the entities placed around the moon inside this object container. For example, a space station orbiting the moon. This setup keeps repeating, and the space station could be set up via multiple rooms, each defined by its own object container. Additionally to the static hierarchy of object containers, there are also all the dynamic entities which bring the universe to life, NPCs, an interactive vending machine, and of course players and spaceships. Most of these entities are made of a hierarchy as well. For example, a player has his body and under the streaming system treats these mini hierarchies as streaming groups to make sure that an object like a spaceship is always streamed in as one unit. Loading the entirety of Stanton into memory and simulating every single entity would be very expensive, especially on the client, but also on a single server. That's why we developed entity bind culling and object container streaming, which allows us to stream object containers and streaming groups individually. When the game server starts, all entities and object containers within the solar system are loaded into local memory of that game server. These entities are not streamed in, we just store the initial state in server memory. When a player connects, we create a so-called streaming bubble around that player, and object containers as well as streaming groups that are visible from the player's point of view are considered inside this bubble. Any object container that is inside the bubble will stream its content, and any streaming group within the bubble will also be streamed in on the server and then replicated to the client. 
entities are considered inside the streaming bubble if their projected screen size on a virtual 1080p plane is larger than 5 pixel based on the distance of the player. So while a large object like a moon will be considered inside the bubble from far away, a small object like a ship will only be considered inside when it's much closer to the player. When the player starts moving across the universe, entities that leave the streaming bubble will become unbound and the replication layer will remove these entities from the client. Entities that enter the streaming bubble will get bound to the client, which cause the network layer to replicate these entities to the client, effectively streaming them in. We call this technique entity bind culling because streaming on the client is driven by the network layer, binding and unbinding entities. If entities are not in any client streaming bubble, so no players in their vicinity, these entities are also streamed out on the server. They go back into a dormant state where they are not simulated. This model works quite well on the client, however it doesn't scale well on the server. While we do stream entities on the server with no players close to them, the poor distribution of players will cause the DGS to load most entities and the more clients we try to match to a given game server, the likelihood of a player being at every single location increases. And that basically nullifies the benefit of server-side streaming. So how do we solve this? The answer should be simple. Allow multiple instances of the game server to work together so they can split up the work. Well, it's not quite that simple. Let's have a look at the current architecture. As of today, we have a traditional client-server architecture. One instance of a dedicated game server serves up to 50 clients. This is called instance, as the dedicated game server has its own instance view of the persistent universe. Once the server is full, we start a new server instance, which then serves additional 50 players. As we've seen before, when a DGS instance is created, it loads a unique version of the standing system into its local server's memory. Therefore, each dedicated game server instance as a unique copy of every single object that's part of Stanton. As these entities only exist in the memory of the game server when the instance is shut down, these entities are deleted. The goal of server meshing is to allow multiple DGS instances to work together and divide simulation costs between each server and the mesh. In the best case, we can scale this to infinity by adding more nodes to the mesh. As we saw earlier, each server node stores the state of entities locally. If we want to mesh these servers together, we need to find an efficient way to synchronize state between each server. With our current architecture, depending on the vision of the simulation and the overlap, this would require a lot of synchronization points between each node. It's an exponential problem, as in the worst case, each node would need to talk to each other node in the mesh, severely limiting our ability to scale it. To solve this issue, we are separating simulation and replication. Instead of just meshing multiple dedicated game servers together and have them synchronize state between each other, we are introducing a new layer called replication layer. The replication layer has two major functions. It holds the state of every entity in memory and replicates the state to clients but also to server nodes. I set server nodes because in this setup the traditional dedicated game server becomes a game server node. This server node connects to the replication layer, very similar to a client, and only a subset of entities are replicated to that server node. Replication to server nodes is controlled by the network bind culling algorithm that we saw earlier, and is driven by streaming bubbles, and it works very similar to how it works on clients. The server node has certain streaming bubbles assigned to it, which will cause the replication layer to replicate entities from these streaming bubbles to the server node. Contrary to a player's client, a server node has the additional responsibility to execute server-side authoritative code for those entities, controlling AI, doing damage calculations, etc., etc. The result of the simulation is then written back from the server node to the replication layer, and from there it is replicated to all connected clients and other server nodes. Since streaming bubbles can overlap, entities may be replicated to multiple server nodes, exactly the same way how they are currently replicated to multiple clients mm -hmm. if players are at the same location. To avoid two server nodes trying to simulate the same entity, only one server node can have authority over any given entity. And only that this server is allowed to write entity state back to the replication layer. 
for this, this by, by the end the of him explaining how they the want it to work in the end. They'll be like, and that's that for fucking... Basically, you can oh, see a game server can. node as a client with authority annoying. to write the result of its local simulation back to the replication layer. Authority can transfer yeah, between uh, servers. Uh, For this, example, this if literally an feels like what they did the before. Authority I mean, this, is, this feels like what they did transfer to the next server node that has this entity yeah. currently. Persistence and server meshing. It's just well, the authority explain to you how they in theory want it to work. And then, like, there's never anything I'm like, hey, this balance. is where it's actually, yeah, this is what our blockage is. This is why this is taking so long. This is why, yeah. you know. It's not out yet. Jesus, Pat. Instead, it's always like, this is how we envision it working, and it'll fix everything, but we can't give you any kind of estimate or timeline or, like, where it's at or what's going on with it. So let's just tell you how it would conceptually work again. For the 900th fucking time. Pretty much. However, the server mesh will lift our current hard limit of 50 players, and it will enable us to steadily increase the number of players we can support within one shard. Will take some time, and in our first version, I mean, you're you're one hundred percent right. Now, it's just like the, they're going to eat this shit up and like cite it all as like factual, like it's already basically the year, and going to it's one hundred percent going to be a situation where like a true you're going to be seeing posts about there this on the subreddit for sure, and it's going to be talking about like and for as if this is take a closer look at all the basically in game or around the fucking corner, one hundred percent. Previously, the entity state was held entirely in memory on the dedicated game server. And besides some selected persistent player items, all that state would be lost when the servers shut down or crashed. The replication layer is fundamentally different, as the entire state of the universe is stored within a graph database. We call this entity graph, and it's an evolution of the original iCache. When we create a new shard, the initial entity state of the universe is seeded into this database. This happens offline before we let player join the shard. When the shard comes online, the replication mesh caches the state from the entity graph. As player connect to the shard, and as we start to spin up new server nodes, simulation begins and alters the state of the universe. The replication layer does not only replicate these state changes to connect players and server nodes, it also replicates the state into the entity graph. Since the entity graph is a persistent database, the state of the shard is never lost, and even if the shard is shut down, the state persists and can be resumed at a later time. Benoit is going to show you some more technical details about the Entity Graph. Thank you, Paul. Get ready for a deep dive into the Entity Graph Persistence Database. The Entity Graph is our approach to persisting the game world. This is fundamentally different to what is happening today in the game, where only items you own are actually stored. Our objective is to be able to save the state of the replication layer, which includes all entities in a given universe shard, in order to provide a truly persistent world where actions you take as a player can influence environments in the game world permanently. The entity graph, as the name implies, stores game data as a graph. This representation is native for the game engine because it is how internally those data structures the game uses are addressed and manipulated. Using a graph also has several advantages. We're basically storing and retrieving from a gigantic indexed list of nodes and edges, and those edges between those nodes are optimized in a sharded database. But in order to properly explain the system, we must first view the game world as the game engine sees it. Game objects are constructed of several game entities linked together in hierarchical structure. You can picture this as a tree, which is a specialized kind of graph. This is how the game engine holds and simulates the elements on screen as it is running the simulation. In a server meshing world, this is also how replicants hold the entities in memory for each of their assigned territories. For example, a ship is made up of several entities that make up different parts of the entire playable vehicle. Each part is parented to another entity until the root of the ship is reached. Each of these entity nodes holds properties with regard to what the entity represents in the game. The class of object it is, the item type, its legal owner, orientation, and of course its very precise physical location within the game world. Each edge in our graph qualifies the relationship to the parent. In the case of a vehicle, our edges store properties that tell the system which port is being used to attach the entity into the parent and what kind of attachment it is an item port attachment, a zone attachment, many others. In a constellation, for example, the different major sections of the hull are entity nodes with edges to the ship route, 
We call this small graph of item an aggregate because it is a whole movable unit. The ship root in this case is called the aggregate root because it sits at the top of a logical object. You can think of what you normally call an item as an aggregate, with the aggregate root being the actual item you are talking about. For example, a first-person weapon with attached scope, mag clips, and laser sights is a small hierarchy of entities. We distinguish the aggregate roots from other nodes by giving it a label. Labels allow us to distinguish and rapidly look up and find nodes of a specific type, either when we retrieve parts of the graph or when we look up specific nodes. Those labels exist to allow correct reversal of the, of the graph data when we query for specific things in the game world. Other labels include streaming groups, universe root, star system root. This allows us to really look up and index those types. But the tree depth doesn't stop there. Additional information is required for a fully functional ship. The insides of each of those structural entities have to be fleshed out. Object containers are the building blocks of how space division is achieved, which aggregates and what part of the hierarchy they're in. In fact, most major areas of ships are represented as OC entities attached to the ship root or another OC. The shape of this data actually takes in reality is driven by designers. Of course, then, each of those object containers also contain entity hierarchies as well, expanding to have the common static and dynamic entities you're used to playing with, like elevators, beds, guns, seats, gimbals, and others. In addition to object containers that make up the structure of the ship, other aggregates can also be attached within the hierarchy of our ship. For example, a rover parked in the cargo bay of our Connie will be attached as a sub-aggregate attached to your ship's cargo grid. Same goes for turrets, which are changeable and themselves exposed item ports allowing guns to be mounted. For each of those entity nodes, a snapshot document is also stored. This document contains all the runtime values the game components attached to those entities. This data is the dynamic part of the model where game developers can persist variables on any entity in the game world according to the rules of a game component. For example, damage state and health data are stored within the snapshot uh, document of those ship entities. Storing and retrieving data in graph form really have some awesome properties. It's a native structure to the game engine, so it gets loaded rapidly. It's very simple and effective to serialize and transport because it's just a list of nodes and edges. There are optimized databases that we can use that allow us to fetch entities recursively in a traversal rapidly. And the data set can be sharded across multiple database instances reliably. One key element here and one big advantage of having a graph data is also that we can reduce writes. So, uh, in order to reduce that, all the hierarchical changes that we need to do can be minimized. For example, if we want to add detach mutation command, we'll detach an entity from the hierarchy. In this case, a single edge must be erased, which is a very inexpensive operation. A nice side effect of this is also that it's the same operation where there were detaching a single entity or an entire aggregate. In both cases, the single edge must be erased in order to perform the detach. Rolling away in your stowed rover, detaching a gun from a replacement or uh, for a replacement, or selling a turret becomes really a cheap operation to persist. That is good because that happens very frequently. Compared to a columnar approach where index columns must be maintained for every write, linking all objects to the aggregate root, this is a really a great performance improvement. The same properties apply with the attach command, which will only have to create a single edge when rejoining items to the hierarchy, be it via attachment or parking another vehicle on a docking hub. The attach and detach commands are two of the many semantic commands that the Entity Graph API proposes, allowing to express a mutation to the graph. Other examples of the different commands are create, possess, transfer, stack, unstack, change location, change snapshot, bury, stow and unstow. One important change in addition that comes about with the entity graph is also how mutations are applied to the database. Each mutation is composed of multiple commands which are executed in sequence but committed transactionally to the database. They either succeed together or fail and roll back together. This ensures that the changes to the graph are always consistent and no lost writes or errors can cause data corruption. For example, a mutation consisting of detach, transfer, and then attach commands would succeed only if all three commands are applied successfully. 
The system retrieves a constant ordered streams of mutation from the replicant scribes that are part of the replication layer and are enqueued in durable queues to ensure that no message is lost even if the service is unavailable or paused. It's important to understand that the graph does not only cover your ships and items, but the entire game world is made in this way. Your ship is actually attached to the zone host location you travel in. Your playing character is attached to your ship seat when you are piloting it, just like planets are attached to their star system routes. The game world, though, must exist in persistence before it can be replicated and mutated. This is part of a process called seeding, where a new database is created by the replication layer. It is during that process that millions of entities are initially created in a sort of a big bang. At this stage, every object container, every minor or major entity from planets to doorknobs are inserted into the entity graph in their default state. That is, the state that the designers decided was the initial state of the world. This process goes down from the universe route to the star system route and into the different areas and planets, into their landing zone, their buildings, their rooms, down to the smallest possible entity. There are multiple types of entities that are created during this process. First are unstreamable entities, which make up the skeleton of the universe. Those are entities you do not get to see, but are part of and always present on every worker node in the mesh. It is by looking up unstreamable entities that the game world is able to stream in the other types of entities into your client and into the server mesh. It is from those all from those entities that others entities bloom. Static entities make up the game world that you cannot interact with. Most map objects that make up buildings like the Hurston Tower, rooms and walls of hospitals, or the bar at G-Lock are all made up of static entities. And the last type is dynamic entities. These are entities that you as a player can manipulate. A bottle on a bar, a door in a level, a ship component. Everything you interact with when you're playing the game. Of course, during seeding, all object containers are also seeded as part of this hierarchy and inform the shape of the loadable subgraphs. The seeding process takes a couple minutes to complete. Once created, this newly seeded database represents a full dimension of the universe and will now persist as it is modified by players. As you play the game and go about with your ship, your playing character entity moves from location to location getting attached to new zones as you travel. Your player aggregate is itself part of the giant graph and your location and state are persisted by the replication layer scribes to the entity graph of your given territory. When you interact with dynamic objects and their properties change, the state of that entity will not persist until it is its this instance of the database is undeployed. There are, in fact, multiple copies of the universe that are seeded at a given time. We call those shards. Each shard is a unique copy of the game world, complete with all of its entities and unique states. Think of it as an alternate universe. Dynamic entities that have been modified in each dimension will have different states. The bottle on the bar was moved, or the door was destroyed, might not be in the same state between shards. This technique is a way to gain scalability as our player base grows. A single shard can grow to host multiple millions of entities. Even if each shard database is itself clustered and can grow substantially past a single machine, there is a point where multiple clusters are needed. As you join the persistent universe, the matchmaking system is getting retooled in order to select the correct universe shard for you to play on. Using multiple data points like your friend's location, your active party, your last game session, and or which shards still have items on it that you own. This is to ensure as much as possible that you end up on the same shard you expect to be as a player. In order to provide a seamless game experience, it would be terrible if you lost items you used when you were in a given shard versus another, or if your character was bound to a shard forever. To alleviate this, the system includes the concept of stowed and unstowed entities. An item is considered unstowed when it is currently active in the shard database and being actively simulated on by the worker nodes of the replication layer. Stowed entities are player-owned entities that are stowed in inventory containers or location inventories. Those entities live in another database entirely, called the global database, a large cluster database that spans all shards. Aggregate routes in that shard are stored and linked with edges to inventory nodes 
Any entity in a shard can have an inventory node in global for stowing things in it. For example, a box entity that is unstowed in a shard would have an inventory node in the global database to store its content. This allows to keep unsimulated entities in a non-shard specific database while keeping the live aggregate within the shard. As you transition between shards, your playing character gets unstowed into the selected shard. This process effectively moves your player aggregate data from the global database to the shard database. Your player entity now gets simulated by game worker nodes and is being updated at a regular rate as you play and move around the game world. Accessing items that are stowed, like a ship, from the ASOP terminal is basically reading the inventory contents of the global graph at your location. Same goes for personal inventories or cargo inventories. When you request a ship to be spawned, the system will unstow the ship onto a landing pad by submitting a shard mutation. Alternatively, when a ship gets despawned during parking at a rest stop, the ship gets stowed back into the global database, making it available for unstow in any shard. The global database is where all of your stowed items will live. Hero items will always be available for unstow in any shard if they are not already in use. The process of stowing and unstowing also helps to alleviate problems related to entity authority so that only game worker nodes in the right shard can update unstowed entities in that shard. This brings about a nice property of the server meshing and persistent streaming architecture in that the state of the entities are being persisted transactionally during play, be it in a shard or global database through stowing, a single server crash, or 30k, should no longer result in item loss. This model also has a real scalability benefit that stems from the separation of the read-intensive work no workloads that are isolated to the global DB from the write-intensive workloads that are handled by the individual shard database. The global graph exists to provide seamless access to your belongings no matter what shard or alternate universe you're currently playing in. Okay, let's go back to Paul to learn about some of the benefits of the server meshing architecture. Yeah, the first benefit is obviously the advantage that we don't have this issue of synchronization between different server nodes. Each server node has one single connection to the replication layer which is used to push and get updates for entities of interest. The second advantage is that the same streaming and replication logic that we already use for clients can be applied to servers and that server nodes will only stream in a small area which will greatly increase performance. It also allows us to increase resilience down the road. As long as a client is connected to the replication layer, the client stays connected even if the server node crashes. In this case, the simulation for an entity may be stopped for a moment but as soon as a new server comes online, the simulation will just continue. While the underlying tech is close to completion, there are some upcoming challenges that we need to solve before we can give that into your hands. The first version of this technology will contain a static server mesh. Instead of the fully dynamic mesh that we saw earlier, the static mesh assigns server nodes to predefined sections of the solar system. This will reduce the amount of authority transfer that game code has to address in this first release. Um, there will also be a lot of challenges for the game services and uh, game feature teams. Maybe Benoit can give a little bit more. Yeah, there are many parts of the game that are affected by this new server meshing uh, architecture. So any gameplay features that uh, has to rely on the concept of a server, right? Currently, when you connect to a game server, we know what match you're in. So to send messages and update to that server, we simply locate your active match and then send those messages out there. That concept needs to change because we now have a mesh to deal with. And so there are multiple game servers that need to receive this information. They need to be able to subscribe dynamically to it or unsubscribe dynamically to players transitioning uh, through them. So you can imagine that this will affect things like missions that currently are spawned locally on the game server. These now need to be spawned globally within the shard and also persist their state. So all services that are attached to missions, uh, where whether it's the quantum system in the back, in the back end or the quasar, tools need to now know about the concept of a shard this also goes deep into like things that are mechanical like you know getting global chat to work on a server that concept now needs to be extended to the shard where this will probably push us to implement this as a location-based chat for example and so many teams in the company now need to 
change their feature to take into account the meshing technology that's behind it because the concept of server, which has been ingrained since the beginning, has changed to become a mesh of servers. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I also want to shout out to the network team who's working on the replication layer and the bind culling, as well as the persistent tech team who's working on the entity and object container streaming. And as Benoit said, also all the other teams that work on gameplay features or gameplay services that are affected by this new technology, um, there are a lot of devs working on this and we are very excited to push on this new technology. Thank you for your time. Transmission. Is this working good? Hey, look, I don't have much time. They call me Chris the Menace, and I have been framed for homicide. I am here at the Cluster Rehabilitation Center. I have a bounty on my head for 500,000 credits. I am offering 1 million credits for somebody to come and rescue me. I can't leave. I am being watched. I need help. I don't have much time. Please come and help me. Miners are of a unique breed. It's not about doing the job. It's about doing the job right. No matter how small or big, you need the right tools. Argo Astronautics, doing the job right. From our starfarers, to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the verse, we're continuously innovating to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Ultima Energy. Who said he could use my set? All right, fine. So we're going to redo the whole thing now with no graphics and uh, orange lights. Ready? So we introduced the replication layer, a new and improved architecture for meshing servers. Uh, it solves our problems observed in the naive meshing approach, namely multiple connections and authority. Uh, the entity graph is the persistence of the replication layer and uses graph data to persist the entire game universe. And the main focus of all of this is on making all game systems and features work in a no server concept where multiple servers are needed. Also that the first release will likely be a static server mesh, and it will come, as all things do, I see you asking in the chat when we feel it's ready. He really comes in here and uses my lights. Now, moving along, earlier in the day, we saw the first look at the Anvil Liberator, revealed earlier today during the Ship Talk panel. So check out the website to learn more, and you can submit your questions for the Q&A on Spectrum 
that'll be released in the coming days. Also, don't forget about the hashtag uh, SC Watch Party on Twitter and Instagram contest. I can't help but notice that uh, Morphologists and Burks have one going, and I wasn't invited. I mean, I wasn't invited to any of them now that I think about it. I mean, 315's not out yet. I could just backspace and respond there in a jip. I was going to do a gag where I hit the button and then fell on the floor, but I don't feel like it anymore. But up next, my vote for sleeper hit of the day. Addie and Graham take us into the world of Claudius, the next big thing from CIG Audio in the Sounds of Space, starting now. Hi, my name's Graham Phillipson, and I'm lead audio programmer here at Cloud Imperium Games. Hello, I'm Eddie Kelch, and I'm one of the sound designers working at Cloud Imperium Games. And we're here to talk about some of the big developments we've got going on in audio tech, specifically SIG Audio and Claudius, which is a new audio engine layer and associated tool that we hope will greatly improve the development experience of our sound design team. Getting started on this project can be quite challenging due to the amount of tools that we have involved in implementing audio into the engine. With the Claudius tool, we aim to streamline that process as much as possible. This talk will be very much focused on workflow and tech, and as such, there won't be too many sort of exciting explosion sounds going off and things like that. But, you know, this is all about how we improve the workflow for our sound design team, and we know these guys can make amazing sounds anyway. Thanks, Graham. So before we get into the new stuff, let's take a little look at the history and where we are now and what inspired us to go down this development path. Up until this point, so much of the data that we use has been owned and stored in the data of other tools that are not owned by the audio team or by the audio code team. Tools such as Mannequin, the character tool, TrackView, UI code, DataForge. All of these tools are designed for other teams to work with and audio can sometimes feel like a bit of an afterthought within those tools. Additionally to this, because the data is stored within the files for those tools, we end up with a lot of data that's scattered around different areas. It can be difficult to dig in and find what we want. Also, when we're loading these tools, we have to load up all the data. So for example, if it's an animation tool, we have to load lots of animation data when really we're not actually working with that. There can be huge learning curves involved and lots of time spent switching between tools that impacts our development by swallowing up time. A lot of our ways of working haven't changed in a very long time, and we thought it was time to take a step back, look at all the challenges we face, and see if we can come up with solutions for all of them by coming up with a completely new design that addresses all the issues that we face day to day and tries to overcome them in an elegant way that makes the sound designers' lives much easier and makes their jobs much more fun. And this is what we came up with. So with Claudius, what we did was we put workflow at the very core of the design. From day one, when we started working on the design of the SIG Audio and Claudius systems, we wanted to make sure that workflow was always the focus of how things were working. We never wanted the tools to get in the way any more than they need to. And we wanted to make sure that the tools could be as smooth and as fun to use as they possibly could be. I think that this uh, designer comes first workflow is quite important and it's going to become an integral aspect on this project. Currently we have quite a bit of focus shifting and that tends to break momentum. Um, not only that, uh, audio seems to be treated a lot as a production aspect of the game at the moment and this tool is going to help shift that to post-production where it should be. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. One of the main things we wanted to do with the tool was to make sure that it could be used as a post-production tool so that you could take, you could effectively take a finished feature of the game where no audio guy had seen it at all. The audio code could be implemented really quickly, and then the sound design could be implemented on top of that really quickly, and this could all be done completely downstream of all the stuff that happened before it. Now, obviously, in practice, we're working on this game in parallel with lots of other teams, and we never work in, in the, the sort of post-production way that like a, you know, an actual film post house would work. But by carrying over some of those principles, We've, we think we've made a really good tool, and part of how we've achieved that is by sort of completely abstracting the audio data away from the code that calls it. The calling code knows nothing of what the result of what it 
what he's saying will do. So it will trigger some parameters and some events, but it doesn't know what the audio system will do as a result of that. And there's a very clear decoupling between the audio system and the game that calls it. And likewise, within the audio system, we uh, we don't care where the events and parameters came from. All we care about is what we do with them and how it makes things sound good. And now, with all this data in one place, uh, it's going to make it extremely swift and also a lot more inclusive uh, to fix bugs. By inclusive, what I mean is audio QA is going to become an even more integral part of the team. They're going to be able to quickly fix these things on the fly. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Like, because we've got all this data in one place and we've also got the game's behaviors in one place, what we've done is we've integrated all the debugging tools into the exact same tool that the sound designers are using. So an audio QA person is working in exactly the same place, but they've got an interest in some different data. So what they care more about is like, why is something not sounding as it should, or is the system behaving as it should? And we want to offer up all the information that they need. And what that means is that then they can easily pinpoint where the problems are. And in some cases, they can probably fix them because the fix has become so obvious. Coupled with that is that we want the sound designers to be able to completely trust the tool so that when you implement something in Claudius, you know it's going to work in game. And fundamentally, there's, there should be no difference between you implementing something and playing it out and actually running the game in a real game scenario and doing the same thing. So what we want to do is make it so that if anything doesn't work, that's a code bug, that's on us guys, we need to fix it, and you guys can completely trust the tool. And that means that you don't need to spend lots of time testing I think uh, trust is a good word. I think that trust is also going to be uh, coupled with the just a whole new improvement in uh, in our daily lives when it comes to implementing audio into the into the game. So let's take a little look at Claudius itself. What we've done is we've introduced a uh, visual scripting language that allows you guys to implement whatever you want, and we provide tools that hopefully allow you to do all the creative things that you need to do with the audio. But the design of Claudius under the hood is, is, is interesting because the tool itself doesn't hold any data of its own. All it does is exposes data that exists within the game engine. What this means for us is that live update, as in when you make a change in the Claudius tool, it live updates in the game and it immediately responds and the change that you made is immediately apparent in the game. That means it comes as standard because we're actually operating on the data that the game is running with. And actually, because of the design, it's not possible to implement an audio feature without implementing live update. And that was at the very core of this design, because again, we were completely thinking about workflow, about ease of use, and about limiting the amount of time you guys spend sort of, you know, rebooting the game or you know, trying mm. to get your actions to be reflected in the game. You already uh, mentioned it, but I think that you know, little to no code support aspect of Claudius is really going to be groundbreaking for us. I think that life is going to become iteratively a lot easier uh, as we're able to just quickly, you know, just not again, focus shifting, right? That's not going to really be a thing anymore. Uh, and that's going to be great. Not only that, uh, all these parameters that we want to get access to based on the data, uh, we're going to get access to that by just going into the game, playing with something like a weapon. And by picking up that weapon, now that's going to, you know, be inherited by the by the character. So it means that we're going to be able to attach all these different sounds to that gun based on what the player is doing. And I don't know, it, it's going to make so many of these things uh, possible. And it, it just wasn't before. Yeah, what we're trying to do is make so much data available to you where you need it and in an intuitive way. And what that means is that, you know, when you, as you say, if you spawn a weapon in the game, it immediately becomes visible in the Claudius tool. And if you perform an action on that weapon, such as firing it or reloading it, those actions immediately become available and visible in the Claudius tool and available for you to implement. And what that means is that we're putting the implementation right alongside it happening in the game. Claudius uses a, a reactive programming model. And what that means is that as the data comes in, the visual side of what you see updates live and it updates immediately. And it also has some sense of what's relevant because if you're running an actor around, then the most recent events received by the game or sent by the game would be the movements of his limbs, the footsteps, that kind of thing. And you get to see those things immediately in the tool. And you can even filter by time. So you can look at things, you, you can like clear out the view, perform an action. And now that's the only thing you can see. So you get really quick, easy access to all the data that you need. 
And all of this tech, I think, just puts us in a great position to continue to support the ever-increasing demands of CIG's games. I also think that the designers are going to be quite empowered by the amount of time that they're going to have to focus on the creative aspects because of this tool. Yeah, that's the whole philosophy of this design, is to empower the sound designers to be sound designers. Yeah. So let's take a look at a practical example, marking up a weapon in Claudius. As we've mentioned, all the events and parameters that arrive in the Claudius interface are things that have happened in the game. The game is just describing what's happened and it doesn't have any preconceptions about what the audio system should do. It simply provides data. So for example, the weapon fired, it now has five rounds in the magazine. The weapon fired again, it now has four rounds in the magazine and lots of other information as well, such as you know, you know, the weapon fired and there was this much atmospheric pressure around it or it was out in space and there was no pressure. You know, all these sort of contextual things become available. And the decisions about what that data actually means to you guys all completely come down to you. So all we do is we, as programmers, is we provide as much data as we possibly can in a place where you can use it. What amazes me about this tool is it's going to just be as simple as, you know, hooking up a couple nodes and seeing the results in the editor. Uh, not only that, all this com complex logic that we have, uh, we're going to have access to all these parameters super easily. So the the idea of, let's say, having a different reload sound based on the amount of ammunition in the mag, is it's going to be, you know, rather simple to, to implement. Yeah, absolutely. What, we, what we've done here is we've gathered all the data that may or may not be relevant to you, and we don't mind whether it is or not. We deal with all that code side, the efficiencies of that, and you guys get access to any data that you may or may not be interested in. So you could do like crazy things if you wanted. You know, yeah. you could make it so that the reload sound sounds different if there are, like you say, if there are d different number of rounds in the mic, but you might want to make the reload sound sound different if the, if the character's wearing armor or not. Yeah. I mean, that makes no sense, but, to, but you know, all this data becomes available to you, and it's totally up to you guys what you do with it. So we're opening up lots of po you know possibilities. I think it comes back to empowering the sound designers again. I think all this freedom, creatively, is it's 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 going to be great. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that sort of giving you that creative freedom, I think, is going to be amazing to see what comes out of that. Because you know, for example, we can have the we can have something like a. A parameter that says whether it's nighttime or not and if you wanted you could change the whole aesthetic of the game change all the sounds based on it being nighttime yeah. and, and that would require no input from the code team because we've given you the data that you need yeah. so let's dig down a little into some specific features of claudius and look at budgeting and aggregation in this video we have a set of audio trigger spots that are all playing the same sound we haven't applied any sort of budgeting to them, so they all play, they're all taking up resources, and we can hear them all, so you know the mix can be a little bit sort of muddied by just how many of them are playing. I want to show here just how simple it is to deal with that and to reduce the budget for the sounds that they're playing. So here we go to the audio source settings, and we, we're going to add, um, we're going to add a new category, which is how we budget, and we're going to reduce the number of sounds in that category that can play at any one time. As I said before, this all updates live, so um, every change we make now is going to be reflected in the game. And when we spin back to the, the game view now in the editor, you'll see that because we set the, the budget to five, only five of those sounds are now playing, represented by a sort of lighter green. We can go back and we can change the budget, and again, that will you know, drop it a little bit more. And you can see now only the closest three to the camera are currently playing. And then we'll just whiz the, the budget back up so you can see they all come back again when, uh, when you do that. Now, that's the budgeting feature, and that's one tool to sort of reduce the amount of resources we use. But what we also do is allow you to deal with what happens when all those sounds that are not allowed to play because of the budget are prevented from playing. So what we do is uh, we have a system called an aggregation system. And every single one of those sounds that hasn't been allowed to play can contribute to a further sound that attempts to represent that crowd of, under, of, of sounds that were not played. So here we're going to do a really simple example. We're going to hook up uh, a sort of more musical tone to this uh, to this aggregate. And what this aggregate will do is it will represent all of those sounds that aren't playing. Now, we offer 
lots of parameters to this aggregation system, but the aggregate is aware of how many sounds it represents, it's aware of the position, it's aware of the spread of them. So lots of information is made available to the sound designers so that they can represent this mass of sounds with just a single audio source. Okay, so now we can see that there's a, a further green, light green blob in amongst all the dark green. And what that is, is that's the aggregated sound. So that will move to the center of wherever the crowd of non-playing sounds is. And as you can see, it kind of skips around in this video, but we, we have smoothing options so that it doesn't sort of jump around and become jarring. Um, it just moves around as quickly or slowly as you want it to with the crowd of sounds that it's attempting to represent. And what this means for us is that it makes it a lot easier to sort of clean up the mix if you've got a lot of things that have been added to a level, they've been added by a non-audio person and with maybe not so much understanding of the consequence of that, it gives us really easy ways of dealing with that. You can see here, if we increase the budget, the, uh, the aggregated sound moves further away. And then if we completely reduce the budget, to nothing, then you end up with just a fixed aggregated sound right in the middle of the uh, all the sounds that are playing. Uh, sorry, all the sounds that are not playing. Now, this is a really simple example. None of these sounds are moving, but if they were moving, then that blob would move appropriately to the position where all those sounds were moving. I think what this tech has showed us is um, for ambience work specifically, the designers are going to have quite a lot of uh, uh, creative freedom uh, to kind of go wild and rely on this technology to, to help us clean up not only the mix, but um, you know the, the voice count and the channel counts. It's also a, a good way for us to create accurate uh, background dialogue, or as we call it, voila, for bespoke locations. And uh, I think it's going to bring a lot more life to, to locations. Absolutely. But also, aggregate logic doesn't have to be used for those purposes. It can be used for more abstract purposes as well. So we can use the logic system within the audio system to understand how many of a certain thing exist in the game. So if, say, every tree tells the audio system that it exists, we don't necessarily want to play a sound on all those trees, maybe unless it's windy, which is a decision we can make if we want. But we can track counts and we can track you know, how many of a certain object type there are, and we can use that information to inform something like the mix. So you can have a mix that's maybe specific to forests. You want something to sound like a forest. You want to bring in some ambience that makes it sound like a forest. And that can all be driven by this set of data that we're not actually playing sounds directly on, but we're just using it to inform the mix. Another feature that we have in Claudius is logic inheritance. And what that allows us to do is to implement a set of audio logic on a certain audio node, and then inherit it on child nodes of that node so that we can override it, repurpose it, or make it just basically do the same thing as the parent node does. Now that's quite an abstract thing to say, I know, but um, what it means is that we can use a single set of events and parameters to express audio across multiple nodes in the game. I think this comes back to the example that we used before about, you know, a weapon reloading. Um, and so by overriding that logic, we're going to be able to place audio events on specific parts of the weapon uh, and make them perform based on what the character is doing. Um, uh, it just seems like a really powerful tool to have. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's all about putting all the power in your hands. Yeah. You know, For example, you might have something like a, a, a character who jumps and lands, mm. and th that jump event can be expressed on any bone of his body. So if he's wearing a watch, you can make it jingle. Yeah. You know, if, if, he's, if he's got a cracky knee, you can make it crack when he lands or something. And you know, all these different things can be done. And they're all available to you by default. And quite easy to implement as well, as we're yeah. seeing. Another thing we have in Claudius is a set of systemic parameters. And what they are is a set of parameters that are available by default to any audio node in the game. Things such as uh, atmospheric pressure, velocity, acceleration. So for example, you can do something like take the atmospheric pressure and the acceleration of an object, and you can use that to express some wind noise. And uh, that's something that previously would have allowed, would have required code support, but you guys can just dive in and do it on literally anything. You can add an audio, a SIG audio component to something that the audio system's never seen before, and you can start expressing the audio on these things in this way. Claudius, I think, rationalizes the whole process of uh, being a sound designer on this project. All that relevant information is going to be in one place, and it, it's going to be quite digestible, especially for people just getting started. Yeah, absolutely. We want the sound design process to be as organic as possible, and we want you guys to have the freedom to just express yourselves, and that's the point of getting all this data to you by default. Mm.
So let's take a look at an example of something you can do using SigAudio and Claudius without any code support. Here, we're adding a SigAudio component to uh, an entity type that's never had one on it before. It's a really simple thing to do. We just drop the component in in DataForge, and then uh, we can jump over to the editor, and we can spawn one of these things. And I'm going to use the example of a plushie here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use some of these systemic parameters and events that are come for free without any extra code support, and we're going to use them to express it's a bit of a silly example. We're going to use them to express the contents of this plushie. So uh, what looks like a cuddly toy right now is going to turn into some sort of water container. So we're going to put a kind of water sloshing loop on this thing. So we need to respond to its spawn event and uh, also its despawn event. So the sound stops if it ever gets despawned. And we can add an audio source that is the water sloshing sound. And then if we hook that up, it's going to start playing that sound. But the way these uh, sounds are set up is that they don't play anything unless certain parameters are set on them. So they're muted until, for example, uh, they have some sort of rotational or directional movement on them. Because you don't want a, uh, an object to just sit there playing a sloshing sound when it's not moving. So we're going to hook up some parameters as well. We're going to hook up the uh, systemic acceleration and velocity parameters. And we're going to just demonstrate a little bit of, we're not going to go into sort of too complex logic here, but we're just going to demonstrate a little bit of what you can do. So we're going to multiply them by each other. And then the result of that, we're going to set it on a couple of uh, parameters on that object. And then, as I said before, you know everything is live updated. So we're going to see the result of what we do here. We're going to hear the result of what we do here immediately once we've done it. So we'll just finish hooking this up and we will pass over to uh, the editor view once that's done. Oh, one last thing we need to do before we can make that happen is because this entity's already spawned, we need to send its spawn event again. And in Claudius, you can send any events that are set up uh, for debugging reasons, which is really useful. So now we can see the green blob, which says the sound's playing, but we, ha we can't hear very much because there's no velocity or acceleration. Now, as the character runs around carrying it, we can hear the sloshing sounds, we can hear them play when it's dropped, and all this is coming from this set of parameters in Claudius that are being multiplied together just for a bit of fun. So all that was done without any code support. The, the code system had never seen that entity before. It could have been literally any entity in the game, and what we've done there is we've been able to express the contents of that entity without any additional help from the code team. So that's a really sort of freeing thing for the, uh, the sound designers to have available. As we've seen with how easy it is to implement something like this, uh, we have a lot of control over the physics, and it gives us no reason not to add sounds to literally everything in the game that's interactable and that can move. It's going to bring a lot more life. Uh, the speed that we can get this done with, it's going to make iteration a lot more plausible. And uh, yeah, it's I think it's, it's going to be have quite some interesting outcomes. So yeah, it opens up a line of creativity. It opens up a line of uh, experimentation. And that goes you know hand in hand with how quickly this was uh, achieved. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the example there was quite a silly one. It was, it was you know, putting a water yeah. sloshy sound where it doesn't really belong. But um, as I said, you know, the, it doesn't matter what that entity is. It could be a little cuddly uh, plushy thing, or it could be like a, a 400 foot tower that's falling and hitting the ground. And those same parameters can be used to express the sounds of that thing, to express the weight and the size of that thing. And, uh, you know, this tech isn't so limited to props and carryables. It can be used on literally anything. Anything that can move, you can express its movement using these parameters. I think you touched on a really important point there, which is a uh, cause and effect. Um, I think that's one thing that it's quite a tricky phenomenon to implement into games. Uh, but with Claudius, it's it it's going to be you know almost a breeze. Uh, we're going to be able to hold values uh, based on a parameter, for example. So let's say if you shoot this plushie, it'll you know trigger a very high value for for that movement and uh, based on that we'll be able to change the sound that you know happens after so let's say if you shoot the plushie pick it up again instead of a cute cuddly noise it can make like a really angry like why did you shoot me <laughs> sort of grumble um and and yeah it's 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 gonna add a whole new level of depth 
uh, to, to these interactable objects and other things in the game as well. Yeah, and those examples are just, again, it's all about unleashing creativity. Exactly. It's about sort of offering all the data that you need to be able to do whatever you want. And, and there may be things that we never even thought of, but by abstracting these systems in such a way that, and by making all this data available to you, it no longer becomes a coder's problem what you guys want. We just give you everything. Yeah. The SIG Audio and Claudio systems are designed with collaborative working in mind too. So the way that communication and uh, the way that actions are performed in, in Claudius is that the Claudius app sends a request to the game engine to make some sort of change to the audio logic. And only when that request is fulfilled does the change actually reflect itself back in the Claudius UI. And this is tied into that whole concept of uh, there's only one set of data owned by the engine and we change it live. So by having this design, what we've been able to do is allow multiple connections of multiple Claudius clients. And because they're all connected via WebSockets, they could be on separate PCs. What this means is that if a sound designer needs some assistance or just wants to collaborate with another sound designer on some sort of logic set up in Claudius, they can do that incredibly easily. They can uh, connect their Claudius client to somebody else's game client simultaneously while that person has their copy of Claudius connected. And then as they make changes to the logic, they're reflected on both users' Claudius screens simultaneously. I think that's uh, quite a cool feature to have. Uh, a lot of the time when we're working, you know, I'll need to call up either technical sound designer or a colleague um, and share my work, and they'll just be through sharing the screen, and there's a lot of, you know, no, go there, go there, and finger pointing. Um, and it, 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 you know, it can be quite time consuming and make it difficult to, to quickly get a point across. Um, and with this tool, I'll be able to, like you said, connect and just mark up, you know, a gun, for example, or one of these uh, physics prop on the go. Uh, with them and uh, that can also spark quite a few ideas just that that very easy back and forth yeah absolutely and and, and every connected claudius co uh, client has full control mm. so you anyone can make any changes even the undo system works across all clients so you could make a lot of changes uh, to demonstrate something and then disconnect and then the other person can just hit the undo button to get rid of all that stuff and then start you know doing something else that's maybe inspired by what you showed them or something like that. And I think it all just really sort of uh, lends itself to having a lot of collaboration between sound designers, which is always a good thing. I think now with the whole working from home situation, a tool like this is really going to be invaluable. It's it's going to allow the sound designers to connect a lot more. QA to work with sound designers is a lot easier. Uh, technical sound design, dialogue, it's it's really just going to, you know, bring us all closer together and... Uh, hopefully spark some very interesting ideas. So let's take a little look at some of the code that underpins these systems, because when we went away and wanted to start designing this thing, we, we obviously had workflow in mind and we wanted that to be, uh, to create a, a situation that was as, as smooth and as easy as possible for sound designers. But as a code team, we serve two masters. And what we don't want to do is to um, implement those things for the sound designers at a cost that's too great for the engine team. So we need to avoid uh, high CPU usage. We need to avoid blocking the main, you know, the critical paths of the game. And we do that by moving all of our audio processing onto audio threads and onto audio jobs. And all the commands that cause that audio processing to happen are all transmitted through uh, lockless queues. And what that means is that the game can tell us what we need to know and we get out of the way as quickly as possible. And that allows the game to run as freely as it can without audio sort of contributing to frame rate drop or contributing to um, high CPU usage. Because we've moved all that stuff into the audio system, what it means is that something like a, a, a feature that we would have maybe in ship code, like something that's very specific to thrusters, would now become a systemic feature in the audio system. And what that means is, again, it frees up your creativity because we might have created something as an idea that assists with making thrusters sound good, but instead of it being kind of hidden away in the thruster code and only able to be used by those, it's now available to you wherever you want. And you can kind of use some of these tools in a in whatever sort of... Uh, you know, creative ways you can think of, whereas, you know, before they were hidden away, now they're completely available to you. And this also frees up audio coders' time because we spend a lot less time sort of, you know, working to make features that exist in one place, exist somewhere else. Literally, every feature exists everywhere for every system. So that, again, sort of helps um, the audio code team to uh, spend a lot more of their time being creative too. 
which is a really good position to be in. We also have some features that even bring audio code into the realm of post-production, much like the, uh, the sound design is. So we can live rebuild the code while the game is running. And that's something we've been able to do for a long, long time. But what Claudius does, because it uses this reactive programming model and it, and it can react to the game's sort of transmission of events and parameters immediately and present them to you immediately, we can actually boot up the game and start up a feature we've never seen before and start playing around with it and find the bits where the audio needs to be. And then we can live add the code, rebuild it on the fly, and then it's already available to you guys. So we're making it so that collaboration between sound designers and, and audio coders becomes something that is just it's almost as good as a collaboration between sound designers. It's like something we can we can uh, go from nothing to a fully working feature without stopping the game. And then because of all the design that this is all built on and you know all the way that we want to make sure that everything persists, you don't need to like, go back into the game and test it. What that means is that we can effectively implement both the code and the audio setup, save it, and we're literally done. And that's just saving so much time compared to sort of... Um, all the iteration time that they spent like rebooting the game, rebooting editors, rebooting tools, swapping tools and all that kind of thing. So yeah, this this puts code, uh, you know, at least partially in this production, uh, post-production realm as well. Yeah. So we've looked at a lot of features that we've already developed for Claudius, but we have lots of plans for the future too. Um, the design of Sigaudio and Claudius aims to solve future problems before we know what they are. And where it can't solve them completely, it's going to make it easier to solve them. As new game features come along, and we don't know what they're going to be yet necessarily, um, we want to be able to support them as quickly as possible. But also, we want to be able to reuse everything we create. And the Sigaudio and Claudius design is central to that. It's all about reuse, and it's all about having systemic features that are available to sound designers. I think what's so great about this uh, technology is that we're going to be able to take all this information from the game, uh, bring the audio engine into the game engine, um, and just you know make it all so easy to access. I think one key aspect of, uh, of Claudius that the audio team is really looking forward to is sympathetic audio. So this is the cause and effect that we were talking about before. I think it, having this uh, like one event trigger another, for example, it's going to make the, the game a lot more cinematic. Um, everything's going to be real time. We're not going to have to pre-render all these events, um, and uh, it's yeah, it's basically going to become procedural, which means that every you know, a lot of these scenarios that you get into, a lot of these different contexts uh, that that you can get into while you're playing the game, um, we're going to accommodate them, um, and you're going to get you know, really uh, just vastly different experiences every time you do something, and this is because we can infer so much from the game data. Um, and create those links to create a beautiful experience. Um, a lot of the time we think about like how can we sonify this nonlinear spectacle of a game? And I, I truly believe that that is through cause and effect. It's, it's having things done in real time and conveying all this information to the player uh, that you know can be critical. So if, for example, you're flying and you start to enter a debris field or an asteroid field, that all those things can start having an effect on the you know environment around you. You can start hearing creaks. Uh, if you're entering the atmosphere, you can tell like that your ship's going through some strain. And uh, instead of pre-rendering it, it can happen in real time. It can take values uh, from like atmospheric pressure, temperature. And you're, it's 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 going to be you know quite a amazing experience for the players. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know at the core of uh, sympathetic audio is this idea of resonance and. and with the sympathetic audio design that we have, we'll be able to give objects resonant frequencies and we'll be able to make it so that you know, if something sort of uh, broadband in its frequency uh, spectrum goes off, like a, a huge explosion or something like that, then you're going to expect a lot of uh, metal panels and, and glass windows mm -hmm. and things to to rattle and resonate in in, in sympathy, sympathetic yeah. audio, in sympathy with, uh, with the explosion. That's and, no, and all we really have to do is just set up the logic for that to happen and it'll happen. Um, and yeah, really eager and interested to see what um, the players are going to have happen to them yeah. through their playthroughs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, all the, all the features that we're looking to develop uh, are, are all about bringing this game to life more yeah. and, and, and making it more cinema cinematic and, and making it, you know, just feel more immersive. Yeah, super high fidelity. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're looking at sort of improving the mixing support so we can gather some of this. You know, we've got a huge amount of data coming in now that can be used in lots of ways to uh, decide which sounds play and what para you know how those parameters affect those sounds. But we can take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, you know, we've, we've got all this data that's telling us what's going on in the game. Can we then use that to sort of decide how the game should be mixed? So, for example, if, uh, if you're exploring a moon or something like that, you're going to want to hear a lot of the ambiences and maybe some distant mining going off and things like this. But then if you sort of end up engaged in battle with someone, that's something that the audio system is aware of through the data that's coming in, and maybe it can change the mix so that those ambient things don't really get so much of a look in anymore, and it's all about the battle focus and things like that. And then, again, as, as the battle ends and that kind of scenario falls away, we could automatically you know, analyze the data and say, okay, we're now back into an ambient situation, so you know, let's raise the, the level of some of these ambient sources again. Yeah, I think the you know importance to what the uh, what the player needs to hear at that moment. I think that's for especially on the FPS side, that's gonna really be valuable. So that concludes our look at some of the features and tech that we have in development in the Sig Audio team right now. Um, hopefully, it's gonna make the lives of the sound design team uh, much easier, and hopefully, some improvements to the way the game sounds too. Yeah, I think um, the sonic aesthetic of. Uh... This, this game is going to change for the better because of these tools and because of these workflow uh, improvements. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your CitizenCon, and I really hope next year we can all be back together in person and we can see each other in person then. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. Cosmonaut is the premier online magazine for Star Citizen. Packed full of ship reviews, outfitting guides, upcoming events, org interviews, current affairs, history and more. Cosmonaut is your comprehensive guide to all aspects of life among the stars. Our talented team of writers, editors, designers, photographers and artists are all passionate pilots and aim to bring you stellar images, incisive articles and incredible design. Season 1 of Cosmonaut is available for download now. Head to www.cosmonautmagazine.com to get all 12 issues completely free. I've heard them say, with every goal comes a sacrifice. With every dream comes a letdown. You've got to give up something get that big thing you're chasing. I couldn't disagree more. You see, everything is achievable, and you don't have to give up anything along the way. You want to know what I think? Sacrifice is what happens when you give up halfway. The origin of 300i. Sacrifice nothing. Achieve anything. This is Jack. Jack is a successful trader. Unfortunately for Jack, he encounters local pirates. They want ransom money, just a fraction of his profits. Jack refuses the proposal. In his mind, he is a hero. Now, Jack is dead, and all of his belongings go to the pirates anyway. Don't be like Jack. Be smart. Pay ransom. Sponsored by the Sunset Incorporated Pirancing Company. So, Marcus, you work for Addison's campaign, right? Uh, yeah. Did you guys get some sort of a winner's bonus? Well, yeah, we got a bonus. Oh, you did? How much? I did get myself a phoenix as a going away present. They got you a constellation phoenix? Uh, hang on, why are we traveling on this rental Taurus, Marcus? How was I supposed to know you'd prefer the phoenix? Oh, God, Marcus. You know what? I'm just gonna go have a shower. Route has been plotted. Quantum in 10. Uh, guys, there are no towels. You know, I think I had some towels in the Phoenix. 
Oh no, just stop. <laughs> Sorry. Do not underestimate the talented and dedicated folks at CIG Audio. There is always a giant emphasis on video here, but none of it would ever hit the way that it's supposed to without that A to that V. And as we near the end of our show, we also saw the last of our community videos during the break, and I hope they stick around as a tradition for Citizen Cons going forward. For those of you who know my origin story, you might understand why I have a particularly soft spot for them. But that's enough chat. This is it. We're at the end of our day. It's time for one more panel and one more panel alone. It's time for Tony, Rob, Ben, and Luke to take you deep into the machinery beneath our universe in systematic gameplay. Stream of thought. Bon appetit. Hi, I'm Tony Zervek, Director of Persistent Universe for Star Citizen. Today I'm going to tell you about some of the new technology, features, and content that we're aiming to deliver over the next several quarters, and how these things are going to impact your gameplay experience. To assist in that endeavor, I've brought along a few others to give you some additional perspective, including SGS Assistant Director Rob Reininger, Senior Systems Designer Ben Dorsey, and, over in the UK, Lead Designer Luke Presley. Rob, we've been able to buy and sell commodities for years, but we're now looking to try and close out the entire loop by the end of the year by allowing players to sell weapons, armor, clothing, and eventually ships back to the shops. One of your favorite aspects of this has always been what it means to treasure. Can you elaborate a bit on that? I think it's huge because now it gives me a purpose to go out and collect the stuff because players are very meticulous. They'll go out and pick up every single gun, weapon, armor off of other players. Like loot generation is something that the Frankfurt team is working on. Uh, it means a lot for you know investigating lockers or just stripping down something. We talk about salvage. You know they, these are all things that are working towards the ability to buy and sell items, but most importantly. It's just curating your inventory, right? It's it's getting rid of this stuff. It's another form of reward. So I, I think it's a huge addition to the game. Sure, and it also plays a big role in character advancement, right? Yeah. Because you can realize the equity from items that you've purchased in the past. In other words, I, I buy a particular laser rifle. Now I decide that I want the better one. I don't have to buy that one starting from scratch. I can actually sell my original one, assuming it's in pretty good shape, and I basically pick the optimal shop at which to sell it. You know, that's a, you know, a shop that deals in that specific item then I can actually get a pretty good price for that used item I can then take that money and apply it and you know the differential towards moving up the ladder and basically getting better yeah. and better stuff and so just like in the real world it's like you don't usually start from you know from scratch and buy you know buy a house and then basically you know uh, have to you know buy another one from scratch you basically take your you know, realized equity in your original and you throw it into the other one and you just Reinvest. pay the difference yeah and that's something that we don't have in the shops right now everything is is in the shop on a per item basis and I Items sometimes come with default loadouts on them, like a sniper rifle or a set of armor or uh, ships are a great example of something that comes with the default loadout of certain laser cannons and power plants and etc. So as we go forward with selling, one of the things that we want to do is get an itemized price for every single attachment that's on an item, which includes laser scopes, magazines, uh, any uh, underbarrel attachments, right, things like that. So. Now that these have their own individual price, it's much easier for us to one tune the economy. So now it's this thing is more expensive or less expensive 
as stats change, we can we can keep up with the the statistical improvement of the item on a per item basis. Sure, you have the macro item; it consists of the child items. We change the price right. of the child item, and the you know the macro item, the big, the large item that includes you know various quantities of this, its price is automatically adjusted, which is not something that happens now and causes us countless problems. Yeah, and, and it means that now we we have less moving parts to to worry about on a, on a global basis, and. From a what does the world uh, have for sale in it? You know, you talked about you know taking something to a shop that deals in those items. That's it's kind of the concept of well, this shop deals in it and they refurbish it. They have an invested uh, value in procuring those things back from people in the universe. So we want to encourage players to go around to the different places that have the best price for it much like commodity trading right we, we want players to go here because they can buy it for the best price go here because they can sell it for the most money uh, same principle for selling items, right? So this shop deals in it. You should be able to go there and get more money for sure, it. Sure, and we and we need this more you know sophisticated method of determining the pricing of the more complicated items, yeah. you know, that are composed of lots of child items, partially because of what it means to selling. In other words, I, when I go to sell my you know my my pistol, I may have a custom scope on it, something for which we don't have a specific entry in our you know global retail products list, and that says this item should, if it were new, cost this much. This winds up becoming something to where, sure, we've got the base price of the pistol, and we've got the base price, you know, of you know of the scope, but we don't have any sense of what the combination is. As of right now, we don't have a means of solving that, and so this this is why we you know we are going to be pursuing changing even how the shops specify their default you know inventory. Like right now, we actually have shops the specify every entries, individual yeah. item that they can sell as opposed to where we're going is it'll be classes of items this you know yeah. this particular shop deals in you know in in small handheld weapons uh, you know from this particular manufacturer now because they actually deal in small handheld weapons they will in fact purchase you know small handheld weapons from a different manufacturer right. you just won't get you know quite as good a price because they're not as adept at repairing them and they don't have a clientele that's you know that's geared towards purchasing those items etc you if you you wanted to realize you know the best possible price then you would wind up taking your you know your your specific you know items to a shop that dealt in those specific things that's right. and that's where assuming the condition was perfect and assuming that the shop had a lot of cash on hand with which to procure these deals and so was willing to be a little bit more liberal that's where you could potentially recoup you know 70 80 you know, you know 85% of your original value whereas if you go to someone that simply you know sure they you know they deal in small arms but not necessarily that you know that particular manufacturer, not you know that particular caliber weapon or whatever the case may be. Then maybe only get forty or fifty cents on the dollar. Exactly. It's like when you're dealing with a car dealership. Like if you bring them their their brand of car, they're going to pay you more for that than if you brought it's, them. It's it's easier for them, them to service. Their exactly. mechanics are already familiar with it. They can do the They've work the at cost. They can sell it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It totally makes uh, sense. It's it's big and it, it's something that it just feels natural, right? It's how the world really works, and we want to continue to to push that forward. Three point fifteen is a huge update to the game because of the localized inventory that's going to totally change the game. There are several aspects to this, and that starts with, I'd say, the personal inventory manager that Rich Tire and the Actor Feature team have put so much work into. They're going to cover that in a separate discussion, so we'll leave that out of you know uh, out of here. Um, on, over on our side, we've got the vehicle loadout manager, which has been adapted to al only allow you to modify vehicles that are in your immediate vicinity. And then we've also added a new Moby Glass app called Knickknacks. Um, Reiniger, so you've spent the last couple of quarters heavily focused on this. Go ahead and walk us through what's changed, starting with the front end menu. Yeah, so the front end, we've historically allowed players to kind of go wherever they want, right? But as we move forward with the game, the new player experience, we want players to be invested in their home location. So it's, it's more of selecting a home base because the inventory that you have at the start of your account that's entitled, you know, through all your web purchases, through whatever, you know, subscriber flares, et cetera, all of this stuff is going to go to that location as it's physicalized in the world. So now, you have a home base of operations. That's your place. As we explore out throughout the universe, you may move some of that stuff to a new place as you get persistent halves here, a new hab over there, persistent hangar, right? Uh, players are gonna be tangibly going up to, interacting with their, their 
weapon rack, interacting with the stuff in their ship. And so localized inventory is a massive change to how they've dealt with the game in, up till now. Uh, gone are kind of the days of this global inventory that you can go and, and interact with anywhere in the universe. If your stuff is at Microtech, you need to go to Microtech to do it. If it's in this hangar over here, you got to go to that hangar. So we want players to feel the, the pressure of prepping for a trip, right? It's, it's as you go out, this is the mission I'm going to do. This is what I need to go and do that mission. So I want to go here, get this, get this, or maybe go to a shop here and buy that. Uh, and so the front end is going to be the, the first step in kind of planting your seed uh, wherever it is in the universe from the very start. So what about the Knickknacks app? So this, this allows you to basically, in its first incarnation, to see where you've placed all of your sure. loot throughout the entire solar system. It works on a hierarchical basis, so you can drill down into a particular planet, see you know the city. At the city, you can basically see what ships you have stored there. You can look within your ship and you know, right. eventually see you know, what cargo grids and you know, what, what you know, storage closets you have within there and what items you have placed within there. You've also got a number of filters that allow you to quickly drill down through your entire inventory and find you know all the you know the laser rifles or whatever else it is that you're you know specifically searching for can you just you know, walk through that in a little bit more detail as we kind of go into the localized inventory the the vma can only act on the ships that are at that location uh the you kind of lose perspective of the global view because the personal inventory manager that the active feature team has done has removed the pma which was also your kind of uh, global view into your personal items. So the Knickknacks app allows you to kind of see where your stuff is distributed around the world at the individual location level. So whether it's in a ship or in a hab or in a hangar, uh, right now the locations are, are basically cities or stations, pretty much any place that has a shop that sells items, that can be some place where you can store stuff. So the, the ships also have their local inventories associated with them, so you can store things in the ship. and. The, the Knickknacks app is, is good because now you, if you want to find laser rifles, you've got, you can search by type or, or subtypes, uh, basically the, the same things that you see in the shop, so the categories that you see in the, in the shop UIs, uh, that's the same level of, of interaction and, and filtering that you'll have in Knickknacks. We've spoken a bit about how it's going to evolve in the future and what new capabilities we would wind up adding to it, you know, trading you know, with other players is one of the things that's at the top of the list. Yeah, right, right clicking on something, being able to say, hey, open a trade window with, with Ben here. Uh, I want to be able to show me on the star map where this is. So yeah, we, we, something that we want to do in the mobile glass as a whole is context ability to bounce to different apps that are, are you know, contextually relevant to whatever you're currently using. So like saying this is in this location when that's just a string, like it's in Ol Olisar, that's not super useful. Seeing that on a map, that tells me something. That tells me I need to go from here to here. I need to plot this location. Right. I'm going to go through this dangerous area to get there in order to access my stuff. Or, and, or and a hyperlink on yeah, that. And, yeah, and, right, and, so. and you can also very easily discern you know, distance and stuff, which is, yes. oh, well, this one's not here, very... but is it relatively close yep. or is it really, really far away? And I need to be able to obviously you know, put that into my planning. Yeah, or set a route to see how much fuel I'm going to use. Exactly. Right? There, there's a lot of different reasons why these things are, are kind of relevant. We want to try and preserve all those elements that CR really wants to push towards, but still give you the context switching that you're going to need. Another area that's currently under heavy development is physicalized cargo. It consists of multiple facets and will be released in stages, with the first one relating to shop purchases injecting physical entities rather than what I would call render proxies into your ship. This is going to convey all sorts of benefits and advantages you know, to the gameplay experience. The first and one of the most obvious is simply the fact that now that you've got a ship that has physical entities placed within it, then when another player winds up disabling, boarding your ship, they can actually extract you know, that cargo from you. There's value there that they can actually take. Whereas right now, the only way to get that value is you have to you know, blow up the ship, and then we basically yeah. you know, create you know, these, these, the these cargo facsimiles that together. basically get blasted <laughs> out into space and you have to go collect those, you know, yeah. et cetera. And so this starts to hint at things like, you know, uh, the fact that we're going to want to bring NPCs into defending these ships. All of a sudden, yep. you get this fantastic gameplay transition, what I would say, where you have ships doing this momentum-based combat, mm -hmm. and now I can disable a ship, board it, 
and I actually have to overcome the NPC crew and then physically grab the cargo, haul it back to my ship. At the same time, you're concerned that while you're basically on the ship and lugging this stuff around, that security or you know allies of the ship that you've disabled might show up and start blasting you. And so all of a sudden, the considerations uh, you know just explode you know for doing something so right now relatively basic and it's it's one of the aspects that i really love of, about this game which is how we can add this low level gameplay mechanic and it, you know in one shot it's going to totally transform so many different you know elements of the yeah. game and we get stuff like the whole sea which you know is an, another hurdle beyond the physicalization of cargo uh, I think one of the things that, that just physicalizing the cargo really does is it allows for the gameplay that CR wants where you're not blowing up ships, right? You're destroying an engine, which is not a critical failure, right? D critical failures are the things that lead to these larger scale destructions, but on average, you're knocking a ship out of commission. You're able to board, you're able to acquire the stuff, you're not killing everybody on the ship just because it it got taken down to zero health, right? Um, so the, these are all things that just physicalizing the cargo allows us to do. You mentioned the whole sea. So the whole sea has some unique challenges related to attaching physicalized cargo to it when you're actually you know, docked at a station or when you're you know, parked in a hangar and its wings are compressed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so the whole sea, because it, it does have these two different states, uh, now we have ATC considerations. If I have cargo on the outside of, of my ship, my wings are exposed, now I can only go to a docking collar. I can't go to the hangar. So the ACC needs to know to route you to these different locations. Uh, showing all this cargo on the outside of a ship beyond, you know, think of adding additional ships to an area and, and the kind of, you know, uh, slowdown that you might see on, on a server, right? You're adding more physical objects that, that, that can be blown up, can be interacted with. So there's a technical challenge that we need to overcome as well. Uh, how they get on there, these, these are shipping container sized objects that have a, a real world weight to them. They need a tractor beam that, that is large enough, probably on an Argo ship, right? Uh, so you, you'll get these little transport ships going from a station's docking you know, a cargo bay, flying it out to the whole sea, and so, you know, think of it as a person walking in and out, but it's it's on a you know spaceship scale. Another thing that's really bothered me for quite a while is what I'd call the lack of transactional friction. And what I mean when I say that is that it takes the exact same amount of time to load or unload one unit of cargo onto your ship as it does a thousand or ten thousand. There, there's no friction, you know, uh, in this process. Right. And that's completely different from the real world where mom and pop retailers and major port facilities, you know, designed to rapidly load or unload, you know, cargo onto, you know, some big, you know, uh, you know f uh, freight ship are able to move you know much much larger quantities in a much much shorter period of time and you've got skilled dock workers that you know you can actually hire that are trained to basically deal with special types of materials and all that sort of stuff where, where we're eventually going with this is that shop purchases are going to inject physical cargo into a storage space and it's then up to you the player to basically move the stuff from that storage space onto your actual ship and there are going to be I would assume that at this you know point in time, half of the people watching this are saying that sounds you know incredibly rough, awesome, right, yeah. and the other half are saying this sounds incredibly <laughs> tedious, and it sounds like a lot of you know forced like labor that's going to be completely to, you know yeah. uh, you know uh, you know completely right. lacking in fun. There there is a method to the madness. I mean, where we're going with this is we're going to make the concept of moving freight onto and off of ships not just a logistical challenge but we're actually going to make sure that you know it's it's a fun you know a fun experience yeah. and this would include everything from eventually adding a service beacon so that you could recruit your friends, your org mates, you know, people you don't know to basically come and help you move cargo. We'll eventually add the ability for NPCs to be to be hired at that location, and the price will fluctuate depending upon how many other players are requesting similar services. Um, and you can use those you know types of you know ca you know capabilities if you simply want to pay a certain amount, have your ship loaded or unloaded 
promoted and you're going to go fly around and do something you know completely unrelated so dorsey how is physicalized cargo going to impact the gameplay experience i mean in a bunch of ways as you kind of touched on there's the whole concept of of needing to move cargo from one of those uh storage areas into uh, that ship we've actually run into a lot of problems where when you go across when you come across a derelict for instance um, we have all these crates on there that you can offload in, in a lot of the events that we've done. And um, that amount of time that it takes to do that makes it so that when you then go to sell those crates, they can't, they aren't worth the time, frankly. Um, yeah, it's because it's, over time. Exactly. Yeah. It is so much faster to just park your ship and, and click the button and have it instantly get filled and then drive over to another place and have it instantly be unloaded um, that we can't make those, that, that, process pay well enough to also be balanced when you're getting 16 to 20 crates off of a ship and it's taking you half an hour to do that. But once you make it so that there is a much more similar timeline between those two, um, you can make it so that there's a much bigger reward on a crate by crate basis and that allows us to make it so that derelicts become a lot more common and offloading stuff becomes a lot com more common. There's also just some really great benefits in that we can make missions reward you by putting cargo yeah, out there. That's right. It doesn't have to be that the UEC reward of a mission is is the only reward. This mission gives you 5,000 every single time. No, there's a ship that gets blown up or you blow up or disable a ship and um, especially disable a ship and then you can board it and take that cargo off. For pirates that becomes then the goal. Like blowing up a ship now becomes almost a failure. You don't want to. You want to disable it. You want to be able to get on it and then you want to take that cargo off. And of course the crew is going to be fighting you the entire way there. They're going to um, have their, their people to try and fight off your boarding parties. You've suddenly transitioned to, into an FPS map by doing so, which is this really great transition that just doesn't really happen in a lot of games, and that's amazing. And even just from a, a, a pure like gameplay uh, system standpoint of, of carrying that crate, that is a, a very powerful state for the player to be in and that they are vulnerable. You can't be shooting a gun and carrying a crate at the same time. That's actually the, my, one of my favorite you know, a, a things about this entire process is the fact that we're finally going to reward the player and basically provide this differential in the challenges. Yes. You know, where we've long had, you know, blow the ship up, the ship basically ejects some cargo, you right. you know, you tractor beam it up and now you basically got your reward. But what it's missing is that 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 transition from FPS mo or uh, from ship based momentum based you know combat to where you know you're shooting your big guns at these things etc and now you're sneaking around corners and you may or may not try to be stealthy and you're basically trying to extract the cargo out and the crew's basically you know coming out of the security areas of the ship and patrolling for you and trying to you know uh, you stop you also you. got friends trying to protect each other too while the other people are trying to move stuff I right and tractor beams are based on weight so it may take multiple people to exactly. actually move a heavier box. And CR wants the, the gameplay experience to be less ships blowing up, more this ship got disabled, the engines go out, and unless there's a critical failure, the ship doesn't explode. So the opportunity to board a ship will be more common as we move forward. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about in this area, and that's, you've, you've heard me you know, talk about this you know, often, which is eventually I want the whole transport occupation to kind of revolve around what I call like a hub and spoke model right. to where you've basically got, you know, big port facilities that are specifically designed to provide the the quantity of inventory and the, you know, and 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 all of the infrastructure to quickly get that stuff on and off certain ships, um, as opposed to small mom and pop retailers that are really just intended to deal in a very small number of items. And one of the more significant problems we have in the game, because we don't yet have you know that level of realism, is related to we've got a we've got a small you know we've got a small mom and pop retailer, and we need to have a decent amount of inventory so that it can satisfy demand across potentially a hundred different players, all grabbing theoretically you know, one or two or three items. 
but what happens in the real game right now, because there are none of these limitations, there's none of this transactional friction is, is one big ship comes up and it purchases all 300 of them because, because it takes absolutely right. no time to do that. It then flies to a destination and it immediately sells it and it collects you know, only the slimmest of profit margins, but because there was no, t no loading time, there was no unloading time, they could still turn around and make a fairly you know, uh, good return on the amount of invested time you know they put into it and turning all of this cargo into physicalized entities and basically adding these logistical challenges to where you have to move stuff on move it off you know you, know, you have to be more careful with volatile cargo bigger you know crates will require you know argos to move them or cranes or forklifts or whatever the case may be all of this is ultimately going to push players into being more selective about where for whatever they're trying to do what types of shops and stuff they're going to visit. And what you're going to get is just like in the real world where you'll have super tankers bringing oil from across the ocean and basically parking it at some sort of port facility for offloading. And that will then be transported by, you know, whether it's pipelines, by rail, you know, by those types of things to, uh, to distribution outlets. And from there, it'll be picked up by trucks and transported to the local gas station. And from the gas station, that's where you, the end consumer, can expect to buy six or 12 gallons of gas but in the real world you can't you know drive your truck up to you know, a port refinery you know, on the coast and basically you know request you know five or ten gallons of fuel it's like they they only deal in minimum quantities of 10 or 100,000 or 500,000 you know barrels of fuel and this will be the same thing that we're going to eventually you know support on our side to where if you've got one of these big you know whole sea ships and stuff there will be specific locations where you know we're we're trying we're, we're we're really basically pushing you to do your business it doesn't mean that you can't go and park at a small place yeah. it's like i can have a super tanker and i can go i can go with, park with the on the side though right because you do have the docking collar restriction on on the whole c type ship right and but i think this is what the going to the per box model will actually do for us because we can just make those small mom and pop shops only have the smaller volumes of, of like commodities, right? You, you talked about how if, if you can only upload, up, unload and offload one box at a time, I'm not going to do a Caterpillar there. Yeah, like, there's nothing right, right, right. stopping you, but there's something That's just it. If, if, I, if, if, I, if, if my, if, if my ship no. holds 10,000 units of inventory and I don't have any of the automated stuff and this, you don't have enough dock workers, I can't hire. At this place, there literally aren't 100 NPCs or 500 NPCs that I can hire for any amount of money. They're, they're literally just not there. Then you're going to have to do it yourself or you're going to have to request some friends to help you. And it's simply too tedious. It, it's not that you, it's not that we literally prevent you from basically going there and extracting the material. It's that it's simply not going to be worth your time. You're going to have to invest so much time and effort into doing that, that all of a sudden you would need an astronomically high profit margin. And long before the profit margins on that particular, you know, commodity or material get that high, someone else with a smaller, more efficient ship that can more you know, effectively, you know, uh, be loaded with a smaller quantity of stuff and navigate to somewhere you know, to another small uh, location to basically uh, sell it, they'll wind up, you know, taking, you know, taking that material from that location. Which well, means I, for a cat, like a, a, one of those bigger ships, like one of the Hull series or something, you're going to want to, by just that nature, go to a place that has a, a, a cargo elevator that can give you 20 giant crates at the same time. Right. Yeah, that's 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 because what I mean. Like with where you'll make that profit with the infrastructure. In it's like some places you'll have an elevator that basically gives you easy access to. 10 crates at a time, and, yeah. a, and a bigger facility will have 50, and a bigger one still will have 200, and this one will allow you to basically hire up to four NPCs, sure. and one NPC can move, you know, 10 crates yeah. per hour. But you're going to be in competition with, you know, w with that small number of NPCs with everybody else, so the price can get fairly high. And it, this other place will have up to 500 or 1,000 workers that you can hire, so it may still take, you know, it may take hours, but you have, you know, but that's only because you're, you know, loading 10, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 SEU of cargo, you know, in, into your hold. Another very interesting aspect of this is going to be that you're going to have relatively clearly delineated transport routes, right. supply routes within the system. And this provides us an awesome opportunity to more precisely tailor what types of challenges you should run into when you're basically moving a big freighter ship from point A to point B as opposed to this other location. In other words, if you think about 
you know, pirates are trying to, you know, uh, abscond, you know, they're basically trying to disable your ship and, you know, and, and plunder it, take, you know, whatever valuable materials, you know, you have on board. But the types of ships that would be required to extract, you know, all of Very the fuel yeah. off, off of a big massive freighter are clearly dramatically different than the ships that would be needed to effectively and efficiently, you know, plunder a far smaller ship that deals in a totally different, you know, type of item or a totally different, you know, and more limited quantity of items. And so we'll be able to more more accurately tailor the gameplay experience so that you get the kinds of challenges you would expect. Well, and I think by nature it just it'll it'll allow it to naturally separate, right? You because it's not worth it over here and we can we can make those inventory volumes smaller to match the the type of people that we want frequenting those stores. I'm just not going to waste my time. As a, as a large-scale shipper, I'm going to go to the bigger places I can handle, that can get me in and out faster, that I can hire more people, where there's going to be other people there that I can potentially hire, like the service beacon. It doesn't matter if I'm out in the middle of nowhere because nobody's there to come that, that and have the specialists. It's, it's, special, it's yeah. only at these select ports right. where they actually have trained dock workers skilled in you know, in, in moving volatile cargo. And if you go to a place where you don't have it and you have, you know, Joe, you know, you know, Joe average, you know, NPC try to do it, then you may wind up, you know, suffering the consequences of, oh, you lost your cargo. It was blown up. Your ship was destroyed. You have to go to insurance, you know, reclaim, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all because you basically tried to, um, you know, use a facility that was not appropriate for you know for the types of actions you were it's trying just to not do tailored to it right so it's uh, th i think it'll be a good change for the game the key point from my perspective though is as much as possible we don't want to necessarily make it black and white right? right which is it's not that you literally as the owner of a whole sea you're not able to buy fuel here it's more that you can buy it there, but it's going to, you know, if you're buying more than 10 or 20 units of it, it's going to be, you know, you're going to basically have to deal with the repercussions of trying to get all of that stuff onto here. And it's going to take a tremendous amount of time and you're going to wind up having to pay an exorbitant premium because you're basically going to be depleting them of their entire, you know, inventory supply, et cetera. And so it's really just, you know, the, the, the logistical challenges that you would face trying to exploit, you know, non-optimal locations for the unloading or, un you know, uh, for the loading or unloading of your cargo would simply not be worth it. Well, and I think another good point is that as you, as you push the inventory to its limits, your bid-ass spread is going to actually be going down as you, you know, price per unit of the cargo is is going to diminish as you get closer and closer to the inventory limits. So it's going to encourage you to go to places with those larger scale inventories so that you can keep your, your profit margin as high as possible. We completed the basic foundation for Reputation late last year and that followed that up in the first quarter with the release of the Delphi MobiGlass app that allows you to see exactly how different NPCs and organizations feel about you. This is a critical system within the game because it's the key mechanism by which you'll unlock more challenging and lucrative opportunities and gain access to organizations and areas that will bestow various benefits. We're still missing a few key pieces of the puzzle though and can't yet fully exploit this system. So, over on the mission side, only the bounty hunting services give you a nice gradation of challenges at the moment, offering you more interesting missions as you gain reputation with them. Can you go into a little bit of detail about why this is? It, essentially, whenever we want to make a new mission, or even just a very small variant on a mission, it, it requires an entirely new uh, record, a new, new chunk of data that we have to put into the system, and that takes time. Um, to build out any kind of, of ladder is, is a, a, an awful amount of time, honestly. Some things that we want to do is just kind of make it so that some of that is more systemic and a little bit faster, and by doing that we will be able to kind of um, explode wide, making it so that um, we make one mission, one template, and then just give it some variables that have some ranges. Um, and, and by doing so, we can, we can then allow it to almost generate its own chains of missions with difficulties that are driven by how much reputation you have, and those can give you different amounts of rewards and spawn different amounts of enemies and um, put things at different distances, etc. Um, just kind of dynamicizing that, that mission variation. 
Yeah, and there's, there's actually a lot to this, a lot of additional complication besides the mission itself, because when you think about it, you may have a mission giver, and the mission giver looks at your reputation and decides that he's only going to give you the junior starter missions. And so he calls up the, you know, go kill bad guys in this particular section, and he basically says, you know what, given your reputation, I'm going to assume that you can only take, you know, a difficulty value of one. And passing a difficulty value of one into that mission will only create one or two guys, and your reward will be... You know, of a considerably lower rate than it would, you know, than what it might otherwise be. As you do that mission, you build up reputation with him. All of a sudden, he's passing, you know, higher difficulty levels into that mission template. And one one of the complicating factors that we face is we need to be able to take this template and before we've actually instantiated it, before you've yes. actually accepted it, we need to be able to extract information out of it and process that. And what I mean by that is we need to know before we've created the mission how much money you should reasonably be paid in order to do this. And we need to know, if we need to have a sense of where this mission might actually take you and what the current status of that area is. Or is he sending you into an area rife with pirates or is he sending you into an area that's you know got tons of Security and it's the safest thing in the world. Or an active supernova, or like any number of things that are terrifying to go. And, and, and this is this is part of the reason why we've actually made some significant progress on this particular problem, but there are multiple facets to dealing with it. And I'd actually say that at this point, we're in a relatively good you know place on the on, you know, on the on the underlying the dynamic mission side, and we've still got a considerable amount of work to do over on the actual UI side to take a mission template, look at your reputation, create some proxy references to that mission template with different metadata associated, and then assuming that you actually select option number three, which has metadata this, then we'll instantiate the mission, pass in the metadata so that it actually customizes it as appropriate for the selection that you were just you know shown and you can then go off and execute that mission and you'll be paid the correct amount and you'll encounter the appropriate amount of difficulty for you know for what you were promised and for what he thought you were capable of doing given your reputational level because we already do have in game something that players can kind of play with right now the bounty hunter chain which is effectively what this will look like to players it's just a matter of that took a lot of setup and now it should be something that we can pretty much like click a few buttons and we're good to go. That's exactly it. Like in, in the end, it's all about allowing you to as quickly and easily express a solution to the problem of I've got a mission giver. This mission giver is going to dispatch you to deal with you know with bad guys. The variables wind up becoming well, how many bad guys and how quickly are they going to reinforce themselves and are they going to be you know are they going to be flying capital ships or you know little small hornets and what kind of stuff will they have on board and in what areas of the solar system you know will this conflict be taking place. So th these are all things that we can bend as appropriate, depending upon what you know what we think you're capable of, or what that NPC you know, would theoretically think you're capable of. Yeah. Well, and, and we talked a little bit about the procedural character generation uh, in the last USP sync that we did on for Star Citizen Lab, but that's going to be taken into account. The, the back end is going to be generating more and more difficult NPCs based on the gear, based on the quality of the stuff that they can do, their behaviors. So all that needs to get fed into the mission and become part of how we reward the players and, and enhance that experience. But these are all things that are going to be fed into the mission instead of just the static data that we yeah. kind of have right now. Like you, you literally have to place nodes in the mission script logic that, that says like spawn this kind of thing right. if we roll this and this kind of thing if we do that. And it's just, it's It's work, just work, time work. and, and the, this is all data that, that we, as long as we can get it up front, we can pass that into the mission ahead of time and, and actually show that in the mission right up. You know, it's like here's, here's a mission that's going to take you here and it's offered by this guy. Here's Expect rewards. a medium level of resistance, yeah. or this many hazards, or yeah. Fundamentally, that's why reputation is so important. Is it's it's your. It, I, I it would lets say us see it, how good you are. It's then. it's it's the single most important means of progression within yes. the game. Clearly, you Hopefully. can you know you can basically upgrade your character by buying different ships. You yeah. can customize your ships. You can buy you know different armor and weapons you know for your character. But in terms of granting you you know membership within an organization or access to areas you know um with you know with with more or less hostility depending upon which yep. organization you're a member of and you know what your reputation is within there and how this character responds to you and whether yes. they give you the you know the super challenging and lucrative missions or the super easy things that mm -hmm. basically just have you you know doing you know piddly little stuff that, that, that anyone can accomplish because they don't yet know you don't yet trust you 
Um, that's what the reputation system is all about. We, we've got, we completed the, you know, as I said earlier, the basic system the last year. We yeah. incorporated the reputational logic into, the, you know, into the subsumption, you know, mm -hmm. mission and AI language. Um, we got the Delphi app so that you can actually see what your standing is with all these different NPCs and organizations. The one piece, the, you know, the key piece of the puzzle that we're still missing is the ability of the mission system to basically, one, have the mission templates, you know, created that actually take these inputs and then be able to feed them in and have it customize itself as appropriate and uh, related to that is you know and it's no small talent it is a fair is is going to be a fair bit of work to adapt the the UI to actually allow for this and that's you know just just on a brief aside one of the big tasks remaining on the on the USBU group for next year is going to be refactoring the entire mission interface and converting it from the old flash tech to the building blocks you know tech and that's one of the reasons huge, why yeah. we may Made some forward progress on this and then we kind of like waited because anything that we would have done over on the flash side would have been throwaway work and so we made the decision to basically wait to complete the last 25% of this particular puzzle until we had the correct you know, UI foundation in place which ultimately a, it'll make it much easier to implement these changes that I'm talking about, and B, you know, we're not going to have to, you know, design it, throw it away, and then design it again. And, and it doesn't mean that the players won't be able to experience those changes in the game without the UI, right? That'll, that'll still be there, but we'll be able to present that and, and give you a better indication of how the mission is going to play out or what you're going to get as a result of the mission with that, the new UI. And, and also to show you, you know, missions that you don't have the reputation yeah, for. Right, exactly. Like, it's weird that, that how important that is, but it actually is is vital that you be able to see, like, hey, I'm not actually with these people. They don't know that I'm that good of a cargo hauler, so they're not going to give me this super difficult cargo hauling mission. Um, well, you got to know what you're striving towards, too, exactly. as well, right? It's like, I, I, I want to get better at this. I want to do missions with these yes. guys because that's going to push me to go and get that one right there. That offers this much extra reward or this this membership here. And, I, I, and I don't want I, I don't to go into this. This is, a, this yeah, is like, it, a, no, I just mean, th this this is a topic, topic for another for day, sure. but yeah. I was just going to briefly mention, you know, orgs, perks, benefits. So we're talking about reputation, and you can see your standing with, you know, with different organizations, with players, and we will, you know, at some point, you know, next year, you know, start to move forward with, you know, with with when I say orgs, perks, benefits, you guys know what I'm talking about, which is basically all of the benefits that may you know uh, that may be made upon you just as a result of being within this organization or having a certain level of stature within this organization. This may be anything from you know expedited you know ship deliveries. You know, after your ship gets blown up, you yeah. you, you don't have to basically you know pay a fee to basically you know get it as quickly as possible. That's automatically covered. You may get you know discounted prices at certain shops. Um, you may you know simply not get a hostile response from pirates in this area if you're a member of you know of the pirates guild and things of that sort. And so this this plays into what we're talking about here because. You're able to look at an organization. You're able to understand what kind of benefits it conveys to you know its most exalted members, and then you can decide whether or not you want to basically try to increase you know increase your ranks you know within there. And you know in in terms of doing that, the challenge is simply having enough mission variety and diversity yeah. to enable the player to feel, hey, I I started out, he didn't trust me, he gave me you know the real simple, not particularly lucrative mission. And I've been working on this for days and days and days, and I've been moving up in terms of the difficulty that I faced, in terms of the reward that I was offered, and finally I got to the promised land, and now I basically you know, have membership within the organization, and now I can basically go to grim hex and have no concern that you know the local you know pirate organization is basically going to assault me turns aren't going to shoot at you etc and importantly like that is something that makes your character unique in an mmo yeah. it's very Jeez. important that you bring something to the table that other members of your your friend group might not have frankly or your organization you have to come in and say hey i actually have access to this really cool mission or this really cool thing and and by doing that i can can make things cooler for my group, and we encourage that community play that is so vital. Yeah, that, that actually brings to mind, right now we have 
we've historically had this faction system that we use to determine hostility. It's 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 always been it's 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 always been one of these systems that we know we're going to change it. We know that it's not sufficient, you know, for where we're eventually going. Um, it's it's very just rigid. never yeah. It's just yeah. it's it's just never it's never been a high enough priority. We're getting to the point where we're going to have to resolve this because the rest of the game is getting complex enough to where it's 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 really starting to fray at the seams. So earlier this year we released the Xeno Threat mission and. That was still entirely based upon the faction system of hostility, and that imposed a serious limitation in that while players could join up and basically fight on the side of the UE and try to repel the Xenothreat invaders, there was no real officially sanctioned you know, means of you joining the side of the bad guys, the yeah. Xenothreat. You could go shoot you know, the players that were you know, supporting the UE, sure. you could shoot the UE itself, you could get a crime stat, but the Xeno threat would still view you as hostile. They would yeah, still exactly. engage you, still try to kill you, et cetera. This was something that we got right up to the very end with Nine Tails, and it was driving you and I crazy. Yes. And we wanted to fix it. And we put in what equates to, I'd say, a, it's a temporary hack yes. to where what we can effectively do is allow a faction to override its normal you know, dislike of someone in another faction based upon whether or not they have a particular mission yes. token in their inventory. Well, it's if they're doing a certain mission at this time. Yeah. Um, and, and that is honestly not how we want to do this. A hundred percent. So, so yeah. in this particular case, if you accept the support nine tails, you know, mission, then flips. they would normally view you as hostile, but because you're holding that, you know, that token, that mission reference, yeah. they'll go ahead and grant you an exemption. But this is, you know, it is clumsy. It was viewed as a, a very temporary solution. The long-term solution that we've always discussed is going to a more reputational, yeah. you know, based, uh, you know, hostility system. Can you go into a little bit of detail about why that's so important and what kind of additional things uh, we'll be able to support in the future when we have such a, a more flexible system. Sure. I mean, the the, the why it's important is, is fairly obvious. Like, if I have to make sure that you have a certain mission in order to do something, then I can't say, for instance, you can't go to Grimhex. I'm sorry. You're on the side of the police. Like, they will shoot you. That is a problem. No, right now, like they are actually just civilians, so that they don't they don't care. Essentially, um, if it's reputation, it's something that persists. It doesn't matter if you have a mission or not. You have done something that has made these people like or dislike you, and no matter where you go and what you do, unless that changes, they are going to attack you or not attack you, and you can kind of count on that. Well, your actions have an impact they do. Uh, on how the world perceives you, right? Yep. And it's especially important, like as as we go into pyro, as there's multiple factions that are that are kind of at war with each other out there. We we want the players to be able to get in good with one or one or the other. Exactly. So I, I it, it's a change that we know we need to make, and I think it's really going to take shape and form as we go into pyro because UE in Stanton is a pretty you know binary thing. There's little pockets of pirates, but it's not sure. it's not like pyro where it's going to have like these very distinct groups that are kind of warring with each other and we the reputation system is perfect for that it will allow us to open up also just like an entire branch of content like we don't really have missions where you work with criminals for the criminals there's there's nothing that really makes you a long-term criminal player y your crime stat can be wiped you can kind of you know get rid yeah. of that source it's it's not something that i am a criminal player and i i, I log in and i'm going to do these kinds of things. I'm going to be on this side of things. These people hate me. These people love me. Um, that allows you to define your character. That allows you to define your play style. That allows you to, to define where you're going to do and what you're going to do in the game. The entire game shifts if you have the ability yeah, to say. Yeah, I, I would say it's much more like the real world to where it, it's, you know, the concept of what, you know, hostility, it eventually equates to binary. Either yeah, I engage sure. you, either I well, attack you, or I do not. But in between, there's there's literally just you know a sea of grays exactly. in terms of, yeah, of gray this gray. organization hates that one, this one likes this one, yeah. you know, this one doesn't like, this one's neutral towards that one, etc. And you wind up having inevitably some sort of unique mixture of all of these yeah. different things. And so in the end, you know, you'll you'll you know we will prioritize these things and determine it's like oh well you're you know you're a member of you know the you know the walk old ladies across the street well I, I like <laughs> that oh but you're also a member of the pirate guild I I really hate that so even though I like that one I'm still going to attack you and so it's just it's much more flexible in terms of de you know in terms of determining all these you know 
complex relationships that players are eventually going to instill upon their characters. Like, it's not going to be either I'm left faction or right faction. It's like there's going to be lots and lots of different organizations, lots of different NPCs, and your standing with those will be all over the map. Some players will be in really good standing with this. Some players, you know, will be really low on this other one. And... You know, the, the, the level of variability that we'll be able to support with, you know, with the reputation system is just going to be, you know, far, far superior to what we have now. Dorsey, you implemented the Nine Tails mission, which allowed players to fight on either side of the conflict. How does the gameplay experience differ depending upon which side you choose to support? And can you explain how this actually, in the end, wound up being a server optimization of sorts? Well... I mean, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. What happens differently is if you are on, on the, uh, the lawful side, you are working for Crusader Security, uh, they are sending out scanning ships to try and locate the Ninetales fleet, um, and you have to go and protect those. And then once you have found that fleet, you go and destroy that fleet. You are killing ships until you basically deplete their resources and make them retreat from the area. On the Ninetales side of that, you are, of course, going and hunting those scanning ships. You are uh, given their locations, and you're told, hey, go destroy these. And then once the fleet portion of it gets found, you go and try to defend that fleet. And if you can hold them off for long enough, then Ninetales will actually uh, win, and, and uh, Crusader will be unable to drive them away before they achieve their, their objective, essentially, which is a, a hidden objective that, that we aren't revealing at this time. Um, but we are now. But well, hmm. <laughs> the the uh, the the genesis of this though, Nine Tails was not originally actually supposed to be a PvP event at all. It was yeah. much like Zenith Threat, supposed to be just pure PVE. That had performance problems, frankly. Uh, spawning enough ships in a a pure giant fleet battle to challenge thirty to fifty players made the server just tank. Um, it was it was incredibly painful, and it just didn't play very well. Um, it also, to be honest, was the same thing as, as what Xenothreat yeah, already exactly. had done. And I wanted to do something a little different. Um, and that, that kind of combined into to this, this push to get um, the aforementioned kind of duct tape solution for hostility in so that you can align on, on both sides. And, and by doing that, I make it so that I don't need to spawn ships to challenge 30 to 50 people. If things are running smoothly, I have 25 versus 25, and I don't need to spawn really just about anything. Right. Um, you bring the NPCs in just to flesh to, out, to, to, to fill, even the odds, yeah. to get the challenge you know, to the level you need. Um, but when you actually have players that will legitimately fulfill a particular role, you, you take off. advantage of that. Yeah. Oh, it was a creative way to load balance the mission and yeah. the population. In the I, area. I, I would nice. say, though, that in general, this is 100% exactly what we do want to do, which is we want to give the players... Yeah the total freedom to basically do whatever they want and right. then as i always say it's like you know they live with the consequences they live with the mm -hmm. repercussions of their actions if you go and support nine tails if you support xenothera it's like that will have you know an impact on okay. how people view you you know the yeah. aforementioned reputation system and you're standing with you know with key npcs within the game and how you the ue views you and you know whether or not certain organizations want to allow you within their ranks and some of these things you do will have long-standing impact yeah. where if you ally yourself with a group you know uh you know like the nine tails you may be prohibited from joining some organization that yep. you've been aspiring to for a very long time unless so, you do something to work that back like yeah, you it, gotta well, and it's a balance, right yeah. and, and we want we want those scales to go one way or the other it's not that we want you to be able to be perfect with everybody all the time like that it comes at a cost. It depends upon the severity, right? Which is, if you do jaywalking, well, yeah. then sure, someone is not going to find it that difficult to basically assume that from now on, you'll stay on the right side of the law, so we'll go ahead and you let you into our transport guild. If, on the other hand, you're you know, committing acts of piracy and murder and everything else, it's like, oh, well, now I'm not sure that I actually want you in our organization which adheres to all the laws of the nearby area and everything of that sort. That element of being able to pick your side and, and do what you want to do in the game is something that, you know, because of that, we want to allow in pretty much every piece of our content going yeah, forward. It, it needs is, to be as much a, as possible. ingrained in the game with yeah. everything else. Yeah, the only reason we haven't, you know, traditionally supported it is, is it's... The tech. It's... It, it's well, and, and to a large degree, you can call out a few specific pieces of the tech, right? Yeah. Which is the reputation system certainly plays a role. Um, the, you know, the lack of a reputation-based hostility system. We're still using the old faction system. For Xenothread, that was literally the number one reason why early in the development process we nixed it. On Ninetales, 
we were literally within weeks of release, and it it it, so it, would, it, it was going to bother me to yes. put out a second one yeah. that had the exact same yeah. limitations the first, and so despite the fact that it was going to be you know an unattractive hack to fix it. Yeah. I wanted to fix it. It it did. It completely changed it the did. experience, and so it, it is. You know what I always refer to is it's duct tape. We'll get some value out of it as soon and as quickly as we can. You know, convert the hostility system over to the you know the proper reputational version. We'll do that. Um, but in general, for the short run, we can continue to use this hack for some other missions that we have in the hopper. And once we have that reputation version in, like we will update Nine Tails to handle that and it will play better as a result. Yeah, that, that's actually another uh, point that I want to like touch on a little bit, which is so we did Xenothreat and we released it and then we basically brought it back and you know did some relatively mild alterations. We changed how the two middle phases basically transitioned automatically between them as opposed to being distinct so that we could have the whole salvage process and then you had you know the climactic battle and then it kind of like rolled around but there was still salvaging you know, during the later part. On Nine Tails, we basically released it and you've already identified a number of shortcomings with yeah. it that you want to address, not just for 315, but even beyond that. And yes. this, is, this is something, so I want to I get to that in a second, but this is something that we're going to continue to do with a lot of these dynamic events. They're intended not as one-shot missions. You play them for you know, a month, a quarter, you know, six months, and then we lose interest and we move to other stuff. The, the basic idea for these things is these events represent some sort of you know archetype almost yeah well I, i'd say they they represent it's almost like a customized chunk of gameplay it's yeah. pirates have locked down an area or xenothreat has decided to invade the solar system or pirates have basically run amok you know over in this area or you know drug runners have completely you know seized control of these you know manufacturing facilities you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and the idea is that we'll have all of this information over within quantum and then we'll look within our yes. extensive library of these events, and we'll decide which one most closely you know, matches that. We'll customize it as appropriate, and then trigger. And so the idea is that we're we're layering all of this this custom handcrafted designer content onto this systemic background. Yes. And so we really get the best of both worlds. We get you know a nice logical systemic universe that ebbs and flows. It evolves. It basically changes logically in response to player actions, but at the same time, we get all of the you know incredible stories and the explicit dialogue and the intricately designed challenges that a designer has put a lot of you know time and thought and effort into doing, um, and so you really get both of these blended together. But back to Nine Tails, so. On 315, we're going to tweak a couple of the problems that you've identified. So you want to start with that? They're relatively small things, honestly, just due to the schedule. It's probably the most impactful one and the one that I've seen the most people talking about. There is a portion of um, Ninetales on the lawful side where you can deliver medical supplies to the blockaded station for a bit of an extra reward. They will pay you a little bit more if you have a certain mission. Um, and also their inventory is just very rapidly depleting, so you can pretty much always sell there and, and they, you will be selling at the best price that they can offer. The problem that occurs there is that everybody buys all of the medical supplies out there. And while that's really cool on a realism statement, with, with the game in the state it is and with trading in the state it is, that means that a lot of people can't participate in that part of the mission. And that's problematic, um, particularly at this yeah. point where we want to be testing how those play. We really want people engaging in that part of things. Those of you who were part of the, the first wave of Ibikati when we first tested this way back might actually remember that we originally had shop modifiers on the places that were selling medical supplies to make it so that they had a higher inventory that refreshed fairly frequently so that everyone could kind of engage in that. We were asked to remove those so that we could emphasize the derelicts, which are around the station that um, you can take medical supplies off of, because basically the derelicts made it so that there was another way to get those medical supplies, but they didn't. It, it took so much more time that there was really no reason to do that if you could do well, the It trading. actually goes back to what you were talking yes. about earlier, which is I can buy them instantaneously from the shop and there's no loading right. time and then I can move them over here and I can instantly unload them. If I had to physically pull them off, you could more easily balance these things. Whereas right now, I really do have to go manually pull each individual one off of the derelict ship. And so I'm incurring all of the 
you know, the physicalized cargo expense on one side and not on the other. And so in the end, sure, you know, just due to the sheer amount of time, it's like it takes me 30 minutes to get 12 boxes this way or I can go buy 50 boxes, you know, in a split second. Which one are you going to do? Some people might still do the derelict because they're fun, frankly. It's a fun little FPS raid, but yeah, a lot of people are going to look at the, the, the dollar signs and just go, okay, this is obviously the better option. That being said, we're probably going to put back in. It's actually a pretty easy. I left them in there because I had a feeling we might want them back. Uh, we're just going to flip a switch and probably put those shot modifiers back in. We, we've seen how people play the derelicts. There's plenty of them in Xenothreat. Um, we want to see the trading, frankly, and, and so that will allow that to come back online. Another relatively small change um, that, that, that is probably going to be coming in we are seeing that many people are not engaging with the criminal side of things and that is very much like the whole thing that we were doing with making it into a PvP mission for, for uh, the purposes of, of exactly. helping performance we're gonna, we're gonna have to gets, better gets lost. entice them to basically so, fight on the exactly. Other side of the Exactly. We, we need to entice them. So that means, I mean, they already are being paid more than the other side. I'm probably going to up that even more, frankly. They are going to become very lucrative, hopefully. And that then, is the short-term solution. And, 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 and this is where, like, ideally, you you know, helping out the Nine Tails, building reputation. Becomes ideally, in, we yeah, would be able to yeah, offer other benefits of yes. being in that organization, other things that some percentage of the players would aspire to and want. You know, other rewards that you get for building, you know, for building up your standing with them. Which won't be for three fifteen, yeah, but but that is definitely where that is intended to go. The other thing that we might want there is a system to dynamically modify jurisdiction, because one of the big punish points that happens to a criminal when they are. Uh, helping on that side in that area, despite the fact that Ninetales has supposedly taken over this area, when they get killed, they go to jail, which right. is a bit weird, frankly. We, we originally did want to make it so that you wouldn't get brought to jail, but there just wasn't enough time to fit the tech into the schedule. There still won't be for 315, but that is a longer term thing that we want to have, is the ability to kind of dynamically modify these yeah, jurisdictions. Yeah, that's just one... light on a problem, right? Yeah. Like it, exactly. Yeah. It was one we kind of saw coming, but frankly it was good to have it confirmed, and now we can hopefully put some pressure on that, that happening. Yeah, we 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 a lot of those. Like we added yeah. the we had the shop modifiers, we had the probability volume modifiers, we added the ability to do, you know, the quantum lockdowns, you know, through the dynamic events and stuff. We haven't yet added the ability to add the the dynamic population modifiers. And so this one was, as you said, we, we knew this was going to be an issue. You can't necessarily get everything you'd like into every release. And so the point is we got Nine tails out. You had some other longer term yes. things that you wanted to address as well. Can you talk about those? It's, it, well, some of them, frankly, are just things that are going to be uh, things that will naturally happen, to be honest. Um, performance is uh, still a big problem. I do want to like talk to the performance thing for you know for a second, which it is the progress. Yeah, it's been we we basically generated something on the order of 120, 130 okay. different individual gyras um, that people were addressing in the run up to Xeno threat. Because what what inevitably winds up happening is is we get performance to a certain level, and then we're at, you know, we're basically adding Tweaking. more locations. We're basically enhancing the AI logic. Yeah. We're adding you know new functionality, and so it's 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 always a running battle to where you're adding more you know you're adding more stuff as you're making other stuff run faster, and yes. so you tend to get a net wash. And we actually forward. found ourselves. With Xenothreat, one of the reasons we held it for a couple of extra weeks was we wound up finding ourselves in a very bad spot to where there are inevitably, there are, there are problems now, we're very familiar with them. Um, they were much worse, you know, just a few, you know, uh, you Before, know when we were originally yeah. supposed to release it. We fixed just, it was it so was an endless litany of these things where it's like, you know, on profiles, you know, things well, showing up, yeah. you know, stalling the main thread, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Those are getting cut down to a millisecond here, two milliseconds, but there's just such a quantity. And so the what I want to touch on a little bit is, is as we finalize some bits of tech, like part of the reason we were able to devote as much time to getting things back into at least, you know, uh, what I'd call like, you know, an acceptable state, not a great state. We've got a lot, you know, we've got a lot more work to do to get this thing to the level of performance we want. There's a lot of problems, you know, the rubber banding that, you know, we're yeah, intimately that's, familiar that's with. Important. We absolutely positively want to deal with it. It drives us. We, you know, we all hate it. You know, we want to fix it. Um, but as some of these people roll off of things like their server meshing, you know, tasks and stuff, we're now getting to the point to where we can keep people focused on this particular yeah. problem for, you know, 
certainly a longer period of time than they've been able to do in the past. It's just I, a matter I, of that being the focus. I, that, that's exactly it. It's, it's just a matter of it being the focus. A lot of the engineers that are working on server meshing are the people that would be fixing these optimization problems, right? So your your game's going to run as fast as your biggest bottleneck, and that's about it, right? And you're going to hit the next one and the next one, and you're going to keep fixing them until your game runs a yeah, it was it was almost an endless litany of spawn stalls, entity, you know, deletion stalls. And it, it was impressive to see how quickly those guys were eradicating, you know, some of these really, really Big egregious, ones, like, you know, performance, you know, impactors. Like three, four hundred millisecond spikes going down. Go, going down to one, like, or, yeah, one or two milliseconds, right? yeah. yeah, it's, yeah it's you know, absolutely. We, we spend a lot of time crafting to make sure that, like, this the, these waves are coming at the appropriate amount of, of, of um, difficulty for the number of players that are there and, and all this stuff. And if the spawn queue starts to slow down, that kind of snarls. It doesn't. It just doesn't work. You can't design a great experience. You can design an okay experience, but not a great yeah, one. Yeah, as, as you know, on, on Nine Tails, I know we, we we played with this quite a bit. We yes. definitely did on Xeno Threats, where it's like, well, we want to bring in ten guys at once to present but, a certain amount of challenge, but then yeah. you got to like spawn them all simultaneously, and so we wind up bringing them in. One at a time, so we're basically distributing, yes. you know, the spawn load over time. And while it's true that, you know, on average, the you know the amount of you know uh, you know challenge you're going to face will be identical. Mm -hmm. There is a big difference between yes. sh ten ships showing yeah. up at once versus one. And it was the same thing with the number of capital ships was originally larger, and we had to whittle that down. And so as the performance gradually improves obviously we'll basically start to expand our ambitions in terms of you know what we're you know what 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 kind of experiences we're actually putting out there for players and the existing ones will just improve frankly those missions will almost become new beasts just by the very nature of that happening and that's that's what when when you say like what is the long term thing that to me is is the biggest thing because a lot of these events will just be better you're currently working on a sequel of sorts called Jumptown V2. Can you go into some more detail about what players can expect from that with the initial release? Yeah, it's it's actually I'm trying to keep it very very simple. Uh, Jumptown was originally this this community event, uh, and and I want to keep that that vibe as much as possible. I, I'm I'm trying to have a very light hand. So what I'm doing is I'm basically taking a location. Um, I'm going to make it so that it starts to spawn physically um, a bunch of boxes of, of a very lucrative uh, uh, material, in this case, maize, commodity, um, and, and that will then, uh, it'll start to spit that out at a certain rate, which will, will entice people to go there and, and, and collect it, put it on their ships, fly it away, whatever. Um, but but, but the, the, the point there is that that is an area that will be very, very lucrative for a, sh a short period, which will entice a lot of people to conflict over it. Um, when, when you've got a place that is, that is popping out a box of maize for free that you can just pick up at every 30 seconds or so, like, that is, that is dollar signs, and, and people will kill for that. Not only because it's fun, but also because it's, it's worth it, frankly. So, so essentially, there is a location, there is a, a thing that spawns these boxes, and I'm going to turn it on. And that's about it. One one of the things I didn't like about the original Jump Town was it was at a fixed location and it was always on and it basically spit these things out at a certain frequency. Outside of the fact that it was a bug, but well. yeah. <laughs> so, it, but but it was it, it, was, it, it was very static. Yes, yeah. that, that that's exactly it. And in, in general, I I just I hate static things yeah. because you know it, it's 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 always the same. So how. Let's talk a little bit about Jumptown V2 is being designed as a dynamic event, yes. and it's also extremely configurable. So yeah. we're going to start with support for any of the drug labs, the although that's really just a function of whether or not we could get environmental art team support Correct. for the other areas. Longer term, we will be able to activate this yep. at you know at a wide variety of different locations. The, we the all, concept itself is pretty simple, and it can be worked at all these different places. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Sure, but but there there's a lot of things like uh, we put a lot of thought into recording additional lines of dialogue to support different types of you know, you know drugs or different types of commodities. Yep. You know, we have some generic lines so it can apply to you know all the stuff you know that's anything. You know, we don't want to be stuff. hampered by that because the the the, the lead-in time for for getting that dialogue can can be a little bit. Um, uh, damaging to doing just quick ads, frankly. Like, we want to be able to just say during a quarter, hey, you know what would be really cool? If there was an underground facility that was pumping out data or um, metal or, or at a refinery, and we want people to fight over that, and we can just add that because we, we so, planned ahead. So we've got dynamism 
for Jumptown V2 with respect to location. location. We've got dynamism with respect to what exactly it's going to be pumping yep. out. Another one that I wanted to support was the quantity. In other words, how long will this thing be spitting it out? Is it going to spit out a hundred, you know, you know, a hundred SEU of cargo or a thousand, or, you know, a hundred units of drugs, you know, you know, or, or ten thousand? And this was something again. So it's been configured as a dynamic event to where it can have this this information passed into it and then configure itself as appropriate. At runtime, like that means whoever yeah. or whatever. If That's it, the critical it, part. It, it, it currently is, is launched by a person who is literally like pressing a button on a, on a page. Um, and when they do, they can enter in a bunch of variables and, and those will determine where it's happening, what it's spitting out, how long it's gonna last, how fast. Yeah, I, I, I'll actually talk about that a little bit sure. later to where right, right now, you know, all of the events that we've launched so far are triggered, you know, via Quasar, and a person goes in, specifies the event, and, specifies the inputs. You know, and so you'll talk there. about it being yeah, hundred percent driven. Junktown V two, an another one of the specific design objectives was to use it as the first test case for these systemic triggers, to where we can actually have quantum inject this information dynamically. Yes. And so like right now we're running nine tails and one of the complaints that I've seen is, you know, hey, it doesn't fire you know, often enough. It's like I missed it and then it's gone. And so one of the, you know, one of the directions in which we want to go is having some of these events like Jump Town, which can be triggered by player by, actions, by player and actions and or quanta or player yeah. and quanta basically doing whatever we determine maybe it is a certain amount of drugs are being bought sold in or you know yes. lots of you know drug runners are basically you know traversing this shipping lane whatever kind of you know conditions we want to put and then we can measure you know both on the quantum side you know eventually and then you even in the short term you know on the players it's like how many players are basically moving drugs back and forth here yeah. how many players are basically you know dropping commodities off at of this location and if we have a dynamic event compatible with whatever these you know with whatever these you know uh whatever these conditions are then we can go ahead and automatically trigger it and inject you know inject those customized parameters into it so that it so that it basically more accurately represents what's actually going on in that area right now we're just shortchanging that but but eventually yeah that, that's it. that's actually you know I, I I like the whole you know jump town concept but I you know my my favorite aspect by far is the fact that it's being designed as a test case for some of this you know up and coming you know systemic yeah. technology on the back end so that we can start to go oh at 3 a.m conditions you know were met and we're gonna go ahead and trigger jump town you know on you know on on Lyria and we're basically going to put this particular drug into it and it's going to be 679 you know units to drugs and you know however quickly you know if players are there to basically you know pull those things out that will be how long it lasts and so all of a sudden you have you know it's it's a transient event which is sometimes we may inject you know we we if we can scale this however we want sure. such that the, you know when these conditions are met do we take the total number of you know, you know delivered drug you know drugs or whatever and multiply times 10 so we can basically turn it into something that's going to range for an hour or a day or 10 days or whatever else but we can we can add that variable factor to where it's not always a constant it's not always you know on for the entire you know you know for the entire lifetime of the release it's not always 7 days there's actually going to be you know, uh, you know, it's it's going to depend upon what is really happening within the world, and that's going yeah. to cause it to be customized. It's just something that's happening in the game. I mean, it's yeah. it's you, it's it, natural events triggering in the world. You mentioned people on... saying like Nine Tails wasn't happening enough, and they would log on and they would wait for it to happen. That is not the goal. The goal is I log on and I see something is happening. There should always be an event of some kind that you could go and do. Maybe you log on, you want to do this particular thing, but also, oh man, that's happening right now. Cool, kind of thing. So yeah, there will be there will be, there will be some of both. You know, Xenothreat is the obviously big, yeah. you know the big ones, and then you've yeah. got what I call like you know the the, the mid range you know things like the Nine Tails and stuff, sure. where you're locking down an entire area, and all of a sudden we've basically we've cordoned off you know. A region, and we're not allowing you to easily transport you know, uh, you know, quo. cargo, you know, back and forth to there, which basically starts knocking the prices up. Which is why we added all the, you know, the price alerts and things like that, so that you can actually be enticed by the fact that oh, this area that's been choked off. They really, really need copper. They're willing to pay this. Don't you want to try to break through the blockade? That actually does kind of get to uh, what you were saying earlier in terms of allowing some of the player ships that are going to, or some of the NPCs that are going to interdict you to actually be more effective at it yes. as we start to expand those quantum interdiction zones you know, it, to a larger size. It all interconnects.
Yeah, and it could be influenced by players or the back end yes. simulation. It's it's something that we'll be able to balance. We'll be able to pull analytics from the back end. It's it's measurable, and it'll be something we can tune over time. An another one on on uh, another point we're talking about on Jump Town for future directions forward is, and you and I have had this conversation a couple of times, is I would like to eventually be able to have NPCs basically fill in the other side. Like oh, right yeah, now, sure. one of the inherent flaws in it is it's purely PVP, right? Which is I go there, I basically you know, control that area, I get the loot for as long as it's pumping it out, and unless other players come and try to basically kick you out of that area, it's, it's a cakewalk. And what we would want to be able to simulate, obviously, is we're going, you know, if, if players are not going there, you know, would, would Quanta, you know, over on the simulation side, would they be attracted to, you know, this value generator? Of course they would. Great. At, at what rate? And that what rate's going to depend upon what it's spitting out, what the street, you know, value of that stuff is, how far it is from civilization, they therefore have to travel, et cetera. And so the point would be that we want to be able to, just as we were talking about earlier, we want to, be, you know, with nine tails to where we were aligning, you know, players on either side saying, we'll use NPCs to basically, you know, to balance it however we want. In this case, if there are zero players on you know the you know on the attacking side trying to like take it over, well we're gonna have to fill those ranks with NPCs. That being said, one of the things that is called out very often as being an exciting portion of Jump Town, the original, was going there and not knowing if you were going to find resistance. That could kind of keep you on the edge of your seat a little bit. There's that it's too quiet. So it won't always a be a hundred a hundred percent, but but you don't need th that that Uncertainty doesn't necessarily need to only come as a result of whether or whether or not players are willing to do it. We can have uncertainty on the NPC side and say, maybe we will, maybe we won't basically you know, have them assault. Maybe they'll come in a straggler, one guy at a time. Maybe they'll come in a big coordinated group of 12 NPCs, Our all in heavy right armor, now. armed to the tooth, and, you know, and, and you'll basically be doing your absolute best you know, to, you know, to hold that, calling your friends, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the point is, like right now, Unless we have the ability to basically set those scenarios up, then you know th th some players on some servers will never get up. that cool experience yeah. of a whole burst of guys you know arriving at one shot or the stragglers. Now, if players are basically going in there attacking, well, sure, I've already got 20 yeah. players on this side. Maybe I don't need to throw any other NPCs out to you know to. Or maybe I want to add fuel to the fire, frankly. Or, like or it, maybe you want to throw it, yeah. Players it, the, were very creative in the first one. Like yeah, they, like <laughs> and and that's honestly what I'm really looking forward to is is what is. The, the tools that have been added to the sandbox at this point, it's such a simple event. I really am looking forward to seeing how they, they handle it. Like, you can come in in a, a land vehicle, and you can you can set up a tank or a ballista and just, like, pick people out of the sky, defend that area, turn it into a fortress. You can have dogfights in the air over it. You can... Um, if you're stupid and you leave your ship turned off with its shields off, like someone's gonna blow that I, up. You and I talked in the early, early stages of Nine Tails about the fact that it's a drug lab. Why is it basically spitting, you know, spitting these things out? And the idea would be, well, they produced a lot of them at that location, and so who would be one of the most logical people to come and try to take back control? It would be the guys that, you know, that basically, you know originally had control of that drug lab it'd be you know whatever you know uh, criminal organization Happened you want to, to basically yeah. have that thing or and a competition a hundred percent and so you could see you know players are in there basically you know reaping the rewards another you know player team assaults them and now the much much larger threat comes and the players you know it could be a three-way the could players can alliance. team up yeah. you know with each other to basically hold them off and then split the goods you know et cetera et cetera Controlling so the, 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 the real point to my mind is it just comes back to is configurability which it is will be different. i want to i want to be able to vary the location vary the you know the type of material vary the quantity of that material and the frequency with which it's produced i want to be able to vary the challenges you'll face trying to basically hold it and all of a sudden that starts to become representative of what we're trying to do with all these different uh, dynamic awesome. events which is yeah. We have a, we want to make templates that we can. You know, I always call it object-oriented content creation. You know, it, it's such a common concept over on the coding side. You don't really see much focus over on the content creation to basically 
put all of these rules and procedures and processes in place so that you can basically build nice modular chunks of content and easily link them to other pieces so that you're not reinventing the wheel every time you're doing this. Uh, like a good, you know, uh, you know, a good example is the spawn clauses that we're doing, you know, over for some of the infiltrator missions that we'll be talking about. It's like that's absolutely going to play a factor in some of these, you know, future iterations of things like, you know, whether it's nine tails, you could see nine tails eventually, you know, supporting on the derelicts some of the those derelicts actually have nine tails members on them that we can basically create two or twenty. You know, we can create them over time. We can basically you know change you know the you or know, taking what over the station. Are. Like, there's so many things you yeah. can do with that. So, yeah, pyro is going to be a, a good test bed for a lot Pyro's of that stuff. Just for the, the strife that. that is yeah. supposed to be going on out there. So, not to give too much forward away. to it. All right, let's bring Luke into the conversation now. We started working on the Xenothread event around March of 2020, and it took about a year to get it out the door. We knew that it was going to be extremely difficult because we were missing so much of what we needed, including everything from the dynamic mission service that would drive the back-end logic, to the capital ship AI, target prioritization for turrets, functional countermeasures, tons of dialogue, and countless other things. Part of the allure, though, was that in one shot, we'd have a great test case for a litany of important features, like battles far larger than anything we'd previously done, and a test bed for creating missions that supported a variety of different play styles, like ship-to-ship -ship combat and salvaging. So, Luke, from your perspective, what were some of the big lessons we learned from Xenothreat? Well, Xenothreat was our first attempt at a large-scale fleet battle, so we learned a lot. The biggest takeaway was that we needed to develop our overly simplistic friendly fire system which was leading to players receiving unfair crime stats and being kicked from the mission. So in the recent re-release of the event, we made major improvements to our friendly fire detection and tolerances, which drastically cut down on unfair crime stats according to the feedback and analytics we received. What's great is this kind of change improves the whole game, not just the event, and paves the way for more large-scale space battles in the future. I think it's also important to add but another thing that became clear was that players wanted a counter mission involving PvP. So we've started planning with this in mind for subsequent releases. Luke, as the performance gradually improves over the next few quarters, what sort of things would you most like to change about Xenothreat? I think most people would expect my answer to be throw more AI at the player. But it might be that when performance improves, our AI becomes much deadlier, which could actually lead to us reducing their numbers. Um, this balancing is always the most difficult part of mission creation. The AI's performance can be wildly different on our local servers versus what it might be like on an overtaxed live server. And if an mission is too easy, it's not just a case of throwing more AI at it, as this will only compound the performance issues. We were happy with the balancing we achieved, but it wasn't quite what we hoped for. Once performance has improved, we hope to rebalance and deliver the experience we intended. Luke, we've invested a lot of engineering effort into our spawn closet tech, which allows us to precisely and intelligently push NPCs into and out of an area. The first major test of this tech will be the infiltrator class of missions, which I wanted to provide much more varied and challenging FPS situations than anything we've previously seen. To that end, we can now determine at runtime the type and number of NPCs we want to insert at a location, often at the behest of quantum. We can also apply a litany of rules to the spawning, like how many can be active at once, how the spawn rate changes when an alarm has gone off, and whether a boss might be found wandering the area with his guards or only after they've all been dispatched. The mission template supports a wide variety of objectives, ranging from killing everyone at that location to only killing select individuals, to protecting NPCs from any harm, to hacking computers, to extracting designated materials. Can you go over some of these mission variations in more detail? Of course, Tony. The underground facilities were the locations we chose for our first implementation of spawn closets, so this is where players will find new missions, as well as some existing missions that have been vastly improved by the addition of spawn closets and non-combatants. One of the new missions sends players to kill a heavily armoured target who only shows himself once his crew have been wiped out. Another involves the player searching a friendly facility for a number of boxes, identified using information provided on their mobiglyphs. At any point during the mission, small enemy assaults can be triggered, and the thing I love about this one is that players can choose to avoid the fight and gamble on the facility's defenders being able to repel them. And the last one I'd like to mention is, thanks to spawn closets, we now have our first FPS defend mission, where players join friendly AI in defending a facility from multiple waves of enemies. And the nice thing about this one is that in addition to the basic mission reward, 
players also receive bonuses for the AI who survive to the end. Some of the benefits from this mission template are coming from smarter use of existing tech, like more modular subsumption logic, and some of it stems from new features like the spawn closets. Loop, how has the design setup of the infiltrator scenario varied from what you've done in the past? Well, spawn closets have had a dramatic effect on the types of missions we can build. Without them, we were unable to spawn AI mid-mission, as we couldn't risk them spawning out of thin air without warning, as that's really unfair on players. Thanks to spawn closets, we can now spawn reinforcement waves and spring ambushes anytime we want, with players able to recognise where AI is likely to reinforce from. Not only does this allow us to build brand new mission types, it allows us to spawn manageable amounts of AI and only reinforce when some of those are dead, to better balance the difficulty of the encounter. And you mentioned we're building our logic in a modular fashion, and the Eliminate Boss mission is a great example of that, because we've essentially taken the Eliminate All and Eliminate Specific objectives and combined them to create a new experience where players must draw their target out of hiding by first killing all of his crew. Luke, another mission template we're currently working on is called Rescue Transport, and it revolves around getting NPCs to a specified location. One of the variations allows the NPC to request personal transport via a service beacon, just like a player, to a designated location. Other variations involve adding assorted complications to getting the NPCs on board your ship, like having to first outsmart or outfight their captors, unlocking their prison door to release them, safely escorting them back to your ship for transport to the desired drop site. Longer term, we're going to add support in this mission template for a lot of other combinations, like having to drag unconscious characters onto your ship and back to a hospital and trying to lead NPCs through a burning ship. Luke, where do we stand with the current implementation of this, and what remains to be done before we can push it out the door? Well, Tony, we're at the point where we have a working prototype in which AI can be asked to follow, wait, and take a seat aboard your ship. And even with this rudimentary setup, we've been able to flesh out the mission flow to a very detailed degree, and have made a lot of headway into planning the dialogue requirements. We've got some effort to make sure that the mission is more than a delivery mission where the box has legs, so the client has patience that can wear thin, with your tip and rating being calculated based on your performance. We'll also be developing AI behaviours to deal with what happens should the player decide to kidnap them. The rescue mission module has been designed in such a way that it can work in conjunction with others like Infiltrator, meaning that we can easily inject some obstacles in your way, like a base full of captors. These missions will drive the development of AI following, so once complete, we'll be able to leverage that throughout the rest of the game. I want to pivot now and give an update on some of the systemic functionality that I detailed last spring. I said that we were soon going to have quantum controlling a few select bits of the universe and that we were going to be very measured in the rollout. We remain on track to activate these changes with 3.16 at the end of the year, and this initial release will allow quantum to dictate three encounter frequencies, the prices of three commodities, and everything related to combat assist service beacons. As the simulation is refined and more of the linkage to the game is completed, we will expand the scope of these early tests and enable Quantum to play an ever larger role in shaping the universe. So let's go over how the gameplay experience is set to change. Probability volumes dictate how the likelihood of an encounter type varies within that region, and historically that information has always been static. Dynamic events, introduced in early 2021, allow that data to be changed by mission logic, but still don't support systemic modulation. You can see the frequency curve for pirate activity in red on the screen here, and the long and short of it is that no matter how many pirates you, your friends, or the entire community kill, the likelihood of encountering a pirate at this spot right here would always be about 5% per minute, and farther out, right about there, the odds would drop to 2%. Now, let's see what happens when we activate Quantum and it starts to provide real-time guidance to the probability volume service that controls this information and distributes it to the game servers. As is often the case with such demonstrations, the simulation is running at an exaggerated rate of speed so that I can easily illustrate some key points. The first thing you'll notice is that the fixed pirate curve just flatlined because Quantum says there aren't currently any pirates in this area. There are some valuable materials on the surface of Selen, though, and that's starting to attract some Quantum miners represented in green. The distribution of the miners determines the shape of the green curve, and the quantity determines the amplitude. With the value of the ore available on cell and sky high and no threat in sight, the number of miners continues to increase, and you can see the encounter curve changing to reflect that. Pirates are drawn to high concentrations of wealth with minimal security, though, and are starting to swarm into the area, and as they do, you can see the red pirate curve adjusting. 
Quantus security, represented in blue, is drawn to conflict and is thus often a lagging indicator of criminal activity. So at this point, there are several distinct things happening. The number of miners in the area is still increasing, but the rate of increase has slowed dramatically as they start to weigh the increased risk of piracy. The number of pirates is still increasing because there's still sufficient value in the area to attract them and not yet sufficient security to dissuade them. The number of security forces continues to rise because the pirate problem is raging out of control and thus security pay in this area has gone through the roof. This trend continues for a while until finally the risk of piracy gets too high and the quantity of miners starts to drop. The pirates are doing their own independent mental calculus and still see sufficient value in the area, even once the miners start to fall off, to continue increasing their numbers, but that simply speeds up the rate of decline in the miners, while at the same time, the threat from security continues to grow. So, eventually, the number of pirates in the area begins to fall off as well. As the threat of piracy begins to subside, the impact gradually ripples through the economy, lowering the rate of pay and demand for security services. The quantity of security forces streaming into the area eventually peaks too then and begins to decline. If you watch the curves, you'll see a rhythmic action to it all, with miners looking for high value ore in safe areas, pirates searching for unprotected wealth, and security chasing conflict. Three different but very interdependent calculations. The system is always searching for equilibrium, and just as in a real economy sometimes overshoots a bit in one direction or the other, which ultimately equates to opportunity for the thinking player. MBC Combat Assist service beacons have historically been generated via probability volume data and were thus every bit as static as the encounter frequencies that I just covered. The odds of a request for combat assistance at a given location didn't vary based upon what was happening in that area at that time, and no amount of concerted community effort to stamp out what was putting those NPCs in danger had any chance of succeeding. To illustrate what's changed, let's jump back to Quantum. The miners are back in force, but there aren't yet any pirates, and thus there aren't any requests for combat assistance. Just as previously occurred, though, the pirates are going to slowly sniff out this opportunity and begin gravitating to this location. As their numbers increase, so will the odds of conflict with the miner, and thus the likelihood of a combat assist service beacon being issued. You can see a few contracts now, represented by the green icons. Quantum is dictating how many beacons should be present in this area in the exact details, such as how much Alpha UEC is being offered, but the data is actually maintained by the service beacon service that interfaces to the game servers and exposes these contracts to players. So, every contract that you're seeing pop up, which is a direct result of the amount of conflict happening within Quantum, can be seen and accepted by someone within the actual game. Security has started to show up, but isn't yet a major force, and the risk of piracy has gotten so great that some of the miners have decided to exit. The frequency of combat assist beacons is a function of both the quantity of miners and pirates, and clamped by the minimum of either. So, as the miners depart, the number of outstanding beacons drops. Security has now reached the point where it's really starting to deter the pirates, and the reduced number of miners is just adding fuel to the fire. So, now the number of pirates starts to fall off pretty dramatically, which also impacts the total number of active beacons and instantiation frequency. Player actions are fed back into Quantum, such that if a lot of beacons are accepted and the NPC is successfully defended in the game, the security risk as perceived by the pirates in Quantum will increase, thus affecting their sense of whether the risk justifies the reward. This means that not only will the system ebb and flow of its own accord, but your actions within the game will directly impact the simulation and thus the overall state of the universe. There's one other important thing that I want to mention here, and that's the value of the additional context that Quantum is providing. We now know exactly who issued the request for combat assistance and even the likelihood that multiple ships might be involved. All of this information can be packaged up and associated with the beacon so that when and if a player accepts the contract, the instantiated mission can be customized to better reflect what Quantum says you should be seeing. The shop service has always had the ability to modulate the price of commodities based upon things like the amount of inventory on hand and its rate of change, but we haven't really exploited that feature for some of the basics like fuel and HPMC, which is the material required to affect repairs on a ship. One of the reasons for this is that it's one thing to have tradable commodities fluctuate in value according to some algorithmic logic that doesn't consider anything beyond the confines of that particular shop, but it's quite another when those materials are critical to playing the game. Now that we can properly gauge demand based upon factors external to the shop, though, even if the simulation logic still needs a lot of work, we're going to flip the switch and let the prices of fuel and repair materials start to undulate. 
So let's bring Quantum up again. The Tram and Myers mining outpost on Selen has been selected so that we can see its real-time prices for plasma fuel, quantum fuel, and HPMC. Keep an eye on these prices as the Quanta arrive on scene. A few of the miners are from distant locales and will be looking to top off their quantum fuel tanks, and that increased consumption is causing prices to trickle up just a bit. Plasma fuel is jumping quite a bit more, though, because it's in constant demand due to the fact that the miners routinely have to traverse the surface of the moon looking for valuable deposits of ore to extract. The price of HPMC hasn't budged because there hasn't been any conflict in the area, but that's about to change. The pirates have started to arrive and attack the miners, and that means that there are going to be some damaged ships that require repairs, and the price will continue to rise as the amount of conflict grows. Pirates require fuel, too, and most of their need revolves around the plasma they'll use to engage ships in close proximity, so it's starting to get fairly expensive. Security forces have now started arriving in force, which means even more conflict in the area, which is why the price of HPMC has finally started to take off. Security forces burn a lot of plasma fuel hunting for pirates, and this is proving to be more demand than the local stores of inventory can satisfy. This means temporary shortages and skyrocketing prices until either the demand debates or the economy rebalances to ensure a more regular supply of fuel to this area. Up until now, all of our dynamic events have been manually triggered by someone loading up Quasar, selecting an event, specifying the input variables, and activating it. This works fine for major events that are intended to run for a long period of time, but it's problematic when the event needs to run multiple times per day or only when specific conditions warrant or needs to be customized based upon the current state of the universe. The solution to this problem is systemic triggers, which are small analytical programs that let us specify what sort of conditions within quantum warrant the creation of a dynamic event and allow that event's inputs to be mapped to all sorts of simulation state. I'm going to bring quantum up one last time and highlight the location of the three drug labs within the Stanton system. Raven's Roost is on Microtech's moon Calliope. Jump Town is on Crusader's moon Yella. And Paradise Cove is on Art Corp's moon Lyria. For this test, I've removed all commodities except for drugs, and thus any green quanta you see moving around are focused on moving these illicit narcotics. A systemic trigger has been set up that monitors the total drugs purchased at any of the drug labs, which you can see in the graphs below the star map. If the total amount of drugs purchased at one of these locations over a period of time exceeds the specified threshold, it will trigger the Jumptown V2 dynamic event. The location and quantity of drugs sold would be passed to the event as inputs, which the mission logic might use for any manner of things, such as temporarily overriding the shopping date at that site for the duration of the event. The shop service that communicates with the game servers is linked to Quantum, and thus all player transactions in the game are filtered back into the simulation, and their purchases are therefore just as relevant to the totals as those initiated by Quanta. All of the drug labs are seeing a bit of action, and Paradise Cove looked like it might be the first to breach the threshold. Some red pirates have started moving into that area now, though, and the green freighters have started to flee. It looks like they've decided to focus on Raven's Roost, and you can tell by the constant level of elevated purchases that they're probably going to trip the trigger pretty soon. There, that's it. The conditions for the systemic trigger have been met. You can see that Jumptown V2 has now been added to Quasar's active dynamic events list at the top right, and below that you can see the input parameters that it was sent, which include the Raven's Roost location and a numeric value of 916 for the total purchase drugs variable, which the actual Jumptown V2 logic uses to configure how many free units of drugs the location will produce over the lifetime of the event. The ultimate purpose of systemic triggers, then, is to allow us to easily and programmatically dictate when and exactly how handcrafted custom content will be layered onto the background tapestry driven by quantum systemic logic. As our library of dynamic events grows and the sophistication of the simulation evolves, you'll eventually find that it's difficult to tell where one system ends and another begins, and the whole experience will just feel more engaging and unique than what either technology could deliver by itself. That's it for our show today. I hope that you now have a better sense of some of the things we're aiming to accomplish over the next year, and that you're as excited as we are about the potential of these new features and technologies to really transform the gameplay experience. Until next time.
So that's it. We're done. That's the whole show. Another Citizen Con in the bag. This one's a little different than others, but still our chance to come together safely and celebrate our shared interest and commitment to making Star Citizen everything we all want it to be. So what have we learned this year? I was going to, you thought I was going to do it, but I got to bust those bingo cards, right? If I had to guess what we learned, we learned that I'm just the lucky one that gets to sit here in front of the work of dozens of others putting today together, themselves in front of the work of hundreds more who dedicate their efforts day in and day out to making the biggest and bestest damn space game ever. It's my honor that, and that of the team that here to represent their work every week, every month, and every year. For CitizenCon 2951, I'm Jared Huckabee. Until next year, have fun, be safe, tell those you love that you love them. I love you, John. And now here's Chris Roberts to take us home. Well, I hope all of you enjoyed everything you saw today. Um, we're very proud of what we've achieved so far, what we're working on, what we're doing in the, in the future. And it was great to be able to get in depth and, and show and discuss a lot of that today with you guys. And I just wanted to tell each and every one of you how much we appreciate all of you, your support, dedication, the hours you put into playing the game, giving us feedback, putting up with crashes and server disconnections and all the frustrating things that you can get when it's an alpha as we're striving to make the best game, or well, I think the best universe simulation we possibly can make now is kind of where we're going. From myself and the team at CIG, we're incredibly lucky to be in this position because I think no one else in gaming has the luxury that we do to really sort of dream for the stars and build something of the ambition that Star Citizen is. It's been a longer journey than I imagined at the beginning, but the game we're building is far more complicated, uh, far bigger, uh, you know, far more possibilities um, than I conceived I would ever get to do, uh, but it's because of your guys' support and you know, everyone at CIG feels the same in terms of they get to work on a dream game. They get to do all these things. People don't say, oh, you can't do that. We've got to make it for this quarter. It's got to come out. And, you know, the investors need their profits this year. It's like, no, we want the best game possible. That's all we at CIG care about, and that's all you guys care about. And so to be in that position is because of you guys. And I really, myself and everyone at CIG, appreciate that. So thank you all very much. And I'm really looking forward to doing this in person for you guys next year as opposed to uh, digitally and hopefully um, all things, you know, fingers crossed, we'll get on the other side of this uh, pandemic and uh, we'll be able to do that. So uh, for me and everyone at CIG, thank you so much for watching.
<laughs> Greetings, citizens! I am back, finally. Holy shit. Alright. Give me uh, two seconds to sort all this shit really quick. I just walked in the door. Um, and we can uh, start doing some post-mortem shit. Um, on Citizen Con. I cannot fucking believe that they ended an hour early. And Chris basically being like, Hey guys, uh, sorry we didn't get to do it in person this year. That's, uh, you know, big sad. Next year we're gonna do it in person. That was Keynote. What? I'm so confused. But I'll be right back. All right, guys. So what did we learn today? Anything? I mean, really? Granted, I had to like miss a little bit um, on some of the end panels there, but like, holy shit. I didn't see anything. Like I was really expecting something to come of this year and nothing came of it. This was a very, very, uh, underwhelming Citizen Con. Even for Citizen Con, I feel like this was really bad. Kind of fucked. Not gonna lie. Oh, shit. Let me see if my, my boyfriend's around.
I mean, so like, I'll I'll kind of try and wait a little bit to kind of um, get like a proper post mortem in, but like, I don't think that like Star Citizen is like empty promises level. But man, how do I phrase this without sounding like I'm supporting the project? But also not sounding like I'm just trying to shit on it unnecessarily. Um, I think they're making progress in terms of like quality of life has gone up by a lot in the last two years, right? If you look at from like 2019 um, to now, uh, I feel like it's gone up a lot. Quality of life is much, much better. I think it's depressing that the servers are still a crapshoot. And, you know, the whole... The whole panel dedicated to talking about the things that would fix the servers, which is persistence and server meshing, was basically them just baby explaining to us again what server meshing is. And as far as I'm aware, like I, I kind of stopped watching because it just got repetitive and annoying. And I would rather, you know, spend time with my mom before she leaves uh, for the year. But like, it, it just felt like it was literally just talking about like how they envision it working still and it's like okay well this is this is literally the the speech you fed us for the last fucking five years now dude why is this even a citizen con panel right now i don't know man i just said i feel like 20 2021 was much more underwhelming than I thought it was going to be. I was really, like, at the beginning of the year, I was kind of excited for some of the stuff that was coming. And I kept, you know, I kept thinking that I could kind of, like, AFK this year and then come back in the end quarters and be like, oh, shit, you know what, like this is some progress and there's kind of like the skeleton of a playable game here now and it doesn't feel like that's what happened at all and I was like really anticipating it to be that way this year like I thought for sure I'll take a break I'll come back later and be like oh fuck and instead it was I take a break I come back and I'm like the fuck Yo ho, the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I don't even know. What are you doing here? I will name fingers and point names. I know what you're rambling about, bro. Here. Well, in this case, honey jack and vanilla but yeah. And Adams. And terminal. And back to them. And get back. <laughs> At least I'm not on fentanyl and morphine anymore. That part's good. <laughs> so what you up to? Playing some Star Citizen. You're not streaming right now, are you? Yes. Oh. Well. Hello! <laughs> I watch my mouth go. More things. So many things that I don't even know. Fuck it. Why not? I don't think I've gotten an, a PTU email for creating or transferring to the PTU in like years. I don't think that that's really, has that even been a thing since the Delta patcher? Like I don't remember the last time they sent me an email with a password that I had to use to log in. Unless I'm, 
unless I'm special or something, which I can't imagine <laughs> they like me enough to do that. If anything, they would have came up with like 18 different loopholes for me to have to, or hoops for me to jump through. Lay out the block. Yeah, I had to like go back and like relook at this timeline to make sure I wasn't fucking taking crazy pills, but it's literally Tony Z's talk goes from like 2115 UTC to 2300 UTC and then it's supposed to be Chris Roberts keynote or closing or whatever and there's literally nothing. It's so weird. So weird. What an absolutely underwhelming citizen con. Hmm. Man, welcome, uh, welcome to the fucking club, Swag. Every time Tony Z opens his mouth, my brain just wants to fucking kill itself. I mean, I feel like a lot of us kind of, like, called that Theaters of War was going to fall to the wayside a long time ago. Although, to be fair, I think most of us were like, oh, hey, Theaters of War is going to come out and it's going to be, like, uh, Arena Commander Star Marine. And it's going to be, like, their big hype for, oh, we really need this for testing and balance and all this stuff. And then they would just mothball it like they did Star Marine and they did Arena Commander. But uh, I guess they really set like a new precedent with just like straight skipping it before it just fell off of anything that they ever mentioned and talked about.
That right there is a, a super spicy and accurate fucking meme. Oof. Yeah, I've got to go ahead and uh, reinstall the PTU. I only have the, the live client in right now. I kind of feel bad sometimes when I take shots at like employees themselves, uh, especially because I try to be like nicer to Zylo in hopes that like he would respect our side of the fence more. But uh, this quote from him means literally nothing to say nothing is being built just for a demo. That's literally how they've done every single one of their fucking citizen cons up until, well, I shouldn't say up until now, but in. I'm assuming including now. And he's also the dude who said he played all of Squadron 42 back in 2016. So, meh, sure, Zylo. I believe you, man. I mean, honestly, Sonic, I wouldn't even call it far off. It still seems like a pipe dream. Like, holy shit, they've been working on it for how many years now? I mean, they've been pitching server meshing and persistence for at least four years, like pitching it hard, right? Essentially, it's like, oh, hey, it's, it's soon, it's soon, it's soon. Well, not that it's soon, but that it's actively being worked on. And don't worry, it's going to fix everything real soon. We're getting real close. And today's Citizen Con just shows that, like, it... It's it's still fucking pipe dream. They they weren't even remotely close to having it being like workable or fixing anything. It's just crazy. It's crazy how they're still fucking talking this shit up. Yeah, Wiser Pyro was shown in the uh, the second hour, I believe it was. So early morning for me. Oh, man.
I mean, that's that was kind of the conclusion when we watched it earlier, um, like live. A lot of us kind of were like, okay, so the panel on persistence and server meshing isn't about like, hey, here's where it's at or what we're doing with it and, you know, any kind of timelines or expectations. It was, this is what server meshing and persistence is. And it's like, okay, that's literally, that's the speech you've been giving us for fucking years now. It, it's... It was almost literally the same kind of word salad that Chris and Sandy gave when they came out of their COVID bunker, uh, what, seven months ago? And they did their little, like, hey, you haven't seen us in forever, here we are, and Chris kind of, like, mumbled about server meshing and persistence for, like, fucking 20 minutes. It, that's what that panel felt like. It was like, okay, is this Citizen Con, or are you just fucking, like, doing Inside the Verse? Because this feels like a rehash episode of inside the verse like is this rerun con it was really fucking underwhelming It'll essentially stay just a fucking small little 50 player fucking murder hobo GTA lobby until they can fucking get the servers working in some form or fashion. And evidently it's nowhere near. You know like what actually pisses me off is like he kept talking like last year or throughout like the last year about how Squadron 42 was getting near because they were getting persistence and server meshing working or whatever. And now it's like, oh, so I guess that was a lie like Squadron 42 progress, right? Okay, cool, man. Just, just double checking. Just want to keep my Chris story straight, you know? They uh, they definitely do a thing of uh, of line. If uh, line was on their roadmap, then they're well past tier zero of that tech hurdle. They're very very good at that. If Chris was as good at making video games as he was about lying and misrepresenting his products, man, whew, he might actually be half of the Messiah that uh, his fanboys make him out to be.
money. Hey, Clint. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. I am uh, about to start doing that. I'm uh, I'm letting the PTU finish downloading, and then I'm going to be drunk as fuck. So uh, for those of you who are going to be around late tonight, brace yourselves. <laughs> I'm just like I'm I came into this with literally the lowest of expectations and I was still disappointed it's insane I didn't even think that was possible anymore like I felt like I had done a good job of, of limiting my expectations to essentially nothing and I'm still like what the fuck I cannot fucking read that to save my life, but uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, and you kind of notice it in almost all their demos, like, the AI doesn't really seem to shoot at them, and I don't know if it's because they don't want to have their demoer get one tap, but yeah, they, they don't ever seem to really, like, react, especially the way they do in the PU, it's completely fucking different, and they can kind of, like, magically stealth, like they're playing a completely different fucking game than when you're trying to stealth buy shit in the PU. Yeah, it's really frustrating. I don't I don't ever like anytime I see those demos, man, I'm just conditioned to a point where I don't believe any of it. I see it and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, totally real, definitely, bro. I'm sure that's not fake. Winky.
Mm. Yeah. About halfway through uh, the PTU download, so. Soon, maybe. Although it seems Moose Beat's fucking passed out. What? What? You can turn the light on. I see that, uh. Oh, you turned theirs on? Why is that your fucking child? You get that bottle for me? That's really considerate. Yeah, I know. It won't be long. I'm gonna be fucking passed out in my fucking chair like a fucking old man. Uh, I believe tonight's beverage is uh, apple cider and Captain Morgan. I did see that, Crow. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get a 400 eye or not, but if I did, I would definitely make sure to get that. I mean, if you're going to get it, then you need to get the, the black and gold. Come on. Now they need to offer that for literally every other origin ship. If there's not a concierge... Uh, black and gold 890 jump, then what's the point of having concierge? I guess my issue though would be like... <sighs> like... Okay, so say I, I have that, right? To where like the 400 eye skin would match my 600. Why would I want a 400i if I have the 600? Does that make sense? Right? Like, like I'm, I'm really struggling to justify owning that 400, especially when the Star Runner is a thing. What one? Uh, 220. It's one of the new ones they announced today. The music is to uh to build your immersion and hype. I mean, like, you know, the other thing that's really frustra frustrating about it, too, is that, like, they show these cool missions where, like, you're doing some kind of interesting fucking newish gameplay loop in, in Star Citizen, and then we never see them. 
Right? Like, where's the microtech mission where you infiltrate the fucking research facility and fucking steal the whatchamajibber and then fucking sneak out? Right? We don't have that yet, and now they're showing off another one that's definitely not built just as a citizen con demo, right, Zylo? You're not a fucking habitual fucking liar, right, Zylo? I mean, it's easy to it's easy to headshot NPCs when they're fucking dumb as rocks and they just kind of stand there. Like, it blew my mind when they were sitting there fluffing themselves after that first demo reel, where they were talking about like, oh yeah, this is our uh, demonstration of the 24-hour life cycle. You can you can see the 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 AIs going about their 24-hour life cycle, and like literally the target NPC stood next to his bed the entire fucking time. He didn't fucking move. It's like, yeah, yeah, definitely. And there was literally nothing else about any of those AI that showed off a 24-hour life cycle. That's not how you work, dude. Like, I'm pretty sure even Skyrim got it right, like, fucking 10 years ago, where they, like, showed the NPC, like, a camera shot of the town sped up with, like, NPCs moving about as time-lapsed, right? Like, there was, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. Like, how, how are you fucking fluffing this shit? It was clear, like... Moose Speed kind of like is doubting it, but to me it was clearly 100% a purpose built demo. And I love how the one wanker had to be like, Oh, great shot. Oh, great shot every time. Like, uh, what? Yeah, I mean, I I think you're right there. Uh, Achoo, Pikachu. Um, even Oblivion had them to where like they would go to their houses and sleep for, during the night and get up and then go out to like do their different jobs around the town or like walk around or do whatever. Um, Star Citizen, they they walk from point A to point B on a patrol waypoint and that's it. And it's like okay, <laughs> yeah. Tell me more about that 24-hour life cycle, you fucking fake. said it was them awake 24 hours it still counts I mean, for sure, Ark, right? Like, it, even if they actually did something, I mean, there wasn't anything there to demo. Like, I that was what was confusing to me, is that he made a point of, like, highlighting that they were living some kind of 24-hour cycle, but didn't show anything about it. Like, all it was was them starting the mission at night and being like, yo, this is a 24-hour life cycle. Like, what? They, they're not doing it. Like, from an outsider perspective, this is just you loading up a different time of day on the same little demo mission that you created for this citizen con and you place the the traitor inside of a bedroom instead like i don't believe in any of this shit you're saying but even if you like he did like what so he moved from the kiosk to a bedroom if that right like i am skeptical as fuck but let's say that that happened sure Like, I just, I don't believe any of it. You're telling me that their NPCs could pick up that fucking artifact from the trade table, right? And he carried it and put it in a safe. When your, your AI T-poses everywhere? Dude, shut the fuck up. Stop lying to me. Like, it, it just, it irritates me so much that they can't just be honest. That's the shit that really fucking, like, triggers me with this shit, is that they just constantly have to fucking lie. Like when they did the microtech demo and they, the AI were flying the shuttle to the research point and Jared was like, oh, it's, it's totally real. It's not faked for the demo. 
Uh huh. Is that why we have that everywhere here now, right? Like AI flying around. Yeah. I don't even want to like. I don't even want to think about what kind of stage Squadron Forty Two is probably actually at. Like, it makes me it makes me depressed to think about it because I'm sure it's not even remotely close. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they are all fucking super fatigued from, you know, dealing with fucking Chris constantly coming up with, like, absurd, unrealistic fucking dreams and goals and telling them they need to have insert thing done by insert date, having the direction rapidly fucking shift on a dime. Yeah, yeah, of course, girl. Of course. Wink, wink, wink. I got you, fam. Yeah, I would love to know where the 700 people plus contractors are. Because there's no way that, like, that 700 is included with contractors. Because they were talking about, like, studio hires are at, like, 700 and some odd. And now we know that they're contracting out a ton of shit. So, like, it's not even including contractors. Like, what are you doing? Nah, Jellyfish, you didn't miss anything. It's, it, it was literally the most... I, I think this year was the most underwhelming citizen con by such a huge margin. It's not even comparable. This could have been just labeled as a really long inside Star Citizen episode. And it would have been underwhelming for that. It was crazy. Nothing was announced, really. The 400i, the Liberator concept, and they showed off more pyro and that was it not even really like showing off pyro showing off like one of the planets in pyro well as uh as they so elegantly fucking put it they're selling the dream I, dude, I fucking died when he said that out loud on a Citizen Con panel. <laughs> I was like, ooh, that's going to age really fucking well. Right, guys um i'm gonna shut down the stream really quick and then uh you'll get a ping when it goes live again um so i can properly label it and uh set up tags and stuff for uh 315 ptu yeah man that shit is gross yeah it's fucking nasty So, um, I'll be back. This is almost done. Um, I probably won't launch it, won't, uh, relaunch the stream until uh, I'm able to actually get in game. So, if there's like a wait on uh, account transfers, it might be a minute.
But uh, just keep an eye out. Um, it should go hot here pretty soon, pretty soon, shortly, and uh, we'll commence uh, PTU sufferings. I'm gonna need a little while, anyways, to do key binding. So hopefully, Move Speed wakes his fucking ass up from his narcotic coma, and uh, narcotics we can are get the fun times going. Say bad things. And uh, what do you call it? Anybody in Discord? Um, let me know if you want to get added to the 315 shit um, and I'll try and get friend invites coordinated at the beginning so we're not fucking with it later <laughs>